An Unexpected Boyfriend for Christmas, a Fake Boyfriend Romantic Comedy, written by Jeanette Rallison, narrated by Katie Caruso. Chapter 1 As Scarlett Hughes stood on the beach waiting for her modeling shoot to start, she realized her life had hit a new low. Now, even her fake boyfriends were dumping her. Granted, she'd never met the guy who just texted her. Jagger Blunt, his stage name, obviously, was an actor her older sister Hazel had paid to play the part of her boyfriend. A charade to make their grandmother think Scarlett's life was together. The one thing Grandma wanted more than anything else was to see her granddaughter secure and happy with good men. So Hazel had told Grandma, during one of Grandma's hospital stays that had been touch and go, that she and her sisters had boyfriends. Now Grandma expected them all to produce said boyfriends at Christmas so she could meet them before the cancer took more of its toll. Scarlet reread Jagger's text, just to make sure she hadn't misread it. Hey, just landed in New York. I got offered a part off Broadway, so I have to cancel the boyfriend gig with you. I'm sure Hazel can find an understudy for the part of your devoted Jeremy. That's what she's good at. But if you ever need a fake boyfriend in the Big Apple, I'm all in. Especially if the part calls for nudity. Ugh. First of all, no on the nudity. Scarlet had been more than clear on that stipulation. And second, couldn't Mr. I'm such a good actor you'll be in love with me by New Year's baby have given her more warning? It was December 24th. The guy had obviously known he was bailing on her sooner than this. Like, for example, as he packed up for the plane to the East Coast? Scarlet nearly rubbed her forehead with aggravation before remembering that she wasn't supposed to touch her face. The makeup artist had put an hour's work into sponging foundation and brushing bronzer on her skin. Still, the frustration was growing. She was flying to Arizona tonight, right after this shoot. The only reason she hadn't left already was that the photographer had had problems with his camera after the beach shoot yesterday and now they were all redoing it for overtime wages. Scarlett needed the money. Rent was ridiculously high in L.A. Jagger's text meant she'd have to show up to the Christmas Eve party at Aunt Christina's house without a boyfriend. Well, maybe that was for the best. Men were more trouble than they were worth. And that was probably true for fake boyfriends as well. At least Scarlet wouldn't have to pretend to be in love tonight, hanging off some guy's arm and listening to him jabber about who'd win the next bowl game. Scarlet slipped her phone into her jacket pocket and pulled it tighter around her to stave off goosebumps. Hazel was no doubt already working to find another actor to fill the part. She was a stage manager, so she knew her share of leading men, and she had an innate sweetness about her that made people want to do her bidding. But certainly, even actors made plans for the Christmas holidays that they couldn't drop at a moment's notice. She wouldn't be able to find anyone. Scarlet would just have to return to Flagstaff alone, looking like she either dated inconsiderate men or that she was incapable of holding down a relationship. The hairstylist, a woman whose own hair was spiky and blue, sashayed over to Scarlet with a can of hairspray. Hold still, darling. You've got a rebel curl that needs taming. She took hold of a strand of Scarlet's long blonde hair and sprayed it into submission. There, it will never move again. Thanks. Scarlet pulled her jacket tighter around her. Today was a not-so-balmy fifty degrees, made colder by the breeze coming off the ocean. And she was at the beach in a pink bikini. Catalogs always shot a season or two ahead, and that meant modeling swimsuits in December. She still had a few minutes to wait for her turn. The photographer was spending way too much time on a brunette model, trying to capture the waves breaking behind her when they were just the right height. 
perfectionist photographers. They were the worst in bad weather. No one looking at the ad would care how much the sea foam was visible. Besides, Photoshop existed for a reason. Scarlet's phone rang. Hazel's number. Scarlet answered, holding the phone away from her face so as not to touch her makeup. Hi, Hazel. So, my boyfriend dumped me. Turns out true love isn't all it's cracked up to be. I'll try not to mope too much over Christmas as I mourn his loss. But you should bring me chocolate, just in case. That would be a waste. You haven't eaten chocolate since you started modeling. Hey, I might make an exception this time. Hazel huffed. I still can't believe Jagger did this to me. Not only on the boyfriend front, but now I'm short a lead in Beauty and the Beast. Do you know how hard it is to find men in Flagstaff who sing well and are willing to dance around in a furry suit? Fortunately, no. I never swipe right on that type. On the other hand, I can't blame Jagger too much. If I had a chance to be involved with Les Mis on Broadway, I'd have sat on his lap all the way to New York. Okay, just kidding. Grandma comes first, which is why I found you a new guy. Scarlet inwardly moaned, going over a story with Jagger and trying to memorize the details of their supposed relationship was bad enough. Now Hazel wanted her to start over with a new guy? Grandma always invited family, friends, and her neighbors to her Christmas Eve party. Even though the party would be held at Aunt Christina's house this year, a large crowd of people would no doubt ask all sorts of questions about her relationship. Would it really be such a big deal to Grandma if I showed up without a boyfriend? I mean, does she need physical proof to assure her that I'm not going to die alone in a broken-down trailer? Let's just come up with a good excuse for his absence. I'm leaning toward hit by a bus. Hazel's voice went high. You can't back out on me now. Vi refuses to bring home a boyfriend, so we already have to make up an excuse for her. Vi, short for Violet, was the middle sister. They all had color names to match with their last name, Hughes. If you show up alone, Hazel emphasized, it will look like I lied to Grandma about everything. Yeah, because that's what had happened. Shouldn't you have consulted Vi and me before giving us boyfriends? Hazel let out a sigh, one that asked for patience. Grandma had just had a stroke and wasn't expected to live more than a couple of days. You and Vi weren't around. I was the one at the hospital holding her hand while she told me her biggest sorrow was that none of us had found a man as good as Grandpa. And we didn't even seem to be trying. She thinks we have commitment issues. A legitimate worry since their mom had flitted from relationship to relationship all of her life. It was hard for Scarlet, and probably for her sisters as well, to put a lot of faith in relationships. What should I have said? Hazel went on. I couldn't let her face death with those worries pressing on her heart. It was kinder to tell her we were dating, but hadn't mentioned it to her in case things didn't turn out. Scarlet tapped her foot against the cold sand. Okay, but when she recovered from the stroke, you should have told her that things didn't work out. You mean when the doctors ran the tests and found out she had terminal cancer? That's when I should have broken her heart? I didn't know she was going to ask us to produce our boyfriends this Christmas. Hazel should have known. They all should have. Grandma actually cared about their lives, unlike their parents who'd moved on from those roles long ago with surprising ease. You would have done the same thing, Hazel said. Would she have? Maybe. Probably. Grandma was the one person in the world Scarlet couldn't stand to disappoint. She'd always been the stable pillar in her life, the person who actually cared about Scarlet's grades, hobbies, and her worry that she'd always be taller than the guys in her class. A worry that was true until halfway through high school. 
Every summer, while their mother had been out chasing men, or New World philosophies, or whatever engaged her muse, those were the actual words her mother used, Scarlet and her sisters had spent time at their grandparents' rambling Victorian house in Flagstaff, being normal and cared for and happy. Anyway, Hazel said, you can't back out because I found a great replacement guy, like bachelor of the year type of guy. His name is Liam Brooks. He's super cute. You'll like him. I know too many actors already. Trust me, I won't like him. He's not an actor. He's a doctor of some sort, or at least he's going to be. He's doing his residency right now. Anyway, you know how Grandma loves doctors. Grandma had watched too many medical shows and thought anyone who could dangle a stethoscope around their neck had succeeded in life. How did you find a doctor right before Christmas Eve? They don't make house calls, let alone week-long visits. Do you remember Talia, my costume designer? Yeah. Scarlet had met lots of Hazel's theater friends over the years. Talia was in her twenties with dirty blonde hair, quirky blue glasses, and vans that were always colored to match some famous piece of artwork. Starry Night last time Scarlet had seen a show. Scarlet had made a joke about them being Vans Goes. Liam is her brother, Hazel went on. She can't say enough good things about him. Sounded like Hazel was just taking her friend's word that they weren't inviting a possible sociopath to stay at their grandmother's house for a week. Have you ever even met this guy? Actually, yes. He lives in Scottsdale, but he's come to Flag to watch a few of our plays. And that in itself tells you what a nice guy he is. Why else would he make a two-and-a-half-hour drive just to support his sister's costume design career? Scarlet flicked her hand at a seagull that was edging toward her purse. And he's willing to drop his Christmas plans to be my fake boyfriend? There had to be some sort of catch. Talia's parents just got separated and are being pretty toxic about it. Spending the week in Flagstaff will save Liam from having to choose which parent to spend the Christmas holidays with. Win-win. Talia is only sad she doesn't have an excuse to bail on the bickering and guilt-tripping, too. So, no catch. The guy was avoiding his parents and willing to do his sister's friend a favor. Somehow, the fact that Liam wasn't an actor paid to play a part made the situation feel more awkward. Now, Scarlet would have to make sure he had a good time all week. She momentarily forgot about her makeup and rubbed her temple, something that made the makeup artist descend on her and nearly slap her hand away. You're smudging your bronzer. Don't touch. She was an older woman with a gray bob and flawless skin, or maybe just such good makeup skills that people couldn't tell she had flawed skin. The woman tisked and dabbed at the spot above Scarlet's cheekbone then hovered near Scarlet, looking like she would smack her with the concealer brush if she touched her skin again. Scarlet held her phone to the other ear, careful to avoid touching her makeup there, and waited for the woman to leave. So, not only is the guy a stranger, he's a stranger that may be emotionally upset about his parents the whole time? Hazel's voice turned cheery. Maybe you'll get lucky, and he'll be the sort who suppresses his feelings. His parents' divorce might not even come up in conversation. Scarlet pressed her lips together. Look, people get hit with buses all the time. I think we could arrange for Jeremy to have an accident. She caught sight of the makeup artist. The woman was still close by and staring at her with raised eyebrows. Scarlet cleared her throat uncomfortably and tried to explain. I'm not talking about a real person. Jeremy is my imaginary boyfriend. The woman continued to stare suspiciously. Lots of people have imaginary friends. If you're killing off yours, perhaps you should talk to someone about, you know, your issues. Scarlet nearly said, It's not like that. 
I'm just doing this to lie to my grandmother. But she realized that statement wouldn't make her seem any less crazy. The makeup artist gazed around, clearly looking for an excuse to leave, and hurried over to one of the other models to dab more bronzer on her shoulders. Scarlet put the phone back to her ear. People on the beach think I'm crazy now. You live in L.A. People don't even notice crazy there. Without pausing, Hazel added, I'm sending you a picture of Liam so you'll recognize him. He's driving up from Scottsdale and will pick you up at the Flagstaff Airport this evening. Hazel had already finalized this. Scarlet had to stop herself from rubbing her temple again. Seriously, you want me to spend a whole week with a possibly emotionally distraught man? I'm sure he'll be fine. I mean, we weren't all that emotionally distraught when our parents divorced. That's because we were young. Mom was already happily seeing other men. And Dad had been deployed most of our lives. I literally thought he lived in the computer screen until I was four. Fine, Hazel said, too willing to drop the point. If you won't fake date Liam to make Grandma happy, then do it because Jane will be there. She's finally doing a boyfriend reveal. You can imagine what that's going to be like. Jane, their perfect, responsible, Stanford graduate cousin, was the same age as Scarlett, but had always managed to be better at everything she did. Higher grades, more artistic. So talented at singing that in middle school, Scarlett dropped out of choir rather than be forced to sing at family gatherings while Jane sat by smugly judging her. If Scarlett was going to be worse at singing, she would at least fall back on the excuse that she hadn't been trained. Things didn't improve in high school. Scarlett joined the drill team at her school. Jane was head cheerleader at hers. Scarlett dated her school's student body president. Jane became her school's student body president. No one was surprised when Jane was accepted to Stanford, or that her parents were willing to pay the overpriced tuition. Scarlett's half-tuition scholarship to NAU was barely even noted by the family. Jane's actually bringing Ivy League man around? Scarlett asked. Grandma had never been able to supply many details about Jane's boyfriend, which had made the sisters assume the two weren't that serious. Yep. Don't you want to top him with your doctor boyfriend? I'll only be able to top Ivy League man if Liam is gorgeous, because you know Jane's boyfriend will be handsome, drive some stupidly expensive sports car, and have a name like Richard Wentworth the Fourth. Hazel snorted. You haven't looked at Liam's picture yet, have you? Scarlet hadn't, but opened the text message now. She was used to seeing beautiful men. She worked with them all the time. But somehow, she wasn't expecting the face that stared back at her. Liam was not only handsome with his wavy, dark blonde hair and brown eyes. He had an easy, laid-back smile. The sort that made you think he was friendly, kind, and didn't take himself too seriously. He also had a definite smart vibe to him. Something reminiscent of that hot college calculus professor who drew math-hating girls to his class just so they could stare at him and listen to him murmur words like integral and continuous. Well? Hazel knew Scarlet well enough to know that her silence meant she was staring at the photo. The man is in the wrong career. He could sell math. Is that a good thing? It would be for a math department. Scarlet mimicked a breathless co-ed. Hey, Professor Brooks, you put the rhythm into logarithm. Tell me more about chain rule and don't forget to show your work. Hazel laughed, a sound that was finally relieved. First off, the reason people on the beach think you're crazy is that you say these sorts of things. And second, this means you'll play along with a fake boyfriend, right? Scarlet sighed. What else could she do?
Sure, I'm in. Again. But if this guy dumps me as quickly as my last fake boyfriend did, you'll have to pay for the therapy bills to repair my ego. This brought on another snort from Hazel. You can talk to me about your poor, wounded ego when you're not doing a bikini modeling shoot. There was no easy way to contradict that sort of sentiment, so Scarlet just said her goodbyes. But the comment bothered her more than it should. Even during her shoot, while she laughed, frolicked in the waves, and did her best to smile through chattering teeth, she thought about how she could explain her job to her sister. People heard the word model and assumed the job was like winning a beauty pageant with pay, all tiaras and waving to adoring fans. Not at all. It was mostly wondering if you were pretty enough to be successful, and feeling bad if you didn't get a job because that meant that, no, you weren't. Scarlet had never meant modeling to be her career. It was a way to pay the bills until she figured out what she wanted to do with her life. Only, she hadn't done that yet. In contrast, Jane had graduated from Stanford last spring, drove a Tesla around Flagstaff, and worked at a managerial position for a string of hotels. She probably had a window office with a view, and a personal assistant who brought her coffee whenever she looked parched. And Scarlet was living in a tiny shared apartment and had a job that required her to smile while she pretended not to shiver. But tonight, at least, she'd have a hot doctor boyfriend. The flight was uncomfortable, and that was only partially because Scarlet hadn't managed to remove all of the lingering sand from her body. She hadn't noticed the sand when she dressed after the modeling session, but sitting on the plane next to a dour-looking middle-aged businessman, yeah, the sand made its presence known. There was also the discomfort of going back to Flagstaff. It brought up an entire platter full of bittersweet childhood memories. Most of the memories of staying with her grandparents were good. She loved spending time with them hiking the trails with her sisters, and lying beneath pine trees during the summer. She made wishes on clouds because stepdad number one told her that clouds were just as good as shooting stars for making wishes. In his defense, he wasn't wrong about that. But Scarlet also had less pleasant memories of Flagstaff. She'd spent her junior year there while her mom was regrouping after the divorce from stepdad three and before she packed Scarlet off to Texas for marriage to number four. During her junior year at Flagstaff, Scarlet met Camden Pierce, the class president boyfriend. She'd been exquisitely happy. He was perfect. Handsome, smart, and from a wealthy family. That was as close to a Prince Charming as a girl could get in high school. She was so certain of his feelings that she'd only been forlorn and not worried when he went off to college at Johns Hopkins. After all, what she and Camden had was true love, and that could make it through a year's separation. He dumped her over text the night before she started her senior year at the new high school in Texas. Perhaps the worst part was that he made it sound so inevitable. She'd just been filling his time until he left for college and could date a better class of women. She spent her first two days of classes breaking into tears at inappropriate times, like during her homeroom teacher's explanation of tardy consequences. On the plus side, after that scene, Mrs. Armand never gave her detention for coming in late. It was as though Scarlet had been granted the power of invisibility in homeroom. Anyway, no one at her school forgot her dramatic reaction to that breakup, as evidenced by several people's notes in her school yearbook, wishing her a great summer with a no-tears boyfriend. Like that was even a thing. The only way you avoided crying over a man was if you ended the relationship first. If dating Camden hadn't taught her that, 
Scarlet would have learned that lesson from her mother. The only times she wasn't devastated after a relationship were when she was the first to call it quits and go searching for greener fields. Or, in her case, men who were wealthier and more compatible with an Aries's impulsive nature. Camden's parents still lived in Flagstaff. In fact, they owned the hotel chain where Jane was currently gaining experience. Every time Scarlet came back to Flagstaff, she had the uncomfortable worry that Camden might be visiting his parents, and she might run into him around town, which made it impossible to go to the grocery store in yoga pants, a ponytail, and no makeup. Everywhere she went, she had to be prepared to play the part of the I'm obviously better without you, scorned ex. So when the plane landed, she was already mentally preparing for any Camden run-ins. While she waited for the crowd in the aisle to shuffle off and deplane, she switched on her phone to text Liam that she'd landed. Her eyes stopped on a message with an attachment from Hazel. She opened it. You'll never guess who Jane's boyfriend is. Scarlet didn't have to guess. Hazel had included a photo. He was not a Richard Wentworth IV. He was someone much worse. Camden Pierce. Scarlet took a few nearly hyperventilating breaths and cursed, something that made the middle-aged businessman in the aisle seat huff in indignation. Look, miss, I can't get out of your way until there's room in the aisle. It's not that, she sputtered, but didn't say more. She didn't want to explain to a stranger that she'd found out she was about to have a horrible, horrible week. Chapter 2 Liam stood waiting in the hallway by the baggage claim, wondering if he'd made a terrible mistake. Probably. What had he been thinking to agree to be a stranger's fake boyfriend for the week? The whole thing was his sister Talia's fault. She'd shown up at his townhouse in Scottsdale this morning, all smiles, all plodding, holding Scarlet Hughes's bio like a matchmaker on a quest. The best part, Talia said after she'd explained the arrangement, is that you'll have an excuse not to bounce back and forth between moms and dads in a fruitless attempt to make them happy. That had been a considerable selling point. For Thanksgiving, Liam had gone to an early dinner at his mother's house, then spent the evening playing football with his father and friends. The arrangement had seemed like an equitable solution, but his mother had gotten tearful when he left, and during the game, his father made several pointed comments about having to eat alone. Alone, in this case, meaning eating with his uncle's family in Mesa. There was no way to appease those two, and Liam was past tired of trying. But still, he'd shaken his head at his sister. I'm not the type to lie to strangers for a week. Don't think of it as being dishonest. Think of it as helping Hazel and her family out. You're fulfilling her grandmother's dying wish. Plus, Scarlet is a model. I did mention that already, right? Talia held out a half dozen papers with Scarlet's information. He didn't take the papers. If she's a model, I'm sure she knows lots of men who'd do a better job pretending to be her boyfriend. I'm sure Scarlet could find someone else. Talia agreed. But what good would that do you? His sister looked him over and sighed. You've been in a work, study, and help mom and dad rut for too long. A what? Granted, Liam was busy. That was a given during a residency. But being busy wasn't the same thing as being in a rut. I have responsibilities. That doesn't mean something is wrong. That's what all you rut dwellers say. Trust me, Scarlet will be good for you. She's upbeat, bouncy, and fun. Sounds like a cheerleader. I never went for those. You never went for anyone. You let women chase you and then ignored 90% of them. Maybe it's time to change strategies. 
He gestured around him as though something in the room would help Talia see reason. I don't need a woman to have fun. Hiking camelback with Bandit is fun. Running with him in the morning is fun. At the sound of his name, Liam's golden retriever trotted over, tail wagging. Liam scratched the dog's ears. Who's man's best friend? You are. Talia shook her head, another sigh ready to burst from her lips. This is sad. You're like the male equivalent of a crazy cat lady. Impossible. He only had one dog. Besides, a person didn't have to be part of a couple to enjoy life. Traveling is fun. Once I'm done with my residency, I'll have time to do it again. You used to travel with your friends. They're all getting married. Who are you going to travel with then? Mom? Dad? A low blow. Talia held up the sheets of paper again. Scarlet likes traveling. Just like you. She also likes animals and health food. Talia flipped through several pages, scanning them. The only real drawback I see is that she doesn't like to cook. Or at least Hazel says not to let her cook because Scarlet doesn't follow recipes and frequently forgets to start the timer. But you're not a picky eater, so that's fine. He folded his arms. You don't sound like you want to do a favor for a friend. You sound like you're trying to choose my wife. Maybe that's because I remember some of your past girlfriends. You clearly need guidance. The dog had wandered over to Talia and nudged her hand for attention. She patted his head. Don't worry, Liam. Bandit will have a good time with me this week going between mom and dads and commiserating with all of their woes. Point in Talia's favor. His parents' complaints about each other all seemed so minor, and yet were proving so unfixable. His mother thought his father was too distant. His father thought his mother nagged too much. His mother didn't think his father supported her charity work and the many boards she was on. His father didn't understand why she always had to be out doing something, etc., etc. The two were just continually fed up with each other. Liam let out a long breath. One or two dates with Scarlet? I could do. But a whole week staying at her grandmother's house? You know how I hate making small talk with strangers. For that matter, Liam wasn't a fan of making small talk with a lot of his acquaintances either. The back and forth about the weather, feigning interest about minutia, and those long, dreadful periods of silence where he had to dredge his mind for something to say. And despite Talia's assurances that Scarlet was a fun person, she was bound to be depressed, and worse, crying, about her grandmother's cancer. He'd have to try, and would most likely fail, to comfort her. Talia narrowed her eyes in determination. Remember when you asked me to come down to Scottsdale and spend a week with Mom because she was calling you multiple times a day and you couldn't get anything done? Remember how you said you owed me one? Yeah, but this wasn't how he thought his sister would call in that favor. Talia, he started. She held out the bio to him again. Just read her information. Reluctantly, he took the papers. He finally let himself look at Scarlet's picture. His mouth nearly dropped open. To say Scarlet was drop-dead gorgeous wasn't exactly accurate because, from a medical standpoint, one couldn't kill someone with beauty. But colloquially speaking, yeah, she was definitely weapons-grade gorgeous. Long blonde hair, green eyes, high cheekbones, and full lips. However, that wasn't why his jaw had gone slack. He'd seen Scarlet before. Last year, he'd been up in Flagstaff, and he'd stopped by the theater after a rehearsal to take Talia out to dinner. She'd been busy with something, and he'd come inside to wait for her. Scarlet had been sitting on the stage, surrounded by a handful of people, 
relating some story that made the others laugh. He'd sat in one of the aisles, shadowed by the dim light, and watched her. He'd been captivated not only by her looks, but by her expressiveness. The way her eyes went wide and her hands sliced the air with enthusiasm. Her smile was sunshine one moment, and the next, with the tilt of her chin and a lift of her eyebrow, turned to mischievousness. She seemed like the sort of person who was not only happy, but effortlessly created happiness wherever she went. Her audience was entranced. A useful thing in an actress, he supposed. He wanted to go introduce himself, to see what those eyes would look like staring at him. An unusual impulse on his part. He stayed where he was, unnoticed. She was clearly busy, and interrupting her at work to hit on her was unprofessional. And probably creepy. A better plan would be to go to the next production and make Talia introduce him. Then he could compliment her on her performance, and the conversation would be natural. Liam went to the play, but the woman wasn't in the production, and by that time Talia didn't remember who'd been sitting on the stage talking to people when he'd come to take her to dinner. She must have been a friend of one of the actors or actresses, Talia said. Liam didn't quite give up on finding her. He went to two more performances, reasoning that friends of the actors and actresses would come see the show. He might spot her in the audience. She hadn't come, at least not on the nights he went. She disappeared. A captivating blonde needle in a much too large haystack. And now he knew who she was. Hazel Hughes's sister. So, yeah, that was most likely a yes to the fake boyfriend job. If for no other reason than to satisfy the curiosity he had about the woman he'd wanted to meet for so long. He read over her bio. On paper, he and Scarlett seemed to have a lot in common. She loved the outdoors, exercising, reading, scuba diving, skiing, and dancing. All good. Three pages were devoted to a family background that a boyfriend would know. The only really worrisome thing in the bio was a postscript Hazel had written. P.S. You can't see from Scarlett's picture how charismatic she is. She makes everything sound like a good idea. But keep in mind, there's a fine line between spontaneous and reckless. So, don't listen to suggestions that might lead to both of your untimely deaths. For example, going for a midnight hike to see the sunrise over the mountains or ice skating on a pond that is probably, maybe, frozen enough. P.P.S. Also, don't get involved in any dares with her. That brings out her impulsive nature. Did Scarlet have no common sense, or did Hazel just worry that Liam didn't? And had either of these events actually happened with past guys? P.P.P.S. One more warning. I wouldn't fall for her. She never gets serious with guys. Thanks so much for helping us out this Christmas. Hazel. Hazel and Talia seemed to consider his part in this a foregone conclusion. Maybe no guy had ever turned down a chance to spend time with the beautiful Scarlet Hughes before. Remember, Talia chimed when he put down the papers, you owe me. Plus, you're the one who lives in the same city as mom and dad. I could easily ignore mom's calls, and then she'd feel the need to drop by your townhouse more. I'll do it, he said. And that's why he was standing in the Flagstaff airport, waiting for Scarlett's flight. Lying to his parents about his sudden change in Christmas plans hadn't gone well. He expected them to be understanding about Scarlet's dying grandmother's wish to spend time with him. And they were. But they'd both been hurt that he had a girlfriend he hadn't mentioned before. Perhaps if Liam had come up with a better reason for keeping his relationship a secret, things would have gone better. But he'd individually told them, 
It didn't seem right to announce I was seeing someone when things were going so badly for you. You have a lot to deal with. He was trying to appear like a considerate son. Instead, each of his parents were offended that he hadn't confided in them. Everything was a contest between them. And now Liam would have to pretend to be someone named Jeremy and fool Scarlet's grandmother into thinking the two of them were in love. Hazel had assured him that for the majority of the week this would be easy because her grandmother was mostly bedridden. Liam would only have to spend a few minutes with her here and there playing the part of a smitten boyfriend. Hazel also assured him that becoming Jeremy wouldn't be hard because she hadn't given her grandmother much information about him. Hazel had just passed on romantic tidbits like how he sent her flowers every Friday, how he liked to serenade her. Liam hoped no one would ask him to sing to prove this point. And how he and Scarlet had met. Apparently, Scarlet had been lost in L.A., and instead of giving her directions, Jeremy had opted to be her personal guide. For the most part, Liam could play Jeremy as himself. That would make it easier for everyone, and less likely that he or Scarlet would trip up. A stream of people strode by Liam on their way to the baggage carousel. They must be from Scarlet's flight. He looked for her among the crowd, but didn't see her. People shuffled over to the carousel, waiting for the bags to appear. He stared down the hallway to see if more people were coming. A few stragglers headed in his direction. No tall blondes. Had she missed her plane? Changed her mind. Maybe he was off the hook. He should be happy about that prospect, but instead felt a rising disappointment. Liam? He turned around. Scarlet was striding up to him, wearing jeans, black boots, and a wool coat draped over one arm. Even though he knew what she looked like, he was taken off guard. The woman was stunning. Stop and stare, stunning. Start believing in love at first sight, stunning. Suddenly, Hazel's postscript warnings made more sense. Yep, Liam could see how guys would agree to venture out onto thin ice for her. Yes, he said. He'd probably waited too long to answer. She didn't seem to notice. Sorry I'm late. I had to stop by the ladies' room and brush sand out of my unmentionables. She glanced down at her clothes, perhaps checking for more sand. I know that sounds strange, but I was shooting at the beach today. Shooting as in hunting or modeling? It seemed like the sort of information a boyfriend should know. She slipped her coat on. Modeling. The police get in a snit if you shoot at the seagulls. She pulled her coat tie tight. I only know that because stepdad number three tried to kill a few during a very bad family field trip. Liam wasn't sure how to react to that. Was the proper etiquette to say, I'm sorry, or I'm glad he's no longer around? He settled on, oh. Instead of moving to the carousel, she'd stopped altogether and was eyeing him with a grin of satisfaction. You're even better looking than your picture. I can totally work with you. Okay. What would she have done if he hadn't been up to her standards? Dismissed him? Her satisfaction changed to dissatisfaction as she considered his shirt. Her lips pursed together so intently that he checked for a stain or a tear. Everything looked normal. Is something wrong with my shirt? Normally, I'd say no. But tonight, unfortunately... I need you to wear something my ex-boyfriend would wear. Did you pack anything that screams, I'm rich, stylish, and spend way too much on status symbols? Most of the stuff I brought falls into the plaid shirt category, with a few sweaters and hoodies thrown in. Why am I dressing like your ex-boyfriend? Hazel hadn't mentioned anything about that. 
Scarlet sighed and slowly headed toward the baggage carousel. Turns out my cousin is dating my ex-boyfriend, and they're at my aunt's house right now. Scarlet's big green eyes flitted to Liam. I know you've just met me, and I'm about to come off as super pushy or maybe a little psychotic. Really, I do feel bad about that. She fluttered her hand in his direction. But I've got to weigh your opinion of me against the fact that once the week is over, I'll never see you again. However, I will see Jane and maybe Camden. So I'm going with pushy. Liam cocked his head. He had a hard time following her explanation. What exactly are you going to be pushy about? And why were the beautiful women always the psychotic ones? Before we go to my aunt's house, I want to stop by Dillard's to buy you some meeting my rich ex-boyfriend clothes. Oh, just shopping. The way she built up her request, he'd been expecting something worse. And she'd been glad he was handsome, not because of her vanity, but because she had to face an ex-boyfriend. That wasn't quite as bad. I'll pay for your clothes she added quickly. Her eyes went over him again. I need to take you from Indiana Jones, the hot professor, to Indiana Jones, the guy who... wears a fedora and hacks his way through the jungle? Indiana Jones at some posh function where men dress well and swagger. If there wasn't one of those scenes in the series, there should have been. She smiled the sort of smile she no doubt used for advertisements. I know I've basically insulted your fashion taste, but please say you don't mind going shopping with me. I don't mind, and you don't need to pay for anything. It's time I update my wardrobe. Mostly, I wear medical scrubs. She stopped near the edge of the carousel and craned to see around a woman in front of her. That's right, you're some sort of doctor. A prosthodontist. I'm actually a dental specialist. He wasn't sure whether she heard his last sentence. She spotted her suitcase and edged around the woman in front of them to get it. He stepped over to help her. As Scarlet reached for a bag, pink with black polka dots, he hefted it from the conveyor belt. Any other bags? He set the suitcase in front of her. No, just that one. Although, now that I know I'll see my ex, I wish I'd brought more. She pulled the suitcase's handle up. I guess I can pick up some stuff at Dillard's, too. We better hurry. My family will be breaking out the eggnog soon. He took the suitcase from her and headed toward the door. I'm parked nearby. Every parking spot was nearby. The benefits of a small airport. He'd forgotten until now that he hadn't offered any condolences. I'm sorry about your grandmother. Scarlet swallowed and her head bobbed. It's hard for us. Not as much for her. She's looking forward to being with Grandpa again. Scarlet forced a smile. Seriously, she's got a Pinterest board of architectural ideas for their mansion on high. So if she asks you how many bathrooms you think a heavenly mansion needs, that's not due to the side effects of her medications. She has a great attitude. She must be very special. She is. Scarlet buttoned up her coat. It was one made to be more fashionable than warm, and she wasn't wearing a hat or scarf. He pulled the scarf from his neck and the beanie from his jacket pocket and handed both to her. It's snowing outside. You'd better take these. Her expression softened with gratitude. Thanks. Living in California, I forget that other places have weather. She slipped the hat on and wound the scarf around her neck. I don't know what Hazel did to make you agree to being my fake boyfriend, but we appreciate it. Grandma really wants to see her granddaughters happy. Meaning, on our way to the altar. We're serious, then. That meant hand-holding and sitting close. Not a bad thing. 
Scarlet shrugged. You know how married people are. They think they own happiness just because they have someone to share their hopes and dreams with. She'd said the words jokingly, but paused and winced. Sorry, that was a stupid thing for me to say. I forgot your parents are breaking up. It's okay. And it was. Somehow, Scarlet's flippancy made the subject less weighty. He could already tell she wasn't the sort to easily cry, and wouldn't spend the week moping while he did his best to cheer her, which was a relief. He wanted to tell her, You know, you're just like I thought you'd be when I first saw you last year. He didn't say the words. It was probably best if she didn't think he was a stalker. They went through the door and were hit by a wall of cold air. He didn't mind. The cold felt more like Christmas. Ditto for the snow falling determinedly to the ground in an attempt to undo the plow's earlier work. He motioned in the direction of his car, a black BMW. Scarlet followed him. If it's any consolation, parents' divorces get easier by the third or fourth one. Well, that put things into perspective. How many times have your parents been divorced? He'd read about several of her mother's marriages, but had forgotten the exact number. The O.D., original dad, has only been divorced once. He lives in Hawaii with his second family. I don't ever see him. My mom has been divorced five times and is currently living in Costa Rica. Her boyfriend, Benito, only speaks marginal English. Scarlet lifted her eyebrows, miming a hopeful expression. He might be the one. If he can't understand mom, less chance of them arguing. Liam nodded, cataloging this information. Do they know I'm just a fake boyfriend? Exactly how many people did he have to pretend for? Oh, they won't be here. They're on some Mediterranean cruise they planned long ago, and it's too inconvenient to get out of. Mom is coming out in January, but by then my sister Vi and I will both be gone. Scarlet said the words casually, like it didn't bother her that her mother wasn't making an effort to be with the family for Christmas. Maybe life did get easier if you didn't expect anything from your parents. They'd reached his BMW. Liam hit the unlock button on his key fob. Scarlet brightened. This is your car? Yep. He opened the trunk and placed her suitcase inside. She nearly caressed the car's handle. Oh, good. That way I don't have to look even more pushy and psychotic by asking you to stop by a car rental place to get an I-don't-want-my-ex-boyfriend-to-look-down-on-us car. She slipped inside before he could respond. Liam laughed and shut the trunk. It occurred to him as he got behind the wheel that it had been a long time since he laughed. It felt good. He put the mall's address into his GPS and drove that way. Fat snowflakes showed up as white splotches in his headlights. The Christmas decorations hanging from the lampposts were all topped with a layer of snow. So why exactly are you working so hard to impress your ex-boyfriend? Scarlet turned up the car's heat. You've never been dumped by a girl, or you wouldn't ask that question. Everybody's been dumped at some point. A vague response, perhaps. Between dental school and helping his parents, he'd been too busy to date anyone seriously. Okay, she allowed. But sometimes getting dumped is worse than others, and this one was bad. And then the guy dates my cousin. She slumped against her seat. If they get married, I'll get updates on their children for the rest of my life. How recently did he dump you? She tapped her fingers against the armrest. I'm going to appear even more psychotic when I tell you it happened my senior year in high school. Because clearly anyone should be over a guy who dumped her six years ago. And I am. At least, I thought I was until I saw a picture of him with my cousin. And now it's like every insecurity I've ever had has resurfaced, formed a mob, and is beating up my ego in a dark alley. I know you're not really psychotic, 
he assured her. I've studied your life thoroughly, or at least the information Hazel sent me. That had ended up being eight pages. Scarlet turned in her seat to better see him. Well, she is my sister, so she's a little biased. I guess I should find out exactly what she's told you. I hope she didn't relate anything embarrassing. He pressed his lips together. Define embarrassing. Hazel had mentioned that Scarlet could be forgetful. She will lose her phone repeatedly over the week. Don't act surprised by this. Hazel also said that she had no sense of direction. Don't let her drive or walk anywhere without her phone, or we will never see her again. Scarlet blew out a breath. Well, if she told you anything about my mother, then I guess we've already surpassed embarrassing. It's too late to save the family honor. What your parents do isn't your fault. He hadn't meant this sentence to refer to his own parents, but somehow the statement made him feel better. His parents' constant arguing wasn't his fault even though he tried to play peacemaker every time he was around them. Scarlet nodded. That's a saying I ought to cross-stitch, frame, and give to my sisters for Christmas. She fluttered her hand in exasperation. Why do I always get good gift ideas when it's too late to execute them? The statement made him chuckle. Scarlet was charismatic, just as Hazel had said. Well warned, really. Somehow, Scarlet had blown through the awkward small talk portion of getting to know someone and went straight to we're friends now. This was so much better. They drove by an assortment of old brick buildings and a huge lit tree. The colored lights blinked away, cheerfully doing their job despite the weather. Hazel didn't say anything about Camden in her report, Liam said. You'll have to tell me about him. You know, just in case I have to duel him sometime during the week. Scarlet laughed, and the rest of the way to Dillard's, she related how she dated Camden and had been a ten on the smitten scale, and at least a ten on the stupidly handing over her heart scale. Liam hadn't even realized girls weighed these matters in numbers, and therefore been a solid thirty on the devastated scale when he dumped her. And yes, she informed him, that is how the mathematics of broken hearts work. Love goes from one to ten, but heartbreak can be a solid thirty. I never had another serious boyfriend after him. Really? Why? Certainly couldn't be for lack of interested men. She shrugged as though swearing off relationships for six years was a small thing. Maybe I just don't trust men anymore. Or maybe I have higher standards. Choose whichever explanation makes me seem more reasonable. Anyway, now I don't know whether he actually dumped me for Jane all along. I introduced them when we all lived in Flagstaff, so it could have happened that way. Whatever the case, he's definitely broken the ex-boyfriend rules of conduct. They're not supposed to date your family. They'd reached the mall. Liam parked the car behind rows of other last-minute shoppers, and he and Scarlet hiked to the store. As they walked, Scarlet showed him the picture Hazel had sent of Camden and Jane. He looked like a typical pretty boy with a supersized ego, brown hair without a strand out of place, a suit coat that was no doubt designed by some prima donna tailor in Italy. Jane was the sort who exuded sophistication. Her shoulder-length dark blonde hair was highlighted and swept to the side. Dark eyebrows framed brown eyes, and her full lips hinted that she wasn't a stranger to fillers. Liam handed Scarlet's phone back to her. If it's any consolation, Jane isn't as pretty as you. He doubted Jane was as funny either, or as... What was the word he was looking for? Animated, yes... But Scarlet was more than that. She was... He couldn't think of the word. Scarlet slipped the phone into her pocket. 
unmollified. Jane doesn't have to be pretty. She's five times as successful. Being a model is impressive. Scarlet shook her head. My looks are a matter of genetic luck. I didn't do anything to achieve them. It was on my mom and my father, whoever he may be. I thought you said he lived. Scarlet gave another hand wave, clearly a common gesture for her. That's just a little family drama Hazel apparently left out of my bio. Both my parents have brown hair. My dad has brown eyes, and my mom has blue, so when I showed up all green-eyed, blonde, and a lot taller than both my sisters, my dad had his doubts. He raised them, loudly, during the divorce when child support was discussed. Didn't your mom order a paternity test? Nope, which probably says something. Although it might just say that my mom was already expecting stepdad number one to pay our bills. But regardless of whose genetic child I was, O.D. had been my father for four years, so it was still a jerk move. On the plus side, I've saved a ton of money over the years by not sending him Father's Day cards. Wow, I'm sorry. All of this was quickly putting his family troubles into perspective. She smiled at him, the knowing smile of a survivor. Now aren't you glad you only have to be my boyfriend for a week? Your future girlfriend should thank me. I've set the bar really low for her family. Funny, he was just thinking that he wasn't going to mind being her boyfriend at all. Chapter 3 Liam found that shopping for clothes with Scarlet was a distracting experience, mostly because he was ridiculously attracted to her. She gathered shirts and sport coats from the men's department and kept holding them up to him. Every time her fingers brushed against his body, he felt a little shock at the touch, at her closeness. Once she leaned in so close to him that for a moment he thought she was going to kiss his neck. And he didn't jerk away from her. Instead of kissing him, she breathed in deeply. Her nose nearly touched his ear. I'm checking to see if I need to buy you cologne. She didn't move, just breathed in again, making all of his senses tingle. Nope, she said at last. You smell great. She flounced away to a nearby rack, calling over her shoulder. I'm probably going to need to get you out of those pants, too. It was a good thing that none of the shoppers around them were paying attention, or they might have taken that statement the wrong way. His mind had already construed several alternate meanings. She turned to see his response. Is it okay with you to lose those pants? His mouth formed words that didn't come. He nodded to save himself from a mangled response. She smiled and began flipping through a table that held black jeans. He rubbed the back of his neck. How could he go from being a competent professional, an aloof bachelor, to someone who suddenly felt tongue-tied and riddled with hormones? It's only because she's gorgeous, vivacious. That was the word he'd been searching for earlier. And I've been single for too long. Those factors together were muddling his thoughts, but that didn't mean anything. All of this was pretend. He had to stop ogling her like some adolescent out on his first date. Love at first sight didn't exist, even if Scarlet did make a compelling argument for the phenomena. Finally, Liam went to the changing rooms with an armful of clothes, and Scarlet went to look for things for herself. He thought he'd be able to clear his mind of her there, and he did, for a few minutes. As he tried on his shirts, he appreciated that Scarlet had good taste in men's clothing. The things she'd chosen for him did indeed make him look like he'd come from money, or at least from some European country where men dressed well which was ironic because his family did have quite a bit of money, but he'd never dress the part. At least not after he stopped letting his mother buy his clothes in junior high. 
He'd always cared about comfort more than labels. Then, and this was the most distracting thing, Scarlet snuck into the men's changing room and took the stall next to his. No sales clerks were around to protest this action. They were all at the registers, and Liam seemed to be the only guy in the store stuck clothes shopping on Christmas Eve. Scarlet said she'd crashed the men's dressing rooms because the two of them were short on time, and she wanted to see the outfits she'd chosen on him while she tried on stuff for herself. Clearly, the woman had no idea how a male mind worked. When he saw her clothes hit the floor, saw the bottom of her legs bare of everything but a tan, he had a difficult time concentrating on vital things like how to work buttons. She was undressing a few feet away from him. How could he not think about that? How could he not imagine what she looked like in her formerly sand-dusted unmentionables? Are you in the black shirt? She called. A flash of red below the stall let him know she'd slipped something on. Yeah, almost. Just as soon as he remembered how to button again. She had a gold toe ring in pale pink polish. Come out so I can see you. He strolled out of his stall, fidgeting with one of the shirt cuffs. Her dressing room door swung open. Must have done so prematurely because he caught sight of way more skin than she probably intended. She was pulling on a red miniskirt over her long legs. He quickly turned away and saw her reflection in the mirror. He shut his eyes. It was the gentlemanly thing to do. What's wrong? She asked, no embarrassment in her voice. I didn't. Your door came open. Are you dressed now? Oh, she said with understanding. Sorry about that. I forgot you weren't a model. Yeah, I get that a lot. Was it safe to open his eyes? She giggled, a light, airy sound. I meant models are used to changing in front of each other. He opened his eyes. Her skirt was in place and zipped. She wore a cashmere sweater that clung to her curves. An interesting job perk, he said. Not one I've ever had during my residency. Was he breathing normally? It was hard to remember what a normal breathing rate was when you stopped and thought about it. Her eyes ran down him. You look amazing. She stepped over to him, surveying the fit of his shirt. However, this is a little wrinkled. She ran her hand across his chest, trying to erase the wrinkle. And then she did it again. Yep, no concept of how a man's mind worked. None at all. Was astral projection a real thing? Because, if so, he ought to try leaving his body so he didn't do something to embarrass himself. She unbuttoned the top button of his shirt. His breath caught in his lungs. What was she doing? Was she coming on to him? In a department store fitting room? He'd always thought that sort of behavior was tacky and beneath him. Now he was having second thoughts, and his mind was getting stuck on the phrase beneath him, like he'd completely turned into a teenage boy, double entendre included. What do you think? she asked. About what? She lifted her green eyes to his. About the shirt. Do you like it better buttoned or unbuttoned? He couldn't see himself in the mirror because she stood in front of him. He didn't ask her to move. Whatever you want. That phrase also had a double meaning. She unbuttoned the second button, and then her fingers lingered against his skin in a way that made him swallow hard. Hazel hadn't said that Scarlet had a wild side, and Scarlet wasn't doing any of this with a seductive tone or knowing smile. But really, she had to have an inkling, didn't she? She was standing here, undressing him. 
Her eyes traveled up and down him. I think I prefer unbuttoned. You look totally sexy this way. Unbuttoned it is, then. He'd heard of people getting arrested for doing indecent things in dressing rooms. How far could a couple go before the law considered their actions indecent? If he pulled her to him and kissed her, certainly that wouldn't be an arrestable offense. Do you think some steam would help? She asked. Then again, being arrested wouldn't be so bad. Steam is good. Great. Get undressed. He didn't move. He stood staring at her lips while he processed her words. She had just told him to get undressed. Yes, she definitely said those words. She walked toward the dressing room, unzipping her skirt. When you're done undressing, toss the shirt into my stall and I'll find someone who can steam the wrinkles out. Oh, that's what she meant by steam. He tapped his fingers against the side of his jeans and willed his sanity to return. We need to hurry, she reminded him, probably because he was still standing by the mirrors taking shallow breaths. Before she disappeared into her dressing room, her skirt was completely unzipped. Come on, she called to him. He blinked and looked away, but the image of her hand sliding her zipper down stayed firmly put in his mind. He shook his head. What was wrong with him? And more importantly, how was he going to make it through an entire week of being Scarlet's boyfriend without doing something he'd regret later? On the drive to the party at Scarlet's aunt's house, Liam kept his gaze firmly on the road. Even though the snow had faded to just a few tired flakes drifting here and there, Scarlet sat beside him, reading over his information like she was cramming for a test. You like country, pop, and classical music, but hate rap. You have a golden retriever named Bandit, live in Scottsdale, and have a younger brother and sister, Talia and Oliver. Liam hardly heard it. He was too busy psychoanalyzing himself. What in the world had happened to him back in the dressing room? He'd been around beautiful women before. Although, granted, not one that was trying to undress him. Scarlet had undone two buttons on his shirt, and he'd completely lost his mind. It wasn't like him to react that way. He'd always prided himself on being level-headed. When patients started panicking and freaking out in the dental chair, he was always able to calmly talk them down. Rational, reasonable, and not the sort to consider doing anything that would get him thrown out of a mall. He'd only officially met Scarlet an hour ago. And, okay, she was gorgeous. That did things to a man. The whole reason companies used beautiful women in ads was because they understood this fact. But Liam was smart enough not to let himself be ruled by impulses. He didn't even buy a vacuum without checking the reviews and consumer reports. And yet, he'd been two seconds away from pulling Scarlet into his arms and making a fool of himself. Your sister Talia is Hazel's costume designer, and your brother is... something that starts with an L? A landscaper. Scarlet looked back at her phone screen. I mean, lawyer. Liam stared straight ahead at the snowy road and the houses decked out in Christmas lights. He was probably just having some reaction to his parents' divorce, and that uncharacteristic loss of self-control back at Dillard's was a result. Stress manifested itself in a lot of ways, but now that he knew the cause, he could control himself and make sure nothing inappropriate happened again. He would be strictly hands-off with Scarlet. Unless she wanted him to be a hands-on boyfriend. Apparently, thinking in double entendre was going to take a while to get rid of. The point was, he was going to keep his distance, physically and emotionally, from her. Be less friendly and more businesslike. He wasn't going to fall for her or do anything stupid. What sort of lawyer is your brother? 
Scarlet asked. An expensive one. She smacked his leg playfully. I mean, what type of law? Intellectual property. Scarlet's brows dipped together. What do they do? Copyright stuff. No one will ask about it. Trust me. Even my eyes glaze over when he talks about it. And I actually care about his life. She returned her attention to her phone. You never know what will come up. When you lie, it's usually the small details that trip you up. She paused and held up a hand. Not that I lie a lot. It's just something I had to learn with stepdad number four. He had all sorts of rigid rules. I mean, seriously, who has a 9.30 curfew when they're a teenager? Rough. He must have been hard to live with. At least he wasn't creepy. Although, if he had been, stepdad number three taught me 12 different ways to maim an attacker. He was an ex-Navy SEAL. She sighed wistfully. I miss old number three sometimes. Liam cut a gaze in her direction. Has there ever been a dull moment in your life? Lots. I could tell you about several dates I've been on, which are also the reason I swore never to date an engineer again. But I'm supposed to be getting to know you. She put her phone down in her lap with an air of frustration. I feel like memorizing a list of details, like the fact that your golden retriever is named Bingo, Bandit, doesn't really tell me about you as a person. We need to understand each other so we can have rapport and inside jokes. You don't think we have rapport? He found talking to Scarlet so easy. Having rapport seemed to be her superpower. We have first date rapport, she said. Not, you saved me from wandering into the wrong part of L.A. rapport. Hazel did tell you how we supposedly met, right? You asked for directions, and I turned into a stalker. Also, I serenade you occasionally. Now we have a long-distance relationship and a lot of frequent flyer miles from visiting each other. Scarlet was still turned to him, her gaze considering and intent. She put her hands in her lap, as though conducting an interview. What's your biggest dream in life? Right now, getting to your aunt's house without sliding off the road. Hmm. You use humor to deflect from serious topics. In our fake relationship, would that bother me? What? His head momentarily swung to her. You're not supposed to be finding things to criticize. We're happily in love, remember? Okay, your deflecting humor doesn't bother me. I've been known to do the same thing. But I am bothered that you don't want to share your dreams with me. I haven't thought about my biggest dream. That also says something about you. It was amazing how women could turn a perfectly benign conversation on you like that. Yeah. It says I've spent so much time getting through school and doing my residency that mostly I'm happy if I have time at the end of each day to read or take a walk. It doesn't take time to dream, she prodded, just thought. That caused a pang inside him, because, of course, she was right. But then most people didn't know their dreams offhand, did they? What's your biggest dream? He challenged. I have so many, it's hard to choose. I want to travel the world, do a shoot for Vogue, become a mom, and work for a charity that helps children in developing countries. Also, I would like to, just once, call customer service without being put on hold or having to punch in a bunch of numbers first. I dream big. And did Liam not dream at all? He'd planned out his future. He'd eventually take over his uncle's practice. He'd be well off. But that was different than having a dream. Okay. I want to travel the world, become a father, and work for a charity that helps children in developing countries. She tilted her head, and her blonde hair slid off her shoulder. Did you actually give that list any thought? Because those sound suspiciously like my dreams. 
must be why we're soulmates. Although I refuse to model for Vogue. That's where I draw the line. She nudged his knee with her hand. Now you're using humor to avoid self-reflection. The woman had scary skills. It was like she could look into his mind, which was another reason she was dangerous, and he should keep her at arm's length. He didn't need someone plowing through his psyche on a whim. Nope, he said. I'm just considering my dreams. Doctors Without Borders can use my training. You'll have a harder time finding a charity that can use your modeling skills. See, I feel like I've gotten to know you better with this one question than with all the trivia on Hazel's list. Good thing, because she forgot to put a do you avoid serious subjects with humor box on her questionnaire. He pulled up behind a row of cars lining the street in front of Scarlet's aunt's house. It was a two-story A-frame, practically buried in Christmas lights. Evergreen boughs threaded through the banister of an old-fashioned wraparound porch. Liam turned off his car. Let's do this thing. Cool, collected, and in control was working. He could get through this night and this week with Scarlet without doing anything stupid. Chapter 4 Scarlet climbed out of Liam's car with trepidation swirling in her stomach. The walk to Aunt Christina's house gave her a chance to think about what she was doing and the charade she was about to attempt. With every footstep closer to the house, her apprehension grew. Piano music drifted from the house, some Christmas carol that Scarlet only vaguely recognized. Her footsteps became slower and slower until she stopped short of the porch. Have you ever decided to do something, then at the last minute realized it was crazy and a really bad idea? Yep, he said. Definitely. She eyed him. Sounds like there's an interesting story behind that answer. But not one that I'm going to tell you. She folded her hands in mock offense. You're keeping secrets from your girlfriend? Even though the night was cold, talking out here was easier than going inside to start the pretense. Although, really, she was beginning to have second thoughts about the miniskirt and tights she donned. She'd be shivering soon. Liam slid his hands into his pockets. I'm not going to make you do this if you've changed your mind. Lights rimmed the front windows but all the drapes were pulled closed. No one could have seen them yet. Liam could leave now, and no one would know he'd come. Scarlet sighed, and her breath hung in the air, frozen mist that dissolved. No, we need to do this. It will make my grandmother happy. Her eyes flickered to the door, and she dropped her voice. And almost as important make my ex-boyfriend jealous. Almost as important, Liam repeated. At least you have your priorities straight. She wasn't sure if he was teasing her or if his words held a gentle reprimand. Her gaze went to his to check. She still couldn't tell. She let her eyes linger on Liam. He looked amazing in the black shirt and coat she picked out for him. Very jealous worthy. Somehow the clothes transformed him from a nice guy to a man with a secret and slightly dangerous past. This was partly due to his expression. It had been open and friendly when she met him in the airport, but was now somehow brooding. And the man did brooding well. Everything will be fine, she said to herself as much as to him. We'll say as little as possible to everyone and stay under the radar. Right. Less chance of making mistakes that way. Under the radar, she repeated. They walked up the stairs to the front porch. A four-foot Santa stood guarding the door. One carol finished, and the piano immediately started up another. Scarlet hadn't taken her eyes off of Liam. 
His hair, she decided, was a little off for the persona of a mysterious and dangerous past. The picture Hazel had sent showed wavy hair, but he'd done something to tame it flat. She tilted her head, considering the possibilities. Before we go in, I need to fix your hair. What's wrong with it? It's too perfect. It's presidential perfect. Newscaster perfect. She closed the distance between them. I need to work a little bad boy into it. He lifted an eyebrow, but didn't stop her as she ran her fingers through his hair, ruffling it. He had such nice, thick hair. Liam shut his eyes and seemed to be clenching his jaw, which meant she'd bothered him enough. Now you're chic indie star perfect. My parents would be proud. He shifted away from her, standing further away from the door while he waited for her to knock. She frowned. They didn't seem like a couple. No familiarity, no chemistry. They looked like two strangers about to do something neither of them wanted to do. She turned to face him, her back to the door. We need to kiss. He nodded, hands in his pockets again. You mean at New Year's or under the mistletoe or something? No, I mean right now. Her body language is giving us away. It's saying that we've never held hands, let alone anything else. We still have that first date vibe going on. His eyebrows went back up. Okay, her request was probably not one he was expecting. She tried to explain herself better. Once we kiss, we'll have broken that barrier. And we'll be able to act more familiar around each other. Right now, I can tell you're afraid to touch me. You think I'm afraid to touch you? His eyebrow raise changed from disbelief to incredulity. She could work with this. She gave him a teasing, pouty gaze straight from the modeling handbook. If you're not afraid, prove it to me. I dare you. He stepped closer to her, his hands still in his pockets. You know... Hazel specifically told me not to get involved in any dares with you. She said it brings out your impulsive nature. Scarlet had been the one to request a kiss. And yet, his nearness and the intense look in his eyes was making her breath catch in nervousness. Well, Hazel is the reason we're both in this mess. So, should you really listen to her? Liam was close enough to her that she could take hold of his coat and pull him toward her. And maybe she would have to do that because, even though his gaze was on her lips, he made no move to lower his head toward hers. The suspense was aggravating, and at the same time, enticing. Usually, she had to push men away, the fact that Liam was both hesitant and still drawn to her made him that much more attractive. A challenge. He was the type of man who was used to being cautious. She'd known that much about him the moment she caught sight of him in the airport in his plaid shirt, khakis, and sensible shoes. He probably had a schedule and a to-do list that he actually did every day. He wasn't the sort who kissed women he barely knew, but he was standing only inches away, debating kissing her anyway. She parted her lips and leaned closer in order to make it harder for him to resist her. He let out a long breath and stepped closer. Good. She put her hands on his shoulders. The ability to sway a man into doing what he didn't want to was a heady thing. It made her feel powerful, irresistible. She could get used to it. As soon as Scarlet had this thought, she realized it was a horrible one. She shouldn't make anyone, let alone a man who was trying to help her do what he didn't want to do. She wasn't some femme fatale luring men to do her bidding. What had come over her? 
She dropped her hands from his shoulders and took a step back, forgetting how close she stood to the door. Her back brushed against it. She steadied herself. Time to diffuse the situation. You don't have to kiss me if you don't want. Just don't act standoffish once we go inside. People have to believe that... She didn't finish. Liam put his hands on her shoulders, pulled her to him, and brought his lips down on hers. For a moment, she was so surprised, she didn't move. She just stood there as his lips caressed hers. Softly. Gently. The kiss was exactly as she'd imagined it would be. A sweet, questioning touch. Her hands wrapped around his neck and she breathed in his aftershave. His scent was subtle and yet fresh, like a morning stroll through the woods. She waited for him to lift his head and was already regretting that he would end this. Kissing him was so nice. Instead of letting her go, he leaned into her until she was pushed back against the door. His lips were hungrier now, and it left her dizzy. Liam was good at kissing. It was clearly a talent that had been left off his profile. His hands moved to her waist. One thumb found the inch of exposed skin between her sweater and skirt, which had been caused by lifting her hands onto his shoulders. His thumb stroked her skin there, just one small touch, and yet it sent a shiver throughout her. She had stopped feeling the cold night air. All she felt was Liam pressed against her. And then someone opened the door. She both heard and felt the doorknob turn, but couldn't do anything to prevent herself from falling backward. Her arms were entwined around Liam so that he toppled inside as well. She did her best to break the fall, twisting and putting out one hand, but the floor slapped into her anyway, and Liam's weight pushed the air from her lungs. The piano music stopped abruptly, several people letting out exclamations. Liam rolled off her. His voice was both apologetic and worried. Are you okay? Yeah. She opened her eyes to see the startled face of her aunt, doorknob still in her hand, gaping at her. Several of the party guests were scattered around the living room. All were staring at her. Great. Oh, and Jane and Camden sat on the love seat by the piano, sipping drinks. This kept getting better. Hazel was nowhere around. Perhaps that was for the best. Voices drifting from the kitchen and family room attested that the party was spread out. Liam got to his feet and helped Scarlet to hers. Her miniskirt had hiked upwards, and she viciously yanked it down. Stupid fashion choice. Thank goodness she'd worn tights, or her underwear might have been a conversation topic for the second time that day. Well, Aunt Christina said in a stiff, horrified voice, we were just wondering where you were. She shut the door with a firm thud. I'm so sorry I made the two of you fall. I thought I heard a knock. I wouldn't have opened the door if I'd known you were. It's fine, Scarlet brushed herself off. We're fine. Jane, drink in hand, raised her glass as though making a toast. Scarlet always did like to make a dramatic entrance. Camden's mouth hung slightly ajar, although whether from shock or amusement, Scarlet couldn't tell. This was so not the impression she'd wanted to make on him. Everyone in the room was still staring. Scarlet's face flamed and she couldn't bring herself to look at Liam. He'd probably dated a lot of women, but her? Yeah, he was never going to forget her. She just assured herself a place in his worst kiss hall of fame. She gestured weakly in his direction. Hey everyone, this is my boyfriend Liam, obviously. It wasn't until her grandmother spoke that Scarlet noticed her sitting in the corner of the far couch. 
She looked smaller and thinner than the last time Scarlet had seen her, but she was upright and alert. I thought you were bringing home Jeremy. Oh no. Scarlet was only seconds into this charade and she'd already forgotten she was supposed to refer to Liam as Jeremy. Jane took a sip of her drink. Well, Scarlet does go through men quickly. Her tone was teasing, as though this was all just good-natured joking. Jane kept her caddy contained while Grandma was around. Scarlet wiped off a piece of tinsel that had attached itself to her skirt. Actually, this is Jeremy. What I mean is that Liam is Jeremy's nickname because... Had she told Liam just minutes ago that she knew how to lie? She'd been wrong about that. Under the pressure of so many gazes, her mind went completely blank. Because, Liam supplied smoothly, there were a couple of other Jeremys in my school classes, so I started going by my middle name. Less confusion. Thank goodness the man could think on his feet. Liam slipped his hand around hers, either as a show of affection or so he could drag her away from the crowd if she said anything else that was stupid. They're both lovely names, Grandma said. What do you want us to call you? Liam is fine. Everyone was still watching them, probably because she hadn't introduced anyone to him. Right. That was the polite, expected thing. She named off a couple of neighbors, her old Sunday school teacher, the minister's wife, and then got to her family. My grandma, Lois, is on the couch. Aunt Christina let us in, and over by the piano is Jane and Camden. She didn't look at Camden. If he was watching her smugly, or worse, pityingly, she didn't want to know. Good to meet you all, Liam said. Several people chimed in that they were glad to meet him, that it was so nice for him to spend the holidays in Flagstaff, all pretending that this was a normal introduction. Well, except for Mrs. Zimmerman, the minister's wife, her eyebrows hadn't quite returned to resting position. Scarlet's curiosity got the better of her, and her gaze flicked in Camden's direction. He was smiling at her, as though happy to see her. The smile was like a hundred other ones he'd given her in high school. Suddenly, she was seventeen again, waiting for him on the edge of the football field while he sauntered up to her, and the world only contained the two of them. That was not the emotion she'd expected to have at this moment. She shifted her eyes to Jane. Ah, there was the smugness she'd expected. Smug and disapproving, and not at all apologetic for dating Scarlet's ex. Grandma reached her arms out. Scarlet, come give me a hug. In all of the excitement, you've forgotten to hug me. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, it was only a tumble. Scarlet made her way across the room to the couch and hugged her grandmother. Each time she'd hugged her grandmother, the woman felt thinner. Now she seemed to be mostly bones. Grandma released her and sunk back onto the couch. I'm glad you finally brought your young man home. Scarlet wiped another piece of tinsel off her sweater. Cashmere, it turned out, was nature's Velcro. We wouldn't have missed this Christmas for the world. Mrs. Zimmerman picked up a sugar cookie from the plate in her lap. How long have you two been together? Quiz time already. Five months, Scarlet motioned for Liam to join her, although it feels much longer. Wait, was that a good thing? Had she just told everyone that time went slowly when she was with Liam? She took his hand in what she hoped was a natural manner. I mean, it feels like we've been together a long time because we have so much in common. Like we both love to travel. She was nervously spitting out words. He's a proctologist. A doctor. 
Liam squeezed her hand. She'd gotten something wrong. I mean, he will be a proctologist. Right now, he's a scrub-wearing resident at Levine Medical Center. She knew she'd gotten that part right, but he was still squeezing her hand like he was trying to send Morse code through her palm. Grandma's expression lit up. A doctor. How nice. She was clearly happy about that. Finally, Scarlet had a moment where she was in the spotlight, shining brighter than Jane. Grandma let out a shaky laugh and pointed in Liam's direction. I haven't been a fan of doctors lately, but I'll make an exception in your case. You're very welcome here. Mrs. Papoutsis, one of Grandma's neighbors, added, It's always good to know someone in the medical profession, she paused. Although I imagine you don't get a lot of requests for house calls. No, Liam said, I don't. He sounded a little like he was gritting his teeth. It's an important job, Mrs. Papuzza said, even if it does have its drawbacks. Liam nodded. All jobs have their drawbacks, don't they? Yeah, Camden said, smirking. But you have to take more crap with some jobs than others. This caused several people to titter. Scarlet wasn't sure why. Liam smiled stiffly and didn't respond. I mean, Camden went on, obviously pleased with himself. In some jobs you're bound to meet more, pardon my French, a-holes than in others. Liam's smile grew stiffer, and he gave Camden a pointed look. True, I just keep meeting them wherever I go. Well, those two had taken a firm dislike to each other pretty quickly. Jane took a sip of her drink, her eyes never leaving Liam. How did you choose your profession? I mean, have you always wanted to be in that field? Nope, Liam said. It was a very sudden career switch. It was obviously time to change the subject. Liam is the eldest of three, Scarlet said. His sister is a costume designer and his brother is a lawyer. Intellectual property. And since you know intellectuals have pretty boring property, we don't talk about him much. That's a little lawyer joke. Not a funny one, obviously, because no one laughed. Right. Liam forced a smile at Scarlet. I'm sure you didn't eat much on your flight. Why don't we go to the kitchen and get some food? Sure. She led him across the room toward the hallway to the kitchen. Glad that introductions were over. I'm starved. Of course you are, Jane murmured too low for Grandma to hear. That's the typical model diet. Wow, the caddy was out of the bag. What? Scarlet asked her sweetly. Let Jane repeat herself loud enough for Grandma and everyone else to hear. Nothing, Jane said. I'm just glad the two of you could drop in. Drop in? So quick with the puns. That high-priced Stanford education was obviously worth the money. Scarlet rolled her eyes at Jane and led Liam past more party guests. They went through the family room to the main kitchen. Aunt Christina's house had two kitchens. The one that was attached to the family room was mostly just a show of beautiful cabinetry and shelves, with a fridge thrown in for drinks. It was a serving area that could easily be kept spotless, because it was never actually used for anything but displaying trays of food during parties. People mingled about there eating, talking, and throwing out polite hellos when they noticed Scarlet. She and Liam grabbed plates of food and went to the work kitchen, the one with all the real cooking and storage implements. In this one, the dishwasher was chugging along, packages littered the countertops, and backup fruit and vegetables sat washed in the sink, waiting to be called to duty. In this one, they could have some privacy, 
As soon as Scarlet shut the door behind them, Liam put his plate on the counter and scrubbed a hand over his face as though searching for patience. Prostodontist. What? Scarlet popped a cherry tomato into her mouth. I'm a prosthodontist. That's a dental specialist who handles complex oral cases like jaw surgery, implants, bridges, and crowns. If you wanted to change my career to make it sexier, you picked the wrong one. Wait, what? Scarlet put her hand to her chest. I thought you were a doctor. I am a doctor, a DDS, doctor of dentistry. Her other hand joined the first pressed to her chest. What did I say you were? A proctologist. Those are the doctors who do rectal exams. Oh, crap. He nodded, almost smiling. Yeah, I'm going to hear a lot of poop puns this week. Thanks. I didn't mean... She hadn't even thought about the connection, but now Camden's comments made sense. Instead of being impressed or jealous, he'd been mocking Liam's career. Scarlet sunk into one of the bar stools that lined the island. Why didn't you correct me when I first said you were a proctologist? People would have assumed it was just a slip of the tongue. Because you also said I was a doctor. If I'd corrected you, people would wonder why you didn't say I was a dental specialist. Most people don't call dentists doctors. He joined her at the island. And by the way, stepdad number four wasn't all that bright if you got away with lying to him. I'm usually better than this. She put her elbows on the island and cradled her head in her hands. I realize that's not a great thing to say to impress a guy. Are you trying to impress me? A little. Probably a hopeless case by this point. He put his hand on her back reassuringly. It's not the end of the world. I can fake being a proctologist for the week. I'll just have to study up on some of the terminology and hope no one asks any probing questions. His hand dropped away and he rubbed his forehead. Speaking of proctologist puns that I didn't mean to utter, yeah, I'm going to have to watch what I say all week. I'm sorry. It will be fine. He picked up a sugar cookie from his plate and took a bite. As long as no one has a rectal emergency and expects me to do something about it. She contemplated that scenario, then laughed, and couldn't stop for several moments. Sorry, she said when she got control of herself again. I'm imagining who'd have a rectal emergency and how you'd jump in to handle it. Maybe you should be worried. Fate has a sense of humor. Liam took another bite. If fate's going to mess with me, I should at least be able to choose who has the emergency. I vote for your ex. The guy's clearly a pain in the butt, so it's only fitting. Scarlet picked up a carrot stick from her plate and tapped it against her lips as though considering. Sounds like he'll have a bad week. So you're saying that if I wanted to steal Camden back, this might be a bad time? Liam cocked his head. Is that even under consideration? No. She said the sentence flippantly, but now she thought of the smile he'd given her earlier, and Jane's catty demeanor. Although, is it really stealing if I had him first? You dated six years ago, so yes, it still seems wrong. Of course Liam wouldn't understand. Scarlet was just coming off as a horrible person. Jane has always done everything better than me, and now she's managed to snag the guy who was too good for me. Scarlet bit into her carrot stick. I bet Camden's mother even likes Jane's family. None of them ever ran off to Bermuda with a man who was 20 years her senior. Was that your mom, or did I miss something on your bio? That was mom and stepdad number two. He didn't last long. The door swished open and Hazel came inside carrying an empty platter. She was pretty and petite. Well, petite compared to Scarlet, 
with cornflower blue eyes and long brown hair that swung around her shoulders. Even though she was shorter than Scarlet, she always gave off an air of extreme competence. It must be an older sister thing. Hazel put the platter on the counter, swept over to Scarlet, and gave her a hug. I'm glad you're finally here. She smiled at Liam and shook his hand. Nice to meet you again. We really appreciate your help. She went to one of the kitchen drawers and pulled out a ladle. Have you already introduced Jeremy to Grandma? Yes, Scarlet said. And now he goes by his middle name, Liam. I sort of messed up that part. Also, he's a proctologist instead of a prosthodontist. I messed that up too. Hazel's eyes grew alarmed. Were you believable at all? Well, we fell into the living room because Aunt Christina opened the front door while we were leaning against it kissing. So, um, I think everyone believes Liam is actually my boyfriend. Hazel shot Liam a sharp look, like she thought he'd been making the moves on Scarlet. Scarlet held up her hand to draw her sister's attention back. Kissing was my idea. I wanted our body language to be believable. I just hadn't planned on an audience. Or, for that matter, getting so carried away. Liam motioned toward Scarlet. Now she's debating dumping me and going after her ex. Hazel gasped and pointed the ladle at her. Don't you dare flirt with Camden. Grandma is supposed to think you're in a committed relationship. Not that you're jumping from guy to guy. You cannot be Mom the sequel. Scarlet lifted both hands in surrender. I never said I would flirt with him. I only said it would be nice if for once someone liked me more than Jane. Hazel lowered her ladle. I like you more, although that will change if you so much as bat an eyelash at Camden. I won't, Scarlet said. Hazel considered Scarlet like she was trying to peer into her mind. Seriously, I won't, Scarlet emphasized. I'll only have eyes for Jeremy slash Liam. If you want, we can even be one of those couples who has no sense of propriety where public displays of affection are concerned. Liam cocked his head. Do I get any say in that? Babe, Scarlet turned to him and patted his arms. We already fell into the living room. It's too late to have any pride. Hazel shook her head. You don't have to do anything that will make everyone feel uncomfortable. Just act happy and in love. That's all I'm asking. The door opened again, and Matt strode into the kitchen. He was tall with thick brown hair and a hint of scruff on his chin. He'd been Grandma's quiet, dependable neighbor for years. He was also a paramedic, which meant he frequently helped Hazel take care of Grandma when her nurse wasn't on duty. There you are, he said to Hazel. The two had recently started dating, and Matt knew, although he didn't quite approve, of Hazel manufacturing a boyfriend for Scarlet. He nodded at Scarlet and reached out his hand to Liam. You must be Jeremy. Well, you'd think so, Liam said and shook his hand. We've decided, Scarlet said, sort of by accident, that he goes by Liam. Matt nodded. That'll be easier for me to remember. Glad you came. If you ever need a man cave break, I live next door to Grandma Lois. Thanks, Liam said. Matt took note of Hazel's scowl, put his arm around her shoulder, and gave her a squeeze. I can tell from your expression of barely controlled frustration that you told Scarlet about your grandmother's will. Scarlet straightened. She didn't say anything about the will. And it couldn't be good news if barely controlled frustration was a normal response. What's wrong with it? Hazel's shoulders sagged, and she attempted a shrug. Nothing. Grandma can leave her house to whomever she wants. Scarlet had assumed she'd leave it to their mother, who would then let Hazel live in it. Uncle Frank, Grandma's only other child, had died of a heart attack three years ago. Grandma liked Aunt Christina, but didn't quite trust her new boyfriend, Bill. He was retired, and Grandma was afraid Bill wanted to freeload off Aunt Christina's money. 
Is Grandma leaving her house to Aunt Christina? Their aunt already owned this rather expensive home on the hill as well as a condo in Phoenix. She didn't need a house like Hazel did. Hazel exchanged a look with Matt. Uh, perhaps it's better not to tell her, look. And then Scarlet knew. Jane? She's leaving it to Jane. Hazel, to her benefit, remained calm and unemotional, as though she'd rehearsed her explanation many times. According to Jane, yes. Grandma hasn't come out and said as much to me, although she has said she wants her house to go to someone in the family who'll live in it and love it, not sell it. The indignity stung. Granted, Scarlet would have a hard time finding modeling jobs in Flagstaff, and Vi was happy with her job in Phoenix. But Hazel lived in Flagstaff. Hazel, who was always here taking care of Grandma. You love the house more than Jane. You're the one that tends her garden every summer and helps her with things. Why should Jane get it? Because... A note of bitterness seeped into Hazel's words. Grandma thinks Jane is the closest of any of us to settling down and needing a place to raise a family. She's been dating Camden for nearly a year. Scarlet folded her arms tightly against her chest. So you're saying my idea of breaking them up is actually a good one? Liam grunted his disapproval of that idea. No, Hazel said. I'm definitely not saying that. I'd love to live in the house, but it's just a house. Scarlet didn't unfold her arms. It's the house that Grandpa built for Grandma as a token of their love. And you've always adored it twice as much for that reason. Hazel shrugged. She couldn't refute the fact. But Scarlet knew that wasn't the only reason her sister was attached to Grandma and Grandpa's house. It had been a safe haven for Scarlet and her sisters every summer. A place that never changed, despite everything else that their mother may have changed. An anchor. It was the reason they'd all gone to NAU despite the fact that they lived in so many different cities. The home could never mean as much to Jane. You should be the one to have it, Scarlet reiterated. We don't know anything for sure, Hazel said. Grandma's lawyer is coming here after the holidays to ensure her affairs are in order. So she'll finalize those details then. And Jane would come out on top. Again. Scarlet pushed away from the island and paced across the floor. She didn't like airing the family's dirty laundry in front of Liam, and yet the words kept jumping out of her mouth anyway. How does Grandma think it's fair to leave Jane the house just because she has a serious boyfriend? Liam's gaze went from Scarlet to Hazel. Could you buy the house from her? Scarlet stopped pacing, brightening at the idea. What is Grandma leaving the rest of us? Maybe if we pooled our inheritances. I've seen her bank account, Hazel said wearily. Considering the fact that her medical bills keep adding up, even if we all pooled, it would be a shallow pool. And the house is worth over a million. Not in any of their price ranges. It's not right, Scarlet said. Jane has never cared about the house. Matt rubbed Hazel's shoulder, a gesture of comfort. His eyes went to Scarlet. It wouldn't hurt for you to talk to your grandmother about her decision. Hazel shook her head. We don't want Grandma to think we're squabbling about her will. Matt gave Scarlet a look that said, You see what I've been up against. I'll talk to Grandma, Scarlet said, and point out that you're deserving and Jane is likely to do something garish with the house like renovate it into a modern eyesore. More head shaking from Hazel. You know what Mom would say about all of this. Nothing, Scarlet said, because she didn't bother coming home for Christmas. She would say messing with Jane will cause bad karma that'll come back to bite us. Scarlet rolled her eyes. And then she'd warn us that Mercury is in retrograde and find a crystal to solve our problems. That's why we all stopped listening to her. 
Hazel pointed the ladle at Scarlet again. The whole point of this week is to make Grandma happy. None of us is going to cause any drama. She seemed to realize she was waving the ladle too intently. She took a deep breath, the way an actor did before going on stage. Now, let's all go to the family room for the traditional Christmas Eve toast. Fine, Scarlet said. I won't cause drama. Jane can have Camden, but I won't let her have the house, too. Chapter 5 Scarlet held Liam's hand as they ambled into the family room. Holding hands was a couple thing to do, and besides, she liked the feel of his hand in hers. Maybe because it reassured her he wasn't going to bolt for the door. Proctologist. Ugh. How could she have remembered the detail about his brother being an intellectual property lawyer and completely changed Liam's career? They took a place in the far corner by themselves. Her eyes darted around the people filing in. I need to find my grandmother, she whispered to Liam, and tell her I want to talk to her privately, tonight if possible. Private talks needed to be planned because Hazel had scheduled blocks of time for relatives to sit with Grandma during the day when she was awake. A nurse took over in the evenings. Scarlet's turn to sit with Grandma wasn't until the next afternoon. What are you going to say to her? I'll tell her that Hazel deserves the house. Perhaps that wouldn't be enough. Do you think there's some reason Grandma doesn't want to leave it to her? Maybe I should hint that I've been thinking of returning to Flagstaff and will need a place to live. Out of my sisters, I've always been Grandma's favorite, so she's more likely to leave it to me if I ask. Then I could give it to Hazel. That would be a generous gift to your sister. Grandma wanted someone who'd stay in the house and love it, like she had. Scarlet would have to remind Grandma that someone of Jane's ambition and talent would never stay in Flagstaff. She was destined for some high-powered job in a big city, and her relationship with Camden, well, Scarlet could attest that he had no problem dumping girls he dated for months. She had first-hand experience. He was the type who wouldn't settle down for a long time. Camden pushed Grandma's wheelchair into the room, Jane at her side. He parked Grandma by a long cream couch, and he and Jane seated themselves next to her. Camden caught Scarlet's eye and smiled. It was the old, familiar smile he used to give her. A little teasing. One might even say flirtatious. Yeah. The guy was so not ready to settle down. Scarlet wasn't even going to have to exaggerate that point when she talked to Grandma about the house. Scarlet smiled back. Friendly, but not flirtatious. Funny, since she'd found out Camden was going to be here, she'd thought of a dozen different opening lines and things she could say to him. In most of them, she'd been aloofly disinterested. In a few, she'd been more pointed. I see you have a type. My family. After all, the guy deserved a little pointedness for dumping her and dating her cousin. Now, all of her good opening lines were wasted. Camden and she had already breached the first conversation barrier. And they talked about proctology. I'll be right back, Scarlet told Liam. She made her way across the room to her grandmother and took hold of her hand. Bruises dotted her hand and arm, evidence of some sort of medical poking. How are you holding up? Scarlet asked. I'm having one of my good days, fortunately. I'm glad you brought your young man with you. She leaned forward and in an approving voice added, He's very handsome. Jane smiled. We always knew Scarlet would fall for someone interesting. We just didn't think it would be so literal. Right. Scarlet was never going to get tired of being reminded that she tumbled into the living room in front of a crowd. He is interesting, Scarlet said, and very smart. Where did you say he went to school? Jane's voice was conversational, but Scarlet knew why her cousin was asking. She would make a comparison to see if the school was as prestigious as Stanford. 
Scarlet wasn't going to touch that topic. She kept her attention on her grandmother. He's traveled to so many interesting places. Rome, Peru, Egypt, but he loves Arizona the most. Even though he could practice anywhere in the country, he's told me he doesn't want to live more than a few hours drive away from his family. Meaning Flagstaff would be a good location for him. Let that seed germinate for a bit. Grandma squeezed her hand. I can hardly wait to get to know him better. Camden winked at Scarlet. I wouldn't ask him too much about his career unless you want to lose your appetite. True. Grandma nodded in agreement. One of the few good things about having terminal cancer is I don't have to worry about my next colonoscopy. Typical Grandma. Joking where other people would grow solemn. Don't worry, Scarlet said. Liam never talks business. And especially wouldn't this week. Grandma rested her other hand on top of Scarlet's. Hopefully... I'll have enough energy to come downstairs Christmas morning. But if not, bring him to my room so we can chat. I did want to talk to you, Scarlet said. Privately, she kept herself from glancing in Jane's direction. Would tonight back at your house work? Of course, dear, unless I'm too worn out by the festivities. In that case, Scarlet said, we'll have to make sure you keep your dancing to a minimum. Grandma chuckled. You're the one who's always dancing. She turned to Camden, including him in this observation. Scarlet was quite the dancer when she was younger. So many recitals. I used to wonder if she'd go to Broadway. Only because Grandma gave Scarlet credit for way more talent than she had. None of her teachers had ever suggested she make a profession out of it. You don't need to tell Camden about me. We dated in high school. Didn't Jane mention that? Grandma's eyes widened in surprise, which meant no, she hadn't. They only dated for a little while, Jane put in quickly. It was teenage stuff. They weren't serious. Really? Scarlet asked with forced politeness. I'm not sure how you would know how serious I was. Although I did introduce the two of you when we were in high school, so perhaps you talked about me back then. She turned to Camden, still all politeness. Was Jane part of the reason you broke up with me? No, of course not. Camden didn't even flinch to show the subject was difficult to talk about. Jane and I started dating last year at Stanford. I went there after Johns Hopkins for my MBA and I was glad to see a familiar face on campus. Charming, and probably true, knowing that Camden hadn't cheated on her in high school should have made Scarlet feel better, but somehow it didn't. The main fact was the same. Scarlet hadn't been good enough for him to keep as a girlfriend. Jane was. Small world, Scarlet said. Yes, Camden agreed. Small world. He turned his attention to Grandma. And it becomes even smaller when you have a family of such beautiful, talented granddaughters. Grandma smiled, relieved by these assurances. They're all beautiful. Her eyes went to Scarlet. And I'm so glad you have your own nice young man now. Jeremy must be special. Scarlet didn't correct her about his name. She was considering her grandmother's words and wondering if there was something wrong with her that at 23 she hadn't had a serious relationship since Camden. Interest from guys wasn't the problem. She'd dated dozens of men. But usually not for more than a month before she broke it off. None of them had seemed right. Dating them for longer would just be leading them on. She let go of her grandmother's hand and straightened. I'd better get back to him. It was a good thing she had her model walk down because she'd somehow forgotten how to walk naturally, and she could feel Jane's and Camden's gazes on her. Or maybe she was just imagining that. Maybe neither one of them cared at all about her. 
She sidled up to Liam, and just in case anyone was watching her, gave him a dazzling smile. He held two filled glasses and gave her one. She took it and almost took a sip before she remembered the drink was for the upcoming toast. Grandma said she'll talk to me tonight. Well, technically she said she wanted to talk to you tonight, but I'll obviously be there. He slipped his arm around her waist and leaned closer to her so he could whisper in her ear, You want me around while you trash talk your cousin and tell your grandmother Jane doesn't deserve the house? He didn't sound approving of that plan. I'm not going to lead with that. I mean, we'll talk about you first. You mean, we'll talk about my career, that I know nothing about. He still didn't sound approving. That reminds me, where did you go to med school? Can it be Harvard? Does Harvard have a medical school? Let's just steer clear of any discussions where I might have to talk about classes or a campus I know nothing about. Aunt Christina strolled to the center of the room. To get everyone's attention, she clanged her spoon against an empty metal serving tray. Time for the annual toast. For those of you who are new, she smiled at Liam, we all say one thing that happened this year that we are grateful for. We'll start with the oldest and go to the youngest. She made a sweeping gesture to Grandma. And now a word from our matriarch. Grandma held her glass with a slightly quavering hand. I'm grateful to have so many of my friends and family here, and hope the ones who are missing will come soon. She meant Violet, who'd been held up by a snowstorm and other complications and was currently spending time with a guy from her office in his hometown. I couldn't ask for better people in my life. Because if I did, it wouldn't matter. I'm stuck with a lot of you. A wave of laughter went around the room. Some of Grandma's friends offered toasts next, each good-naturedly insisting that the other was older. When three, one after the other, all gave teary-eyed tributes to Grandma and how grateful they were to have her in their lives, Grandma thanked them and added, I'm banning any more gratitude about me during the toast. We don't want to turn Christmas Eve into my eulogy. You can all talk about how great I am at the funeral. In fact, I'll be writing up lists so you don't forget anything. More laughter. Grandma really was having a good day. Her sense of humor was going full blast. More neighbors offered toasts. Bill, Aunt Christina's boyfriend, was grateful for all the good food. Everyone's toast was short and sweet until it was Aunt Christina's turn. She insisted that she couldn't choose only one thing. She spent five minutes relaying how great her life was. Scarlet would be the last to toast. She was a couple months younger than Jane. There was a bit of questioning about who was oldest when it came to the boyfriends. Matt, it turned out, was the oldest. He put his arms around Hazel. I'm grateful Hazel got rid of her last boyfriend. She beamed up at him. They were so adorable together. So right. Liam's turn. He raised his glass. And I'm glad Scarlet got rid of hers. Scarlet coughed a little and had to remind herself that most of the people in the room didn't know she hadn't really had a boyfriend since Camden. Camden certainly didn't show any sign of realization. If he had, he wouldn't have kept smiling at her. Hazel raised her glass. I'm thankful that Matt finally came to his senses and asked me out. Me too, Grandma called, and everyone in the room laughed. Camden raised his glass next. I'm grateful to have the most wonderful woman in the world in my life. Whatever. Could the guy not make a toast without pointing out that Jane was better than everyone? It was Jane's turn. She beamed at the other guests. I guess this is an announcement, as much as it is a toast. Last week, while we were vacationing in Acapulco, Camden took me to the beach at sunrise and asked if I would spend the rest of my life as his wife. And I said yes. The room erupted in cheers. 
clapping and congratulations, it was a good thing that everyone's attention was on Jane because Scarlet felt the blood drain from her face. Camden and Jane were getting married? That meant Scarlet would have to politely go to their wedding and see them at Grandma's funeral and get updates on their perfect children any time she talked to her aunt or her mother. And the house. How could Scarlet convince her grandmother that she was just as good a candidate as Jane to inherit the house? Her cousin had just fast-tracked her chances. Scarlet needed to up her game. Finally, the room calmed down and remembered that one person still hadn't given her toast. Scarlet glanced at Liam. Should we tell them our news, hun? He probably could figure out what she had in mind. There weren't a whole lot of things she'd announce after her cousin's declaration. She was giving him a chance to protest, to shake his head, or to give her a look that meant, no, this is a super bad idea. He didn't shake his head, or look horrified. In fact, he slipped his hand around her waist supportively. Sure, darling. She raised her glass. It's sort of a coincidence that Jane just let us know about her engagement. Because Liam asked me to marry him earlier tonight. I guess you all saw the fallout of that question. That phrase earned a round of laughter from the group as well as equally enthusiastic congratulations. It was a small win, but she decided to take it. Liam's eyes widened for just a second. He hadn't known what she'd planned after all. Chapter 6 Liam had supposed he and Scarlet would leave the party the same time her grandmother did, but when Hazel took Grandma home, Liam and Scarlet were stopped from following her by an abundance of people wishing them well, asking questions, and offering advice. By the time they left, he felt like he'd stepped into some alternate life. He'd gone from fake boyfriend to fake fiancé without warning. Okay, actually, Hazel had warned him that Scarlet did impulsive things, but he hadn't expected this. He ought to be irritated that Scarlet had just changed the nature of their agreement without consulting him. Somehow, though, he wasn't that irritated. Maybe because the role had benefits. Scarlet was glued to his side all night. And when the two had moved around the room to talk to yet another group of well-wishers and someone pointed out they were standing under the mistletoe, Scarlet hadn't hesitated to wrap her arms around his neck, press her body to his, and kiss him. It was just a short kiss, but one that still wiped all thought from his mind for several seconds. Lying to her grandmother, however, had just gotten a lot harder. It was one thing to pretend to be a boyfriend. Boyfriends came and went. Lying about being engaged seemed much worse. Scarlet's grandmother had been so happy to hear the news, she'd cried. She'd beckoned them over on the spot, putting her trembling hand on his and welcomed him to the family. She'd also insisted on taking pictures of the two, cell phone raised, while Scarlet snuggled into his side, arms wrapped around him. And that's how things had been the rest of the night. If her hand wasn't in his, it was around his waist. Every time she smiled adoringly at him, part of him had wanted to believe this was real. Seeing her interact with everyone, he couldn't help but appreciate that she was more than just beautiful. She was smart and sweet and remembered enough about her grandmother's friends' lives to make them feel important. During one of the well-wishers' speeches to Liam about what a catch he was getting, he found himself rubbing Scarlet's back, almost unconsciously, like the two of them were really a couple. And to think he'd ever assumed Hazel's advice about being careful not to follow all of Scarlet's suggestions was unnecessary. He'd become engaged to her without a moment's protest. Hazel should have used some exclamation points with her warnings. Now that the party was over, he needed to remember another fact about Scarlet. She hadn't had a serious boyfriend since Camden. 
and Hazel had said Scarlett didn't date anyone for long. She clearly didn't want a relationship, not with Liam or anyone else. Well, anyone except Camden, maybe. That was a thought that made Liam grind his teeth. He needed to put some distance between himself and her big green eyes, full lips, and long legs. They got in the car. He brought up Scarlett's grandmother's address on his GPS, and they drove silently toward it. Only five minutes until they reached it, and he could disappear into his room. She turned in her seat. You're mad at me, aren't you? What happened to us saying as little as possible to people and flying under the radar? Jane announced her engagement. What else could I do? Congratulate her like everyone else? Scarlet sighed. This is a beloved house we're talking about, and Jane just gave herself the perfect reason to inherit it. I had to increase my chances. She put her hand on his leg. Being engaged to me isn't really such a horrible thing, is it? The touch of her fingers was warm and intimate, and therefore should stop. You don't need to pretend anymore, he said. No one is around. What? He shot a glance at her hand on his leg. She removed her hand, straightening back to her side of the car. You really are angry. I'm not angry. It's just... He couldn't explain that he was already too attracted to her, and this was only going to make things more difficult, so he let the sentence drift off. I'm sorry, she said, all meekness. But you'll only have to pretend to be my fiancé for a week. After Grandma passes away, I'll tell my family we broke up. She put her hands together like a pilgrim offering a prayer. One day, you might want a favor, and I'll owe you one. Big time. He wasn't going to let his mind drift to possible favors. Dangerous terrain. He wanted to kiss her again. Just the thought reminded him of how she'd wrapped her arms around his neck on the porch, and how right that had felt. He turned down a street and checked the GPS to see when the next turn was. Think of a favor, she said. I bet there's something I can do for you. Four hundred feet until his next turn. He would concentrate on directions and not on her long, shapely legs stretched out in his car. Really, she said. I want to do something for you. You know, you should think about how that offer sounds before you make it. I could come up with something you don't like. She shrugged. Like cleaning or yard work? Don't worry, I am not afraid to break my nails. She waved them at him. Completely fake and therefore replaceable. He shook his head. Hazel had neglected to mention how naive her sister was. Scarlet had kissed him twice tonight, held his hand all evening, put her hand on his knee, and hadn't considered where his thoughts might go when she gazed at him with her big green eyes and murmured, I want to do something for you. Maybe it was just him. Maybe he had a weakness for beautiful girls with long blonde hair and bounce. Maybe being around Scarlet just made all sorts of neurons fire in his brain that were best left alone. Two more minutes until they reached the house and he could disappear into the guest room and clear his head. Become himself again. The logical person who was in control of situations. You don't owe me anything, he said. I agreed to be your boyfriend. I guess being your fiancé won't be all that different but we should get our story straight. Where exactly will we be living once we marry? Arizona. In fact, you'll be looking into a practice up here because you love the area and it's just the right amount of space from your parents. Well, that was the truth. He could use some more distance from his parents right now. You're giving up modeling? It's a casualty of love. Maybe I'll finish college. Grandma would like that. What will your family and your grandmother's friends think when none of these plans happen? Probably that I'm flaky, like my mom, Scarlet sighed. They already half believe it. 
She deflated a little and sunk into her seat. I'm not, though. I'm not at all like her. Scarlet stared out the window and sighed again. Except that I look like a taller, blonde version of her. I use my hands to talk like she does. And according to her, we have the same, Scarlet made air quotes, energy vibrations. Her hands fell back to her lap. But I refuse to be like her. Meaning? Meaning I refuse to mess up people's lives the way she's done. Scarlet waved a hand at him, except for yours when I jilt you at the altar. Or if you'd rather, you can cheat on me. Hot doctors are chick magnets. Everyone knows that. I think you're forgetting I'm a proctologist. Hmm, but you're still hot and rich. He laughed. Just like that, she'd erased his bad mood and made him want to kiss her all that much more. And this was just the first day of the week. They reached Scarlet's grandmother's house. It was a blue Victorian, with a red door, a turret, balcony, and semi-wraparound porch. Quirky and charming, sort of like a patriotic gingerbread house. He climbed out of the car and opened her door, still staring at the house. With the new fallen snow covering it, the place looked like it could have been a Christmas card. He almost expected a horse-drawn carriage to swish by while carolers made their way down the street. It's beautiful, he said. She looped her arm into his. See, it's totally worth marrying me for. You weren't thinking of the benefits before. Yeah, actually, he had been. Only a few more steps and he'd be safely in the guest room. Chapter 7 As soon as Scarlet and Liam stepped through the door, Hazel descended on them, a frown firmly etched on her face. Scarlet's thoughts automatically went to her grandmother. She'd left the party early. Maybe something was wrong. Is Grandma okay? Scarlet asked. She's sleeping which meant Scarlet would have to wait until tomorrow before she had a chance to speak to her about the house. Hazel's frown turned into a glare. All the excitement wore her out. Technically, Scarlet was only responsible for half the excitement. She didn't point this out. Hazel took hold of Scarlet's elbow and Liam's jacket and propelled them down the hall and into the kitchen, the room farthest away from the parlor they'd converted into a bedroom so Grandma didn't have to go up and down the stairs anymore. Hazel planted her hands on her hips and directed her glare at Scarlet. I can't believe you told Grandmother you were engaged. What were you thinking? I was thinking I should show Grandma that Jane isn't the only one who's settling down and will need a home. I figure if Grandma leaves it to me, I can give it to you. Despite this show of generosity... Hazel's hands remained on her hips. All the way home, Grandma talked about how thrilled she was to have two weddings to look forward to. She even wondered if he wanted a double wedding. Scarlet crossed her arms. Absolutely not. I'm not sharing my big day with Jane. Yeah, Hazel said. That kind of goes without saying since you aren't really getting married. But Grandma is still going to expect you to name a date and send an invitation. How are you going to explain to her that your wedding isn't actually going to happen? Scarlet fiddled with one of her coat buttons. It takes a long time to plan a wedding. Ordering the dress alone takes months. Unless your new sister-in-law is a costume designer who can sew anything she sees, then you can get that sort of thing done considerably faster. Grandma doesn't know that. She still knows you can buy dresses off the rack that will look good, especially if you have the body of a model. So, what's your next excuse? Scarlet twisted the button. Um, I've always wanted a June wedding. More than you want your grandmother there? Right, that wouldn't work. She turned to Liam for suggestions. He shrugged. No help at all. I thought we were going with I'm a chick magnet and some other tall blonde steals me away. 
Yeah, Scarlet said, but we can't plan for that sort of thing. Hazel lifted her hands in disbelief. Are you trying to break Grandma's heart? Do you want to send her to an early grave? She paced across the room, hands still in the air. This is what happens when people go off script. It never turns out well. You were supposed to stick with a boyfriend. How hard is that? Scarlet tried again. Maybe his parents aren't available for six months. For some reason, that I'll have to come up with. Hazel reached a wall and stalked back the other way. What if Grandma lives longer than that? She stopped in her tracks and slapped her hand against her mouth. I can't believe I just said that like it was a bad thing. This is what you're doing to me. She groaned and returned to pacing. Just a few days ago, I came to the realization that I have to give up trying to control everything and make sure it's perfect. Like, that was a big epiphany. That I didn't have to take responsibility for other people's lives. I could just let go of some stuff and things would still be fine. And now, it's not. You're messing with my epiphany. She stopped in front of Scarlet. Is my eyelid twitching? It is, isn't it? Not too bad, Scarlet lied. Hazel pulled out one of the chairs, sunk limply into it, and shut her eyes. Why do you always have to compete with Jane? Scarlet huffed and folded her arms. Oh, I don't know, maybe because I've stood in her shadow my entire life? Don't be ridiculous, Hazel retorted. You couldn't possibly stand in her shadow. You're like six inches taller. She just got engaged to my ex. A girl's mind couldn't be expected to work well after that sort of announcement. Plus, Scarlet added, did you not hear the part about me trying to inherit the house and give it to you? That should count for something. Hazel shook her head wearily. If you call off your wedding, you'll end up upsetting Grandma. She'll worry that you can't commit to a relationship. And she's not going to leave you the house if she thinks you're being flaky. If she wanted to leave it to a flaky person, it would already be mom's. Hazel had a point. The plan had seemed like such a good one at the moment. But now... If your wedding date is far in the future, Hazel went on, she'll think that either you don't care about her being at your wedding or that you're not completely sure that the two of you are right for each other, she paused. You'll have to tell her it's the latter, so you don't hurt her feelings. Scarlet ran her hand through her hair. That'll make me seem flaky. Saying yes to a guy I'm not sure about. She won't leave me the house if I'm having doubts already. What had she gotten herself into? She never should have announced an engagement without thinking about all the implications. My eyelid is definitely twitching, Hazel said. I can feel it. Scarlet bit her thumbnail. There was one obvious solution no one had mentioned yet. Although Liam probably wouldn't go for it. We could do a fake wedding for Grandma. She didn't look to Liam to see his response to this suggestion. Most likely, it wasn't good. She'd have to work on convincing him later. That might take some serious begging. Hazel's eyes narrowed in skepticism. An actual ceremony with your family and friends? You want to drag mom and her boyfriend here from another country, pay for flowers, a cake, a photographer, and bridesmaids' dresses? You want everyone to give you presents, make toasts, and think you're married? At that point, what's the difference between a fake and a real wedding? Offhand, Liam said, I can think of a few significant differences. Right, Scarlet said. Liam's family and friends won't know about it. At our ceremony, we can replace his family with actors. That way, he won't have to worry about faking a divorce later. Just, I will. We'll keep the wedding really small, only a few people, sort of like an elopement, with Grandma and some actors there. You and Christina and Jane live here, and Vi wouldn't mind coming out for another visit. 
Mom ought to visit more, so my wedding would force her to spend more time with Grandma. Hazel blinked at Scarlet. Grandma will expect you to go on a honeymoon. Did you consider that? Scarlet shrugged. We won't have to go on a real honeymoon. We'll say we're heading to Cancun. Then Liam and I can go back to our regular lives and no one will bother us for a week. She turned to him, hands clasped together, pleading. I know this is asking a lot. Way more than you bargained for, but please, fake marry me. Liam didn't say anything for a moment. A small event. With your family? Right. He slipped his hands in his pockets, still thinking. If I'm going to fake marry you, I think we'll have to go to Cancun for real. Why? Scarlet asked. We've got to have photos of us on a beach. Who goes on a honeymoon and doesn't take pictures? Your grandma would know something was wrong. Scarlet fluttered away his concerns with a wave of her hand. I've got tons of pictures of me in bikinis on beaches. I'll send you a bunch and you can Photoshop yourself into whichever ones you want. He looked upward. You'll send me bikini pics? He muttered something that sounded like, Par for the course. She wasn't sure what he meant by that. Maybe he didn't like the fact that she kept giving him more work to do. Which, okay, was fair. I can Photoshop them if you'd rather. I'll just need some pictures of you in a swimsuit. She held up one hand, already anticipating his protest. I know you probably don't have any recent swimsuit pictures, but no worries. We'll work around that. We can take pictures while you're here this week. You can strip down to boxers in my bathroom, I'll throw some water on you to make you look like you've been swimming, and we Photoshop the rest. She brightened, liking the idea more. We can even do some selfies because I have a bathing suit in my old room here. He didn't respond. In fact, he only stared at her. Why are you grimacing? She asked. I know how to Photoshop. I'm not. He shut his eyes and took a deep breath. Let's not worry about honeymoon pictures right now. Hazel stood from the chair. She'd been rubbing her temples. Now her gaze bounced back and forth between Scarlet and Liam. You can't seriously be considering a fake marriage. It's still going to take planning and money. Scarlet cut her off. We'll tell Grandma we want to do this quickly so she's still in good health. Of course, that means foregoing the elaborate church wedding with all the trappings and instead doing a small, intimate service. She'll understand and no one will mind if I wear a simple dress and carry a bouquet from the grocery store. Let's say Valentine's Day, in her house. Scarlet reached out and took Liam's hand. You can come up for a day to marry me, right? That's all I'm asking. A day? His hand didn't squeeze hers back. He looked hesitant. Maybe your grandmother would understand us taking things slowly, and we could have the date be much later. Or maybe she'll be so impressed that we're doing this quickly for her, she'll leave me the house. After all, Jane and Camden had set their wedding date for the end of April. Since Grandma's doctors had given her between two and six months, she might not see that wedding. Aunt Christina had said that Jane's wedding would give Grandma something to live for, but if Scarlett and Liam's fake wedding was only a month and a half from now, Grandma would realize that they were the more considerate couple. Besides, Scarlett added, she's already warned me that long engagements lead to temptations of the flesh. Grandma was old school that way, and probably also putting in a plug for a wedding she could attend. Scarlet ran her thumb over the back of Liam's hand and lowered her voice to a purr. You are pretty tempting. He didn't laugh at her joke. Not a good sign. Scarlet tried again. Please, her voice wavered with emotion. My grandmother has such a short time left and I can't do anything to change that. All I can do is try and make her happy. I'll owe you such a big favor. 
you might need a fake girlfriend sometime. Or some free modeling? Or a kidney? Scarlet didn't usually employ her looks to try and get her way with men, but this time she used everything she knew to try and sway him. Wide, imploring eyes, pouty lips, she leaned towards him. Please, I'm only asking for one more day of your life. He gazed back at her and his expression softened with compassion. I suppose a small, fake wedding wouldn't be too much of a hassle. Fine. Thank you! Scarlet threw her arms around him, pulling him into a hug. Funny how easy hugging him had become. Liam was warm, smelled good, and his chest had just the right amount of hardness to it. His bio hadn't been lying when it said he worked out. After a moment, she pulled away from him and pressed her hands together. Grandma will be so happy, and that will show her who loves her more. Scarlet turned to Hazel. You'll be able to book one of your actors to play the priest, right? If that's what you want. Hazel still sounded wary. But this was the best option. Scarlet looked around the room with new interest. Do you think Matt can string lights throughout Grandma's house for the ceremony? Also, I'm going to need to buy a wedding dress. She moved to the door. I better go check online and see what's available. And start an inspiration board. I mean, even though this is sudden, I still want my first wedding to be nice. She laughed and opened the door. I sound more like Mom every day. As she left the room, she heard Hazel speaking to Liam. I did warn you that she was impulsive. And I was prepared to turn down midnight hikes and skating on thin ice. Really? Hazel had told him about those two suggestions she'd made as a teenager? Sometimes your family refused to let you live down events. And proposing fake marriage to a guy she'd just met would no doubt go on that list. As Scarlet reached her bedroom, she got a text from her sister Vi. Sorry I missed the Christmas Eve party. I'm doing everything I can to make it to Grandma's tomorrow. How did it go? Well, there were quite a few ways to answer that question. Scarlet. The party was fun. I just proposed to my fake boyfriend. We're getting fake married in seven weeks. How's your vacation going? A moment later, a new text lit up Scarlet's screen. Vi. The problem with you is it's hard to tell when you're joking. It's an odd feeling to read your text and know there's a 50-50 chance this is your way of telling me I need to buy a bridesmaid dress. Scarlet. Yes to the wedding, no to the bridesmaid dress. I'll explain later. Vi. See? This is why I refuse to have a fake boyfriend. Once again, Vi proved that she was the level-headed sister. While Scarlet was considering what to say next, Vi messaged her. Vi. Okay. A very long text from Hazel just came through. Probably a panicked explanation about your upcoming nuptials. I'll read it and talk to her about whether we need to plan an intervention for you. Scarlet. No one ever gave Scarlet O'Hara this much grief when she was trying to save her family plantation. Honestly, that's all Scarlet was trying to do. She changed into her pajamas, in this case an old t-shirt and some boy shorts, because Grandma kept her house at approximately the same temperature as Africa. She sunk down on her bed and noticed a wrapped present sat by her pillows. The tag read, To Jeremy, from Scarlet. She vaguely remembered Hazel telling her that Talia had bought a Christmas gift for Scarlet to give Liam, and Hazel had bought one for Liam to give to her. That way, neither had to worry about finding a personal gift for a stranger. Scarlet would have to change the name on the tag to Liam. As she pulled it off, she couldn't help but wonder what was in the box. What did a man like Liam enjoy? Books. Liam was a reader and smart but the package wasn't heavy. Besides, Talia would have picked something more personal. 
The guy liked classical music, so maybe it was season tickets to the symphony. Something intellectual and high class. Scarlet imagined him at the symphony, dressed in a black suit, handsome, intelligent, the epitome of the strong, silent type. Sexy, in an understated way. He would fit there. Although she had an easier time picturing him walking on a beach in faded jeans, hair ruffled by the wind, throwing a ball to his golden retriever. He did casual well, and if her imagination transplanted him from the colder beach to a tropical one, where he was shirtless and tanned, well, it was her prerogative to ogle him a bit. She was his fiance, Sort of. She opened her laptop and searched for white gowns that could be shipped to her soon enough. A few clicks later, Scarlet found several. One had an Ampere waist with a Jane Austen vibe. She could do her hair up to look like Elizabeth Bennet. Scarlet had gotten good over the years at picturing herself in clothes. This time, her mind kept posting an image of Liam next to her. Which would he like best? She shouldn't care. It wasn't real. And afterwards, she probably wouldn't ever see him again. Unless they wanted to see each other again. Unless they worked. As a couple. The idea left her breathless. And a little afraid. In California, she'd gone out with models, actors, an assortment of tourists, a surf instructor, a basketball player, and once unwittingly, a married man. Even he'd been true to her type. They'd all been guys who had no commitment stamped on their persona. They'd been people to keep her company, to go dancing with, or to catch a movie or dinner. Mostly, that had been fine. Friendship with occasional kissing was all she wanted. But the few times that guys had hinted they were falling in love with her, she'd drop them. She couldn't be responsible for someone else's happiness that way. Things could go badly when a relationship didn't work out. She knew just how badly. Thank you, Camden and Stepdads 1 through 4. Liam wasn't like the guys she usually dated. He wasn't the hang-out-for-fun sort of guy. He was a White House, picket fence, children, and minivan waiting to happen. The American dream. Surely, when Liam chose a wife, he'd want someone who was intellectual and poised. Someone who could arrange Christmas parties for his office staff, balance the checkbook, and never forget their children at soccer practice. Not that Scarlett had ever done that, obviously, but the probability was high. She didn't even buy houseplants because she figured anything that couldn't remind her to feed it was doomed. And yet, the idea of tempting Liam into a real relationship was tempting. He was so nice and laid back. The sort of man who wouldn't yell at her if she lost her car in the mall parking lot, and the two of them had to wander around while she pushed her key fob like she was playing a one-sided game of Marco Polo. That had actually proved the downfall of one of the guys she dated. And, okay, it had been hot outside, but that hadn't been reason enough for him to mind being a hitchhiker to passing cars. Liam wouldn't do that, because he was the sort of guy who'd remember where she parked. Better yet, he'd offer to drive his car on all their dates. Responsible. Successful. Competent. Being the woman Liam took to the symphony would be so nice. They could have conversations about things that mattered. She was certain, just from the time they'd already spent together, that he knew what mattered. That he had his life figured out. She sighed and felt cross. Because Liam would never see Scarlet as more than a pretty face. A pretty face and a favor he was doing his sister's friend's family. A gentle knock sounded at the door. Hazel, probably. Most likely, she'd thought of some other complaint about the things Scarlet had done tonight. Scarlet trudged to the door, 
one hand on her hip, and flung open the door. Liam stood there. He still wore his jeans and new black shirt, still looked sophisticated and chic. His eyes ran over her, taking in her t-shirt and bare legs. He quickly looked away. Sorry, I didn't realize you weren't dressed. I'm wearing shorts under this. She lifted her t-shirt to show him. See? He did, then stared firmly at the crown molding. Yeah, okay, I... She waited. He didn't finish the sentence. She leaned against the doorframe and smiled. Did you come here because you wanted to talk to me about something? She prompted. Yeah, I've just momentarily forgotten what. He peered down the hallway as though that might jog his mind. The presence. His gaze returned to hers. I wanted to talk to you about my present. It's not going to be right. Don't worry about that. Hazel knows my size and style. I'm sure the gift will be something great. She gestured to the wrapped present on her bed. We'll see if your sister knows you as well. He glanced down the hallway again. Perhaps he was worried about being too loud. She stepped aside to allow him entrance. Do you want to come inside? That brought his gaze back to her fast enough, but he didn't come inside. It's safe, she said. I won't ask you to go on a midnight hike or ice skate on a questionable pond. His chin tilted down. Yeah, you're just asking me into your bedroom at night while you're not dressed. He sounded like she'd suggested something indecent. You're the one who knocked on my door. I was just being hospitable. His eyes were all frustration. You should be careful. Some guys would take advantage of your hospitality. I know. But you're not one of them. No, he agreed. I'm not one of them. She leaned toward him. We can stand here whispering, or you can come inside. All right. He stepped in, glancing around the room. He was probably used to more sophisticated decor. Her room was painted blush pink and had white beadboard circling the room. A white duvet lay on a four-poster bed, and a window seat held quirky gold and pink pillows. Scarlet spread her hands like a realtor showing a home. When I was little, my mom always decorated my room in, wait for it, Scarlet. Do you know any six-year-old girl on earth who wants a red room? I wanted pink. Mom didn't care. She said red was bold, like me. But when we came to stay at Grandma's that summer, she asked me how I wanted to decorate my room. So it was bright pink back then, lighter as I grew up. I always kept it some shade of pink because that was a reminder Grandma actually cared what I wanted. And I didn't have to be bold if I didn't want to be. She plopped down on the bed with a sigh. I wonder what color Jane will paint it. Her gaze finally returned to Liam. He made his way to the window seat and piled up furry, sequined, and velvet pillows to make room to sit down. The pillows are from my teen years. I wouldn't blame Jane for checking those. Oh, and in case you're wondering, that rather large angel painting looming over my headboard was a gift from Hazel. She said I needed an extra guardian angel looking over me. Scarlet shook her head. Older sisters. And yet, you trust her judgment to buy you a Christmas gift from your boyfriend? You've got a point. I bet it's a box full of remotes to replace all the ones I lose. Liam laughed. He had a perfect smile. Perhaps that sort of thing was mandatory for a dental specialist. He leaned back against the window seat, framed by pink pillows. My mother redecorated my room the day I left for college. I'm surprised your grandma kept your stuff. It does show a high level of sentimentality. Or laziness. Scarlet dangled her legs off the side of the bed. Her toes didn't touch the floor. I bet your home is completely clean and organized. 
Mostly. And that's because I have a cleaning lady come once a week. He paused as though he needed to explain. I'm not a slob. I've just been so busy it's easier to pay other people to cook and clean for me. Your life sounds enviously wonderful. He restacked a pillow that had fallen into his lap. I've just been thinking how sparse it is. I have no touching or meaningful stories for anything in the place. Well, you can put one of our Cabo honeymoon selfies in the living room and tell everyone it's your first wife. Cancun, he said. Same thing. Actually, completely different parts of the country. He lifted a hand. I'm not trying to be nitpicky. I'm only saying if we lie about our honeymoon, we've got to be going to the same place. He pushed away another encroaching pillow. Also, remember how you said you got away with lying to stepdad number four? I think he knew you weren't telling the truth and just didn't want to enforce his own rules. She looked upward, contemplating. That would explain why he never questioned that ding I put on his truck fender. But no. She waved a hand to erase the subject. Don't make me revise my self-concept and take good liar out of my wheelhouse. I was sort of hoping to become a spy once the modeling dries up. Liam laughed again. He laughed so effortlessly now. Perhaps she shouldn't have been surprised he hadn't been this way earlier. At her aunt's house, they'd both been too busy playing parts to relax. Sorry to break this to you, he said. You'll have to resort to a life of honesty. Right after our wedding. Which reminds me, what are the chances you'd be willing to dress like Fitzwilliam Darcy when you stand up with me? You mean breeches, boots, and a top hat? I'd say about zero percent. Dang. Perhaps breeches were too much to ask of a 21st century man. Still, a man who knows his Regency wear is sexy. It means a woman can possibly persuade him to fulfill her Jane Austen fantasies. Is that a thing? His smile slid into a smirk. If so, Pride and Prejudice just moved to the top of my to-read pile. Mmm, talk Darcy to me. I want to kiss you already. You already have. Liam's gaze moved away from her, and he ran a hand through his hair. I remember both, distinctly. Both. She hadn't expected the short peck under the mistletoe to be all that memorable, and was somehow pleased he was counting it. Well, it's not every day you fall into a room during a kiss. I imagine that's seared into your memory. Yes. Yes, it is. His eyes went to the angel painting behind her and stayed there for a while. Which meant he felt uncomfortable about the kisses, and she really shouldn't have kissed him either time. He'd come here to do her a favor, and she'd blown through his personal boundaries and made him feel awkward. Scarlet grabbed one of the pillows and laid it across her lap, hugging it, really. Self-recrimination was such an uncomfortable emotion. Scarlet would have to be better, have to think before she acted. Perhaps writing the phrase, I will not force near strangers into marrying me, multiple times on a whiteboard would help. Liam's attention returned to her. You get me off topic so easily. I still haven't told you why I came here. True. Better get to that or we'll be here all night. His gaze returned to the angel picture. He stared at it so insistently that she checked over her shoulder to see if there was some smudge or mark she hadn't noticed before. Nope, it looked normal enough. He finally brought his gaze back to her. The reason I came here is to talk to you about an engagement ring. He'd been worried about that enough to come here? I can buy a piece of costume jewelry somewhere. Well, you could if it wasn't Christmas Eve. All the stores are closed. She shrugged. Then I'll find something after Christmas. He shook his head. What sort of guy proposes to his girlfriend on Christmas Eve and doesn't have a ring in a box for her to open on Christmas? Scarlet's stomach dropped a little. Good point. She bit her lip. Were any stores open? 
I bet Jane will be flashing a diamond around tomorrow, probably several obnoxious carrots. And I'll look like a lame fiancé, or someone who just impulsively asked you to marry me and wasn't all that serious. Scarlet went from biting her lip to biting one of her acrylic fingernails. Are you about to tell me you know where to buy or borrow a fake engagement ring? Because I'm really hoping that's where this conversation is headed. I looked at the jewelers in Flagstaff and found Woolsteins. Fortunately, not a lot of Woolsteins live in Flag, so tracking down the owner's number was easy. He says he'll open his store tomorrow at 8 for us. Since we won't open presents with your family until later in the morning, we can buy it in time for a big reveal. She put her hand to her chest. A real ring? Also, poor Mr. Woolstein. We're taking him away from his family on Christmas morning? He's Jewish, Liam said, as though it should be obvious. I purposely went for a Jewish name. He only closes on Christmas because no customers come in. He was happy enough to open for us since I guaranteed him a sale. Scarlet's hand didn't move from her chest. That seems vaguely like racial profiling, but I'm glad it worked. I guess if Mr. Woolstein has a payment plan, one that spreads out over a lot of years, I could afford something simple. She shut her eyes as though taking an oath. And every time I make a payment, it will be a good reminder not to make strangers marry me. I'll pay for the ring. Liam said. No, her hands fluttered a protest. I'm the one who invented this engagement, so I've got to take responsibility for it. Unfortunately, that means my family will think you're cheap because the diamond is definitely going to be the runt of the litter, but we'll just have to endure their less than enthusiastic responses. Liam cocked his head in question. So I drive an expensive car wear expensive clothes, and skimped when it comes to love? That will impress your grandma. Her husband built her the house of her dreams for Christmas. He made a valid point. Fine, I'll buy something decent, but it's still my responsibility. Hear me out. Liam leaned forward, putting his elbows on his knees. You don't have to go into debt for this. Eventually, I'll have to buy an engagement ring for the woman I marry. I can afford to pay for it now. You'll just help me pick it out and wear it until we're done with this charade. Rings can be sized and diamonds can be put into new settings, so it's not really a risk. Unless his future fiancé wanted to pick out her own stone. Scarlet decided not to point this out. She didn't like the image that had come to her mind. Liam and some other woman in love and leaning over a jewelry counter, choosing out the ring that would symbolize their life together. Okay, Scarlet said. If you really don't mind. I don't. She tapped a finger against her lip in mock consideration. But if I don't have a monthly reminder to not force strangers into marrying me, who knows how many times I'll repeat the same mistake? He smiled and stood. I'm sure you'll manage somehow. Can you be ready by 7.30? Sure. She slipped off the bed to see him to the door. Is the store half an hour away? Flagstaff wasn't big enough to make that likely. He rearranged the pillows, putting them back as they were before. No, Hazel told me you were late for everything, so I should pad any schedule by 15 minutes. I'm not late for everything. Scarlet opened the door and lowered her voice. And just to show you and Hazel, I'll be ready at 7.30 and make you do snow angels with me for 15 minutes to kill the extra time. See you tomorrow morning. Liam didn't add what time he thought he'd see her, so she wasn't sure if he believed her or not. Chapter 8 Scarlet woke up at 6.45 something she hadn't done on Christmas morning for quite some time. She didn't need that much time to get ready, but had added in extra makeup primp time. She wanted to make sure she looked good for Liam. Better than his future wife. When he looked at his future engagement ring, 
She wanted him to think of her and the morning they'd picked it out. She texted him from the front porch at exactly 7.25. Merry Christmas. I'm ready. Come out and face the snow angels. Little flakes descended from the sky and joined the blanket of white on the yard. Even the road was newly dusted and looked clean and bright. Liam strode outside wearing a black jacket and jeans, a scarf wrapped around his neck. His chin had a bit of scruff from not shaving. Not a bad look at all. The crisp daylight showed off his features. His eyes, she noticed, weren't exactly brown. They had flecks of gold like little sunbursts. Such an interesting color. Merry Christmas to you, too. He pulled on a pair of black gloves and surveyed the glittering white lawn. You don't really want to lie in the snow, do you? She headed down the steps. That's the only way to make snow angels. You obviously had a deprived childhood. Once she reached the edge of the yard, he took hold of her hand, perhaps to keep her from plunging forward into the drift. If we lie down, we'll get snow on us, which will melt in my car. Do you want to show up to the jeweler's wet? Both of them wore waterproof jackets and boots, so they wouldn't get that much snow on them. Besides, now that Scarlet had suggested snow angels, she actually wanted to make one. It was one of the few childhood Christmas traditions that Hazel hadn't already put on her list, scheduling them like they were chores to check off. We'll wipe the snow from our pants before we get into your car. You've been living in California too long. Snow doesn't wipe off. Okay, she said. Five minutes to make snow angels, ten minutes to change clothes. He didn't move. What? she asked. Do you doubt I can change in ten minutes? I'm a model. I could undress us both in five. He looked like he was about to say something, then pressed his lips together instead. She tugged his hand, pulling him out to the snow. When he planted his feet, she laughed, grabbed his other hand and tugged that one too. I was ready on time. This is probably one of those impulsive things Hazel warned me I shouldn't let you do. Pneumonia counts as impending death, right? No one has ever died of snow angeling. I'm carrying you to the car. She let go of his hands to put hers on her hips. Come on, you can be spontaneous. Although the last 24 hours would say otherwise, I don't really do impetuous things. Unless you count carrying you to the car as impetuous. He grabbed hold of her waist. She tried to dodge out of his grip and somehow not only managed to fall down, she pulled him with her. More accurately, on top of her. Scarlet shrieked as the snow hit a bit of unprotected skin at her neck, then laughed and wrapped her arms around Liam. Once she caught her breath, she was going to toss him off of her and into the snow. Hazel's upstairs window flew open, and she stuck her head out. What's going on? With her arms still wrapped around Liam, Scarlet tilted her head to see her sister. Nothing! We're just making snow angels! Hazel's eyebrows quirked up. That's not actually how you do it. She shot Scarlet a think-about-what-you're-doing look and shut her window. The curtain swished back into place, hiding her from view. Liam extracted himself from Scarlet, stood and held out a hand to help her up. She was relieved to see that he was smiling instead of horrified that he'd once again been caught falling on the ground with her. We made a snow monster, he said. It's close enough to an angel. Art isn't an exact science, she agreed, brushing off her jacket. He only had to wipe off his sleeves. Landing on her had saved him from the snow, except for where he'd put his arms down to break his fall. Her entire back was caked with snow. She stomped her feet, then wiped her legs in the seat of her pants. Did I get it all? Not even close. She wiped some more. Where am I missing? Do you really want me to? Ugh, oh, never mind. 
He leaned over and brushed his hand across her upper thighs and backside. There, he examined her. Your jeans will still be wet enough that the jeweler will wonder what you sat in, and every guy we pass will stare at your rear end. But you're a model, so I'm sure you're used to that sort of attention. Fine, I'll change into some different jeans. She hurried toward the house, calling over her shoulder. Just watch, I'll be out of my clothes in three minutes. I don't think that's something I should really watch, he called back. So literal. It actually took her five minutes to kick off her boots in the entryway, run upstairs, grab some new jeans, and strip off the old pair. She was zipping up the new pair in the entryway, one boot on, the other tucked under her arm, when Matt walked in the house. His gaze went over her. Don't ask, she said. I never do, he replied, and strolled past her toward her grandmother's room. Chapter 9 Liam glanced at his phone to see the time and noticed a text from his sister. How'd your first day as a fake boyfriend go? Really well, he wrote back. We're picking out an engagement ring now. A moment later, she replied with, No need to be sarcastic. He didn't have time to go into lengthy explanations, so he'd wait to tell her about last night's events. Liam, I hope that when I have grandkids, they do as much to make me happy as Scarlet is doing for her grandma, Talia. So, do you like her? Was I right about her being your type? Yes and yes. Perhaps too much. Liam, you were right. Glowed as much as you'd like. Talia, good. I'm gloating. Merry Christmas. Liam turned his phone on silent. With his luck, Talia would check Scarlet's grandmother's social media and call him repeatedly while he and Scarlet were picking out rings. A moment later, Scarlet flew out of the door, breathless and beautiful. I'm ready. He paused before heading to his BMW, just taking her in. She was the very essence of sunshine on a winter's day. Scarlet and Liam reached the jewelers five minutes before eight. Mr. Wolstein wasn't there yet. Liam didn't mind the extra time alone with Scarlet. They stood in the chill morning air, their breaths leaving tiny clouds around them. Scarlet tucked her hands under her arms. What did you tell Mr. Wolstein about us? Love at first sight. Whirlwind romance. Ready to take the leap. And we want to rush things because of your terminally ill grandmother. She stared into the window at a case of rings and bracelets surrounded by fake snow. It's a good thing Mr. Wolstein doesn't actually know me, or he'd know I'd never be that rash. Liam cocked his head. That was meant to be ironic, right? She playfully smacked his arm. I'm never impulsive when it comes to love. That's something we have in common, although some people might call it commitment issues. His head jolted in surprise. What makes you think I have commitment issues? You're a nice, intelligent guy who is also handsome and wealthy. I'm fairly certain there's a steady stream of women throwing themselves at you. The fact that you don't have an actual girlfriend says something. Yeah. It says I'm busy. Having a girlfriend while he had so little free time had seemed like a bad idea. He was bound to shortchange her. Scarlet sent him a knowing look. It's okay to blame your parents. I do it all the time. He wasn't sure if she was joking. The words were said lightly enough, but that didn't mean they weren't true. Camden didn't ruin you for men. Your mother did? Scarlet remained silent for a moment. I don't know how to explain my childhood. It wasn't bad. It was just... Her gaze went to the window display and stayed firmly there as though seeing the past somewhere among the glittering rings and bracelets. Despite my complaints about stepdad number four's curfew, I knew he was really trying to be a good father. 
He'd help with my homework and went to my school events. He was in it for the long haul. But by that point, I'd learned not to get too attached. One day, I skipped school. And when I went into our house, I heard this sound from upstairs in the master bedroom. No one should have been home, so I tiptoed up there to see what the noise was. Stepdad number four was packing up a box. Sobbing. That's how I knew their marriage was over. Every time that happened, I was mad at my mother for uprooting us and making us start over somewhere else. But until then, I never realized how much she also hurt the men in her life. I promised myself that I would never do that to anyone. Why would you think you would? Scarlet tucked her hands underneath her arms. Because the biggest difference between me and my mother is that I made that promise. And she never did. Liam's heart broke for her. For the girl who'd had to learn not to get attached to her stepfathers. That was no way to live. Her future shouldn't be held captive by her past. So you're never going to get married. Her green eyes flitted to his. Eyes as green as jade. I want to get married someday. I'll just have to be very positive that I found the right guy first. He shouldn't have felt relieved by her pronouncement. He wasn't really in the running for her affections. And yet, he somehow found himself queuing up for that line anyway. How are you going to find him if you won't give anyone a chance? She shrugged. I don't know. I guess I'll need some sort of solid sign that I could marry him and be happy. She forced a laugh, a sound that still sounded light. Look at us, getting all serious and deep before buying an engagement ring. What are you waiting for? You make a good point. His busy schedule wasn't as much of an issue as he'd made it out to be. The right woman would understand, would be patient. What am I waiting for? A click came from the front of the building, and the jeweler opened the door with a flourish. Are you waiting for me? Yes, Liam said. We are. Mr. Woolstein let them in, all smiles. He was a middle-aged man with glasses, receding brown hair and a beard that almost sharpened into a point. Even though this was technically his day off, he wore a suit that stretched over his pot belly. He led them cheerfully to the display of engagement rings. Liam and Scarlet stood side by side, leaning over the jewelry case. It was a surreal feeling, like the two were borrowing someone else's cherished moment. She looked at several rings, tentatively tried on a couple, then slipped on one with a diamond center stone flanked by two smaller diamonds. The three diamonds, Mr. Woolstein said, Stand for your past, your present, and your future. Scarlet held out her hand, examining the ring. Apparently, our future gets smaller. Liam rested his hand on her back. That's why it's important to live in the present, babe. Those are colorless, the jewelers said before retreating a few steps to let them admire the ring together. Scarlet held back a snicker and whispered, Colorless doesn't seem like a good omen for our life together. Liam took her hand, moving the ring so it threw off bits of light. Colorless is good in diamonds, just not in the rest of life. He liked how her hand felt in his. Such soft, smooth skin. She smelled of something floral, probably some bright and bold flower. Sunflowers, maybe. What did they smell like? The ring is beautiful. She checked the price tag, saw it was $18,000, and drew in a sharp breath. She showed him the price. It's too much. He only shrugged. If that's the one you want, we'll get it. She started to protest, then stopped. More lip biting. 
It's your choice, she murmured. You'll be the one giving it to the woman of your dreams someday. Liam waved to get the owner's attention. We'll take this one. Scarlet admired the ring on her finger for a few more moments, watching the light dance off its facets. It's beautiful. I hope my next husband is as generous as you are. Only then did she notice that the jeweler was now close enough to hear her. Mr. Woolstein's smile froze into a sort of horrified pose. Yeah, there was really no way to reply to her statement, so Liam didn't try. Blushing, Scarlet took off the ring and handed it to the jeweler. Thanks. Mr. Woolstein's gaze went to Liam. You're sure? He probably meant sure about his choice of fiancés. I'm sure, Liam said. Chapter 10 After Grandma woke up, the group had a breakfast of waffles and eggs, another of the Christmas traditions, then sat down to open presents. Scarlet loved Christmas and was determined to treasure this one. She did that by taking way too many pictures. Most of the presents were the normal sort. Hazel got Scarlet a purse she'd had her eye on for a while. Scarlet got her sister a pair of boots. Grandma had insisted that her family coming was the only gift she wanted. But Hazel and Scarlet still bought her slippers, pajamas, and a computer photo frame. Matt got Hazel a Christmas village which was especially meaningful because that's what their grandfather had given their grandma when they were dating. Hazel leaned over and gave him such a long kiss that a flush of red went up his neck. Everyone oohed and awed over Scarlet's ring, and as she put it on, it was a perfect fit. They didn't even need to have the jeweler size it. She forgot for several minutes that it wasn't really hers and that Liam's arm around her only meant that he was very good at playing a part. Scarlet's gift to Liam, or rather the one that Talia had bought for Scarlet to give him, was flip-down magnified lenses with a light, along with some extraction forceps. Basically, pliers. Scarlet didn't even try to explain the pliers. How could she? Grandma took one look at them and shook her head. I'll say it again. I'm glad I'm done with colonoscopies. Yeah. The best present, however, was Vi calling to tell everyone she'd be to Flagstaff by dinner. And more interesting still, she said that Trevor, former office No, he's not a crush, was coming with her as her boyfriend. Must have been some snowstorm. Aunt Christina, Bill, Jane, and Camden came over for lunch, and the traditional viewing of It's a Wonderful Life. Jane flaunted her engagement ring, a sapphire surrounded by diamonds modeled after the one Princess Kate wore. Whatever. Scarlet liked hers better, and was glad Liam had thought to buy it. Seeing Jane and Camden act all lovey together didn't bother Scarlet as much as she thought it would. Perhaps because she kept holding Liam's hand and resting her head on his shoulder. Every time she did, she got a little wicked thrill. He was handsome, dependable, smart, and successful. And he was, at least for the week, hers. Camden glanced her way several times. Perhaps that was normal but it felt like he was watching her quite a bit. She wanted to believe that the frequency of his gazes meant he was filled with wistful envy, or at least grudging approval that her life was going well. While Aunt Christina and Bill took a turn sitting with Grandma, the rest of the group went outside to build snowmen. One more tradition to fulfill. Hazel insisted they build the snowmen in the backyard near the house. This way, she said staking out a spot in front of Grandma's window. She can look outside and see them. You mean sort of like fat, frozen, peeping toms? Scarlet asked. Carolers, Hazel said. 
I have props for three. She gave Scarlet the side eye. And don't get any ideas about making them two-headed mermaids or something. Mermaid carolers would be a lot more interesting. Still, Scarlet didn't fight her sister on the issue. She set about making a normal snow woman caroler, who was also pregnant with twins and possibly in labor. After 45 minutes, Jane reported that she'd gotten snow down her boots and her feet were freezing. Amateur. So she and Camden went inside. Once they left, everyone was more relaxed. They no longer had to worry about slipping up and saying something that would give away Liam and Scarlett's real status. It surprised Scarlett how well Liam fit in with Matt and Hazel, talking and joking around with them. And sometimes when he looked at Scarlett, okay, nearly every time, she felt a glow of happiness, like his attention was a prize. Hazel asked where they had gotten the engagement ring, and Scarlett related the story, including the unfortunate comment about her future husband. Hazel snorted and shook her head. Don't take that ring off your finger until you give it back to Liam. You know how you lose things. I won't, Scarlet said. I'll be officially off the market. Somehow, the thought of not dating anyone when she returned to California didn't bother her. At least not until she considered that Liam might want to date other people during their fake engagement period. He had every right to. If you date anyone, she told him, you'll have to be discreet. I won't. He gave her a wink. You're enough for me. Hmm, that glow of happiness. She was enough. He probably meant she was enough of a hassle. But she ignored that possibility and took his words as a compliment. After the snowmen were done, Scarlet went to tell Grandma to look out her window and to relieve Aunt Christina. It was Scarlet's turn to sit with Grandma. Scarlet still wasn't exactly sure what she would say to convince her grandmother not to give the house to Jane. Everything she thought of sounded either petty and petulant or materialistic. The conversation never happened. Grandma was asleep and slept all through Scarlet's shift. Jane and Camden took the next shift, and Scarlet joined the rest of the family making gingerbread cookies, Grandma's favorite. Scarlet managed to get flour smeared all over her shirt, a small price to pay for gingerbread. She'd made her own pattern, a T-Rex that was bigger than the other cookies and could therefore terrorize them on the dessert platter. Scarlet had expected Camden to stay with Jane during her shift, but she ran into him in the upstairs hallway after she changed her shirt. He was coming out of the library with a book in his hand, perhaps something Jane had asked him to fetch. Hey, he said. I've been meaning to talk to you. About what? It was the polite answer, and besides, she couldn't help but be curious. She wanted, perhaps unreasonably, for him to apologize for the way he dumped her in high school. Some regret on his part would be nice. All I want for Christmas is closure. I wanted to tell you that I'm glad you're doing so well. You look great. His gaze ran over her approvingly, something that made her feel self-conscious. Your grandmother showed me some of your modeling pictures. Ugh, you were forced to see a family slideshow. Sorry about that. Grandma was quick to whip out her phone's photo albums and liked to brag about her granddaughters. His eyes grew teasing. No need to apologize. Looking at pictures of you in a bathing suit wasn't a hardship at all. That was a bit familiar, coming from a guy engaged to her cousin. But maybe he felt their old relationship gave him the right to be familiar. He rocked back on his heels. If you'd sent me those sorts of pictures in high school, I never would have broken up with you. First off, um, boundaries? Second, was he saying the breakup was her fault? She should have sent him bikini pics? She couldn't even call him out for inappropriateness of the suggestion. 
because the pictures were ones in catalogs for the public to peruse. Technically, she shouldn't have a problem with him seeing them. And yet his words skated on suggestiveness. He'd also edged closer to her while waiting for her response. Scarlett had told Hazel that breaking up Jane and Camden would be one way to get the house. But now? Nope. The idea of flirting with him wasn't at all tempting. Even if Scarlett didn't really have a fiancé, Camden did. Her cousin. Besides, spending time with Liam had reminded her that some guys were truly nice. Some guys went to a lot of trouble to help a person even when they didn't have to. Some guys were downstairs in the dining room right now, icing gingerbread men with O's of terror for mouths to match her T-Rex. And that would teach Hazel to start dinner prep with Matt before the cookies were completely finished. Scarlet had waited too long to pretend that she hadn't been considering his words. She shrugged and attempted a casual smile. High school is long gone. I guess we just weren't meant to be. She went past him to go downstairs. If you say so, he called after her. What was that supposed to mean? Didn't matter. Camden's words weren't worth the space in her brain she was giving them. Scarlet went to the kitchen and was drafted into helping make Christmas dinner. Everyone was whipping up Grandma's favorites, with the exception of Bill, Aunt Christina's boyfriend. He sat in the family room, watching TV. Bill's no good at cooking, Aunt Christina explained. I never let him step foot in my kitchen. Scarlet wasn't any good at cooking either, which was why Hazel always gave her jobs like snapping the ends off green beans and shredding cheese. Bill probably could have managed to set the table without fear of ruining the meal. Scarlet didn't point this out. His absence made her appreciate Matt and Liam even more. Matt was nearly as good a cook as Hazel, and judging by Liam's salad-making skills, he wasn't the type who lived off fast food and frozen meals. Good-looking, and he could cook. The man just kept getting better. Two of Grandma's neighbors didn't have family in the area, and so joined them for dinner. Mrs. Takahashi was a short, thin woman who'd spent years gardening with Grandma. Mrs. Beetle's watch was a widow who raised guinea pigs, filled her yard with stone bird feeders, and frequently drank too much. She wore a Santa hat and a red sweater with electric lights that flashed the words, Ho, ho, ho. Fortunately, the neighbors sat by Grandma, Aunt Christina, and Bill, so Scarlet didn't have to entertain them. She could concentrate on speaking with Liam. Really, she'd expected this week to be tedious, but the first two days had flown by. Halfway through dinner, Vi and Trevor showed up. Vi had been sparse on the details of how he'd become her boyfriend, although looking at him, Scarlet could use her imagination. He was blonde and handsome with broad shoulders and a quick smile. Vi's dark hair was cut in a sleek bob, and even on vacation, she wore what could have passed for office wear. She'd always been pretty in a professional, I'll use my pointy stilettos to crush you sort of way. But sweeping into the room with Trevor, she looked so beautiful that Scarlet wondered what she'd done differently to herself. The next moment, Scarlet realized that the only change was that Vi was breathlessly happy, and it made her shine. So sweet and unexpected. Such good timing, too. Because Vi couldn't have faked the exhilaration she was naturally expressing now with some stranger on her arm. Most of the rest of dinner was taken up by Grandma asking questions about Trevor, and Vi and Trevor answering them while making eyes at each other. Well, both of Scarlet's sisters were suddenly in love. A part of her ached for the same thing, for a real relationship with a man who made her breathlessly happy. But then, Vi and Hazel's future had never been in question. They were the sensible, practical ones. 
the ones who'd always known what they wanted to do with their lives. They didn't have to worry about making the wrong decision and messing up not only their lives, but also the lives of whomever they'd dragged into their wake. While people helped themselves to seconds, Grandma announced that she wasn't up for dessert or singing carols around the piano. She needed to lie down for a bit. She would listen to the music from her room. Scarlet's shift with Grandma was next, but Vi volunteered to help her to her room. She was still happily going on about Trevor and his family, and the sleigh she and Trevor had refinished. Grandma ate up that sort of stuff. Scarlet finished dinner, helped clear the table, and motioned for Liam to come with her. She led him down the hallway to Grandma's room, suddenly nervous and unsure. It's my turn to sit with Grandma. You want my help? I can lift her or whatever she needs. Actually, I want your opinion. Scarlet stopped a couple of feet away from Grandma's bedroom door. She glanced at the door and whispered, How do you think I should bring up the whole house situation with Grandma? He shrugged. You know her best. What do you think you should say? None of what I've been thinking sounds right. I don't want to come off as some greedy heir who wants more than her share. She leaned toward him. You're smart. I bet you took a psychology class at some point, didn't you? How would you approach this? You're smart too. You don't need a psychology class to talk to her. Scarlet slumped against the wall and fought the urge to bite her nails. I didn't even finish college. Instead of accepting this answer, his eyes met hers, as though trying to figure her out. Why didn't you? Hazel told me you had a half-tuition scholarship at NAU. You had to be smart to get that. Well, you'd think so, but apparently there was a large difference between getting good grades and being smart enough to figure out life. I didn't know what I wanted to major in. Taking classes seemed like a waste of time and money until I decided, so I... She put her hand to her throat and took a sharp inward breath. Oh my gosh! I just realized I did the same thing my mother did. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, so I depended on my looks to pay my bills. Your mother was a model too? No. After she divorced my father, she married a succession of wealthy men. Scarlet felt like she'd just swallowed something horrible. She's still beautiful. That's actually substantially different than what you're doing. Her mother wasn't an out-and-out -out gold digger. Scarlet wouldn't have feared turning into her mother if that was the case. Mom never meant to ruin any of their lives. She always thought she loved them. She just fell out of love as easily as she fell into it. And therein lay the danger. One couldn't always trust one's judgment. You're not that way. Liam gave her a wry look. You don't let yourself fall in love at all. Although, that isn't really a better response, is it? See, she said, I knew you'd taken a psychology class. How come you're using your insights on me instead of to help me? He took her hand reassuringly. I am helping you. I'm reassuring you that you're not your mother. Scarlet forced a smile, trying to show that, of course, he was right. Part of her agreed with him, but another part knew better. Her whole life, people had told her how much she was like her mother. Pretty, bubbly, and able to sweet-talk guys into anything. Although she couldn't quite sweet-talk Liam into anything, he'd refused to make snow angels with her, which, in retrospect, had been the sensible choice. Liam put his other hand on top of hers, cocooning her hand in his. He kept his voice low. If you want my advice, I'll tell you what I've learned. Not from any college class, 
but from trying to help my parents work through their issues. Don't attack Jane's right to inherit the house. That will make your grandmother defend her. Just tell her how much the house means to you and your sisters. Scarlet nodded. That was a better plan. She shouldn't say anything to make her grandma worry that she and Jane weren't getting along. Even if Scarlet sometimes itched to expose Jane for not being as sweet as she pretended. Scarlet was standing so close to Liam, it only took a small motion to lean forward and kiss him on the cheek. Thanks for everything you've done for me. He didn't let go of her hand. His gaze on hers was intense, questioning. He leaned forward and kissed her, not on the cheek. His lips came down on hers, gently, light as satin. And yet the kiss had more weight to it, more heat than either of the kisses before. Those had been part of a charade. This one wasn't. Her heart beat faster. She ought to pull away, and yet didn't want to. Liam put his hands on her waist and pulled her closer. She melted into him. He was warm and safe and made her spine tingle. It was nice to know that the attraction she'd felt to him wasn't one-sided. Apparently, he didn't see her only as a pity project, someone who was beneath him. He wanted to kiss her, and was doing a very good job of it. She may have moaned a little. If having butterflies in your stomach was a real thing, hers were doing aerials. His mouth left a trail of kisses across her cheek to her ear. Then reality hit her. Liam wasn't the sort of guy who kissed women casually. This meant something to him. And that was a dangerous thing. She pulled away from him enough to look into his eyes. Wait, what does this kiss mean? He fought a smile. It means I think we have a body language problem that we need to work on in order to be convincing. He wasn't going to give her a real answer. She studied his face and tried to read his mind. He nodded, eyes bright. If she'd been a romantic, she would have said they were twinkling. He leaned forward again. I think our body language problem needs considerably more work. His lips brushed across her neck, teasing and soft. She didn't stop him, which said something about either his talent at kissing or her self-control. Maybe both. Finally, when she could breathe, she managed. We shouldn't do this. You know I don't let myself fall in love. You just said as much. His mouth trailed back toward her lips. Maybe I think you'll make an exception in my case. At that moment, she definitely was. She couldn't remember the last time she'd let a guy kiss her this way. Perhaps more telling, she couldn't remember ever wanting to kiss a guy as much as she wanted to kiss Liam. Leading him on was wrong, and yet she kept kissing him. The butterflies in her stomach had apparently hijacked her willpower. Stop. Stupid, reckless butterflies. Grandma's door swung open. Scarlet nearly jumped away from Liam. Vi strode out, shut the door, and noticed the two of them. Well, she said cheerily to Scarlet, you definitely look guilty of something. Scarlet smoothed down her hair. I'm guilty of many things. You'll have to be more specific. Neither of us has time for that. Vi took a couple steps down the hallway, pausing in front of Liam. She whispered, I don't know whether to thank you for being Scarlet's boyfriend or apologize for all you've gotten roped into. So thanks. Sorry. It's no problem. Liam didn't sound ruffled for nearly being caught kissing in the hallway. If anything, he seemed amused. 
Vi smiled at him. You're every bit as nice as Hazel said you were. Her eyes flickered over to Scarlet, then back to Liam. I hope everything from here on out goes smoothly for you guys. I'm sure it will, he said. Such an optimist. Vi drifted down the hallway with a bounce in her step. Time to talk to Grandma. Scarlet took a deep breath, lifted her chin, and strode into the room. Liam trailed after her. Growing up, Grandma had called this room the parlor. Grandpa had referred to it as the study. The old-fashioned Queen Anne couch was still there, now at the side of Grandma's hospital bed so visitors could sit near her. A wooden desk had been pushed against the wall, the computer crowded by medical supplies and a nativity set. In the corner, figurines of all sorts oversaw the proceedings from a china cabinet. Hazel had plastered a wall with every Christmas card Grandma had been sent that year. A considerable haul. Grandma was lying on top of her bed with her new throw covering her legs. She looked so small there, as though her disease was not only spreading through her body, it was shrinking it too. She shifted on her pillows. I thought I heard your voices in the hallway. Yep, Liam and I were, um, talking. Heat rose in Scarlet's cheeks. A ridiculous response. Even if Grandma had X-ray vision and knew they'd been kissing, she thought they were engaged. Liam took Scarlet's hand. Scarlet was telling me how much she loved your house, how much it means to her and her sisters. Nice assist. He was getting right to the point. Grandma smiled her approval. Did she tell you? Her grandpa designed it for me after my favorite house from our Christmas village. Of course, Scarlet said. And now no other house can measure up to yours as a symbol of love. Liam sat on the couch. She joined him. But that's not the only reason I love your house. It was my only real, stable home. Coming here in the summers like we did, and all the times after one of Mom's marriages ended. Grandma nodded with a sigh. And that was a considerable number of times. I spent my whole junior year here. Grandma made a padding motion in Scarlet's direction, like she wished she could reach her hand. We were so happy to have you, dear. I know Hazel feels the same way. It would mean the world to us if you left the house to one of us. Time to fake ignorance about Jane and press on. You probably plan to leave it to my mom and Aunt Christina and expect them to sell it and split the proceeds. I wish I had the money to buy them out, because I would. I'd hate to see the house belong to anyone who doesn't love it as much as Hazel and I do. Scarlet waited, breath held for her grandma's response. Grandma's eyes grew wet. I'm touched to hear how much you love the house. I always assumed once I passed on, Hazel would go off to Broadway or somewhere bigger to run shows. She's wasting her talents around here. And dare I say, she'd be gone already if she wasn't stuck here taking care of my old bag of bones. No, she loves it here, Scarlet emphasized. Now that she's dating Matt, she has every reason to settle down here. And just in case Grandma would rather leave the house to Scarlet, she added, I know Liam and I would love to settle down here, too. She'd worried that Liam would flinch at the lie, or at the very least look uncomfortably guilty. But he nodded, enthusiastically. Scarlet wants to finish her college degree. I was telling her earlier I think it's a great idea. Grandma perked up. She should. I've been saying that for years. Scarlet had forgotten she'd considered telling her grandmother this particular story and wished Liam had given her some warning before throwing that detail out. Have you decided on a major? Grandma asked hopefully. Not yet. Scarlet ran her hand along the front of her jeans. That's the problem. Still. 
Liam put his arms around Scarlett's shoulder and rubbed her arm. One of the reasons you take classes is to figure out what your passions are. Take a psychology class or interior design or Roman history. Who knows? You might love history enough to want to be a professor. You're smart enough to do anything you put your mind to. It was clear he really thought she ought to go back to school. Be a professor, Grandma agreed. Then you'd both be doctors. I'll look into reapplying, Scarlet said nonchalantly. But of course, not until after the wedding. I mean, I'll still be living in California until then. Online classes, he said. You can knock out a class or two this semester. I'll help you apply tonight. You don't have to do that, Scarlet said. I'm happy to, Liam said. Wow, he was actually using her grandmother to pressure her into going back to college. She wasn't sure whether to laugh at his duplicity or kick him when Grandma wasn't looking. I'll be busy planning the wedding for the next month, Scarlet pointed out. And then we'll be on our honeymoon, he shrugged. A small wedding at your grandmother's house shouldn't take long to plan. We can knock out most of those details this week. And Cancun has internet. I'll make sure you spend some time studying. You can use my computer to apply, Grandma motioned to the computer on her desk. Why don't you do it right now? Scarlet put her hand on Liam's knee to keep him from standing. I wouldn't know what classes to take. Liam put his hand over hers, wrapping his fingers with hers. His voice grew intent. Don't be so worried about picking the wrong direction in life that you refuse to go in any direction at all. And now he was psychoanalyzing her. What was worse? He was right. She hadn't picked a major because she had feared she'd make a huge mistake. And so her life was on hold, directionless. How had he figured out so much about her in less than two days? She'd been living with herself for 23 years and hadn't been able to label her problem with such succinctness. She laughed nervously and felt oddly vulnerable and exposed. What else did Liam know about her inner workings? I'll have to look at their online catalog. Sometime. Liam smiled triumphantly and stood. No time like the present. He pulled her up with him. Yep. He was playing the grandma card to force Scarlet to do something she'd avoided for years. Well played, Liam. The doorbell rang. Probably some neighbor dropping off cookies for grandma. Hazel or one of the others would get it. Scarlet followed Liam reluctantly to the computer on Grandma's desk. Grandma only had one chair there. He offered it to her and leaned over to type in the website. You said you owed me a huge favor, he whispered. I'm calling it in. I want you to go back to college. This was not what she'd expected. How is that a favor to you? I don't need any favors so I'm having you do yourself a favor. You like fitness. Let's just look at the general requirements for, say, health science. She squinted at the course description list he brought up on the screen. Quantitative reasoning? I guess all the fun-sounding class titles were already taken. You can choose something else. The important thing is that you start somewhere. You try. You let yourself make mistakes. He clicked on the admissions page. You'll thank me, one day. One day, maybe, but not today. Seriously, quantitative reasoning? Instead of saying this, she sighed. Because perhaps he was right. Perhaps it was time to go back. Maybe taking an online class or two wouldn't be so bad. She could find something that interested her. And if she ended up not liking the subject matter enough to pursue that field, well, learning things was never wasted, was it? Hazel popped into the room. A forced smile was plastered on her face, and her eyes were wide with restrained panic. Hey, Liam, she said. You'll never guess who just dropped in. Your parents. 
Chapter 11 Liam stared at Hazel because her words didn't make sense. His parents couldn't be here. Granted, he'd given them the address, but they wouldn't have driven two and a half hours to drop by and see him for Christmas. Not without warning. And certainly not together. They weren't spending Christmas together. My parents, he repeated. Hazel's head bobbed. They said they were your parents, and I'm assuming they're not lying about that. Rodney and Pamela Brooks? Liam pulled a phone from his pocket. Five missed calls from Talia. He'd never turn the ringer back on after the jewelers. Scarlet's grandma shifted on her pillows, attempting to sit up. That's so nice of your parents to stop by. She let out a panting breath. I'll go out and meet them in a few minutes. Just give me a little time to gather my strength. You don't need to do that, Liam said, still trying to make sense of it. Is something wrong? He asked Hazel. He didn't really expect her to answer that question, but suddenly had fears of news so tragic his parents felt compelled to deliver it in person. He stood and headed toward the door. They look fine, Hazel said. He strode out of the room, his mind on car accidents and his siblings. Scarlet hurried along with him to the family room where everyone sat eating cinnamon rolls and gingerbread cookies. He spotted his parents sitting next to Bill and Christina. Neither had red eyes or pained expressions, so no horrifying news to deliver. Why were they here? His mom looked like she was on her way to some high society event. Her chin-length blonde hair had been poofed and swept back. Her red lipstick was the same shade as her blazer. A golden ruby brooch perched on her lapel, and she wore her favorite set of diamond earrings. His father looked less formal. He wore khaki pants and a plaid shirt underneath a black jacket. Maybe Scarlet was right about plaid shirts. They did make everyone look like an electrical engineer. When Liam came into the room, both of his parents smiled politely and stood to greet him. Mom, Dad, Liam said. This is a surprise. What brings you here? His father rocked back on his heels. It just seems like a day for surprises, doesn't it? His words were ever so slightly tinged with an accusation. What was his dad talking about? And why couldn't his parents let him enjoy one peaceful week without filling his life with tension? His mother still wore her polite smile. Her gaze darted to Scarlet and back to Liam. After we saw your big news online, your father and I figured the best thing we could do was drive up and meet your fiancé. Liam had to choke back a cough. From beside him, Scarlet let out a nervous laugh. Perhaps only he noticed the note of hysteria in that sound. You saw our news online? Liam asked. His mother accepted a cup of spiced cider from Vi, holding it like it was a piece of china and not a plastic cup with reindeer stamped across it. Turns out I have a friend in common with Scarlet's grandmother. She saw the post announcing your engagement and messaged me her congratulations. His mother lifted a hand, flashing red manicured nails. Don't feel bad, she said in a tone that made it clear he should feel bad. We know you were probably planning some big reveal for our family, but unfortunately social media inadvertently ruined it. Your father and I figured we'd save you from the hassle and tell you that we knew your news. She lowered her voice to a confidential murmur. Your father didn't want to fake being surprised, and I couldn't wait to meet Scarlet. Great. This was a disaster. Liam had to tell them the truth, only he couldn't tell them the truth, not when the truth was that he lied so he didn't have to spend the holidays with them and he especially couldn't tell them the truth here, in front of Scarlet's family. The people in the room had started their own conversations again, 
but Liam felt their attention on him. Aren't you going to introduce us? His father smiled at Scarlet, and Liam saw approval in his eyes, or at least an understanding of why Liam had fallen for her. Scarlet's beauty was an easy explanation of why a man would give up bachelorhood. Nothing else to do but play the part. Liam put his hand on Scarlet's back. Scarlet, these are my parents, Pamela and Rodney Brooks. Glad to meet you, Scarlet said. Vi stepped over again, gave his parents plates with pumpkin pie and cinnamon rolls, then headed back to the kitchen. Instead of biting into his roll, his father used his plastic fork and knife to cut off a piece. So, he said with forced jovialness, were you afraid if you introduced your girlfriend to your family, we might scare her off? No, of course not. No other explanation came to him. It's my fault, Scarlet said. I live in California and I've been busy with work. She paused. Liam wanted to introduce me earlier, but, well, I was nervous about meeting you. She ducked her head, the image of embarrassed contrition. Liam always told me how smart, successful, and accomplished you both are. Scarlet's eyes flitted to his mother. What with your charity work and all the boards you're on? Her eyes traveled to his father. And how you're running such an important real estate development company. It's hard to measure up to all that. Well, Liam took back all the things he'd said about Scarlet being a bad liar. His parents practically melted. On a dime, they switched from disapproval to reassurance. Oh, his mother said with a laugh, we're not so intimidating. Once you get to know us, Liam's been talking us up, has he? His father sounded not only surprised, but pleased. He winked at Scarlet. No doubt just exaggerating to impress you. Liam's mother mocked offense. Speak for yourself. I'm pretty sure everything he said about me was perfectly true. Scarlet put her hand to her chest. I can tell now that you're both really nice. I shouldn't have been so worried. Liam had been so intently watching Scarlet work this strange magic on his parents that he hadn't said anything. He straightened and cleared his throat. We had planned to do a big reveal of our engagement. Yep, I guess the internet ruined one more thing. Scarlet slipped her arm around his waist. She smelled of vanilla, cinnamon, and possibilities. I'm sure the store will take back the streamers and glitter bombs. Under her breath, she added, The trained doves might be harder. Liam's mom motioned to the empty chairs lined up against the wall. Let's sit down, so we can talk. He and Scarlet obediently sat. I've already met your sister, Scarlet. His mother's gaze circled the room and landed a few seats over on Mrs. Beetle's watch and the electric lights that flashed on her sweater. She was speaking to Mrs. Takahashi while the latter licked cinnamon roll frosting from her fingers. Which lady is your grandmother? Neither. Scarlet said. She's lying down right now. The cancer makes her tire easily. I'm sorry to hear that, his father said. It's very unfortunate. Yes, it was. And now there was bound to be an uncomfortable silence. Liam took Scarlet's hand in a gesture of comfort. I know I'll have lots of bad days ahead, Scarlet agreed. But Grandma keeps reminding us that whenever we miss her, we should remember how awesome she was and then go build her a shrine. Both of his parents blinked at Scarlet, unsure if she was joking, or at least unsure if they should laugh. Her words, not mine, Scarlet said. Grandma has never been one for false humility. His father chuckled. She sounds like a firecracker, Scarlet nodded. We told her we'll put you were lucky to have known me on her tombstone. She hasn't vetoed the idea. His mother giggled, then stopped herself. She must be a charming woman. 
She is. Liam squeezed Scarlet's hand. You take after her, you know, not your mother. Scarlet's eyes flashed at him, grateful, hopeful. He could tell she didn't quite believe him, but she wanted to. His parents went on to ask Scarlet other questions about her life, what she did for a living and how they met. They asked about her parents, and she related that the two were divorced. Both lived far away, and she rarely saw either. Liam prayed they wouldn't ask her about things she should know but didn't, like anything about his townhouse, his profession, or what Liam had said to her about his parents' accomplishments that had left such an impression. While the conversation continued, Liam pondered how much of the truth to tell his parents. He couldn't admit that his relationship with Scarlet was pretend, but he should let them know that the engagement was fake, that it was just something Scarlet invented to make her dying grandma happy. His parents would think the charade was extreme and ill-advised, but they would understand. His mother stopped mid-sentence. She'd noticed Scarlet's ring. She gasped and grabbed Scarlet's hand to examine it. Look at this! It's so beautiful! Those diamonds are colorless, aren't they? Okay, so the engagement ring would be harder to explain. When Scarlet had proposed the idea of having a marriage ceremony, it had seemed so, well, not quite reasonable, but at least justified. Scarlet's grandmother had been so happy at the news of their engagement and had wanted so badly to attend the wedding before she died. Now, as Liam considered how to tell his parents the facts, their plan seemed like a clearly overblown response. Who went to such extremes to make a grandmother happy? Especially in his case when the woman wasn't even his grandmother. Liam had some hard, cold truth to face. He wasn't as nice of a guy as Scarlet and her sisters believed. He'd, in large part, gone along with Scarlet's plans because he was smitten with her. A fake wedding gave him a reason to spend more time with her. Man, Hazel had warned him not to fall for Scarlet, and he'd only lasted a few hours before succumbing. Vi came by with glasses of cider for Scarlet and Liam before disappearing again. His mother relinquished her inspection of the ring. Have you set a date yet? Scarlet's gaze went to Liam silently asking what to tell his mother, perhaps looking for an out. He didn't have one, and the implications just got worse. Now that Scarlet's family had met his parents, Liam wouldn't be able to rely on actors to play them at the wedding. His parents would actually have to come and play along, too. This was quickly spinning out of control. He rubbed the back of his neck. Scarlet fiddled with her cup of cider. We've just decided to have a small gathering. Just family. Nothing lavish. Hmm, his mother said, not particularly happy with that answer. I have close friends who'd be hurt if they weren't invited. If it's a matter of expense, we can help out. Oh, it's, um... Again, Scarlet's gaze went to Liam's. She took a drink so she didn't have to answer right away. We won't have time for a big wedding, Liam admitted. Because we set the date for Valentine's Day. Liam's mother set her cup down. Valentine's Day. As in this February? Liam nodded. Some of the color drained from his mother's face. Eyes wide, she leaned forward and whispered. Is Scarlet pregnant? Scarlet nearly spit out a mouthful of cider. She ended up coughing so hard she couldn't speak. No, Liam said, that's not the issue. She wants her grandmother to be there. We're planning on having the wedding in this house. Oh, relief swept over his mother's face and she straightened. Well... We'll have to see what we can do about the guest list. 
Perhaps we can find a larger venue on short notice. Liam's father grumbled something under his breath. It's their wedding. Let them have it where they want. Cue the fighting. Voices low and sharp. I never said they couldn't, his mother retorted. But it's normal for parents to help their children with these things. You only get married once. That would generally be the idea, wouldn't it? Scarlet's eyes went to his, her discomfort evident. He gave her a welcome-to-my-world look. Scarlet cleared her throat. Pineapple upside-down cake, she interjected, changing the subject. Hazel makes the best pineapple upside-down cake, and I don't think it's made its way out of the kitchen yet. Let me get everyone some. She shot up from her chair and dashed across the room. Liam's mother watched Scarlet go and shook her head at his father. You made her uncomfortable by picking a fight with me. Me? he demanded. I'm not the one who's trying to change their wedding. I'm not trying to change it. I'm trying to help them. You accused her of being pregnant. The poor girl nearly choked to death. Liam raised his hands to stop them. Perhaps saying what he did next was underhanded, and he hadn't planned to say the words until they came out his mouth. Did you ever stop to wonder if this is why I didn't bring a girlfriend home? Silence. His mother gasped, wounded. He'd just been such a jerk. His parents had driven two and a half hours to be with him, and he'd insulted them. I'm sorry, he scrubbed his hand across his face. I don't know why I said that. I didn't mean it. Really, I'm sorry. His mother still looked wounded, so he leaned over and hugged her. At first, she was stiff, offended, but after a moment, she softened into him. She could never stay mad at him for long. I appreciate you, he said. And I'm happy you want to help with my wedding. He really did, which was going to make it so much harder for him to admit the engagement was all a show. Don't worry about it now. We'll talk about it later. She rested her chin on his shoulder. I'm sorry, too. Sometimes I forget how hard our separation is on you. That was an understatement. She pulled away, giving him a resolute smile. No more fighting today. It's Christmas. She turned to his father. Right, Rodney? Agreed, his father said. Well, that would be a Christmas miracle. But his parents seemed to mean it. For the next few minutes, the two chatted perfectly amiably with him. It felt like old times, like before fed up with each other had become a constant thing. Scarlet came back carrying a tray full of plates of the upside-down cake. After she'd handed out plates to the three of them, she held one out to Bill. Bill's hands didn't move from their resting place on his stomach. I'll have to pass on the pineapple. I have a canker sore. Scarlet moved around the room to offer cake to others. Liam's mother turned toward Bill, choosing this moment to socialize with the rest of the guests. Canker sores are awful. I used to get them all the time when I was a girl. She picked up her fork and dabbed it at her cake. You should have Liam check it for you. You know, give you an examination. And just like that, the conversation took a horrible, horrible turn. His parents were not going to understand why everyone in the room thought he was a proctologist. Bill shifted in his seat uncomfortably and chuckled. I don't know how one of Liam's examinations would help a canker sore. His mother took a bite of her cake. All sorts of things can cause problems with your oral health. You'd be surprised. Mrs. Beetle's watch, who sat close enough to hear, said, I know I'm surprised. Liam needed to find a way to redirect this conversation, but his mind was blank. His mother turned to him. You wouldn't mind giving Bill an examination, would you? He's practically family. You could do it right now. This caused Bill to shift in his chair even more fervently. 
he waved a hand of refusal. Nope, no need for that. I can't, Liam agreed, perhaps too quickly. I don't have the right tools. Hopefully, that would put an end to the conversation. Tools, his mother said like it was a silly objection. Mostly, you just need a flashlight and one of those sticks. You know, the flat ones. Why can't I think of their name right now? Anyway, I'm sure you could find something around here. He also uses a pick, Liam's father said. That's important, too. Only for cleanings, Liam's mother said. Although I'm sure Liam could do that, too, if you need it. Bill coughed in protest. You really don't have to go to the trouble. I'm fine. Nonsense, Liam's mother insisted. It's no trouble. Liam won't charge you if that's what you're worried about. He not only examines his family twice a year for free, but all the ladies in my book club, too. This was a train wreck. Liam could see it happening and couldn't think of a way to stop it. No words came to his mouth, and the entire room was listening now. Everyone else was silent. Where had Scarlet gone? Christina's eyes went round. Twice a year? His mother nodded. I tell you, they love him so much they can't wait to sit in his office and open wide. This sentence caused most people in the room to flinch and several to cross their legs. I swear, his mother went on, they invent problems just to go see him. That's... Christina didn't finish her sentence. She pursed her lips together like she'd eaten something distasteful. Mom, Liam abandoned any attempt at casualness. We shouldn't talk about business right now. Scarlet swept into the room again, minus the tray. Not when we need to be talking about the wedding. He'd found the perfect way to turn his mother's attention to other matters. And just like that, the conversation veered and the crisis was averted. Relief washed over him. Scarlet sat beside his mother, the picture of eagerness. Even for a small wedding, there's so much to do. I don't know where to start. From several chairs away, Jane called. You can always ask your mom. She's got lots of experience. Scarlet ignored Jane and kept speaking with Liam's mom. But Liam couldn't help the grin that found its way to his lips. Jane watched him, puzzled by his reaction, until Hazel pushed her grandmother's wheelchair around Jane's chair. Scarlet's grandma had come out to join the family and had heard Jane's last cutting remark. She sent Jane a brief reprimanding look before turning to smile at Liam's parents. Hazel continued pushing her over to meet them. Liam made introductions. Scarlet's grandmother reached out to shake his parents' hands. We are so excited to have Jeremy join our family. Liam, Scarlet corrected. That's right, Grandma winked at his mother. But I bet you still call him Jeremy, don't you? His mother's smile froze. She seemed not to know how to answer. Liam forced a laugh. Usually she just calls me the favorite child, right, Mom? Scarlet murmured something to her grandmother, and while the older woman's gaze was averted, Liam mouthed the words, her medication makes her loopy, to his parents. They nodded back with sympathetic understanding, and the group made polite chit-chat for several minutes. Scarlet's grandma was especially interested in his mother's work promoting the arts, which led them to discussing the challenges of being an artist in a non-metropolitan area. The conversation was going so well that Liam began to relax. Of course, it didn't last. Hazel's talent is wasted around here. Scarlet's grandmother said. I have such wonderful granddaughters. She patted Scarlet's hand affectionately. Not every girl would forego a big wedding so she could have it soon enough for her grandma to attend. Liam's mother nodded politely. It's a thoughtful thing to do. In a lower voice, she added, and I'm sure I'll be able to clear my calendar of whatever plans I already have on that day. 
Scarlet's grandmother went on with her hand patting, her eyes growing wet. It's such a comfort to know that Scarlet will have someone who loves and supports her, that she won't be alone in this world. It's been five years since my Frank died, and I can tell you that alone is no way to go through life. God meant us to have a partner and a friend on our journey. Life is so hard when you don't have that. She dropped Scarlet's hand and turned to Liam's parents. Look at me, preaching to the choir. I'm sure you two know all that. Scarlet is the one I was worried about convincing. She said something to Scarlet, but Liam didn't hear what. His mother had gone pale during the last part of the talk on the importance of love. Now her lips crinkled and tears spilled onto her cheeks. She dabbed her eyes, attempting and failing to regain her composure. A sob ended her attempts. She stood from her chair and nearly bolted across the room. Scarlet's grandmother watched her abrupt departure with alarm. What's wrong? Liam left the others to answer that question. He headed after his mother, cursing himself for not warning Scarlet's grandmother that his parents were separated. It hadn't seemed a necessary detail. He hadn't thought she would ever meet them. His mother retreated out the front door. Liam caught up with her at the bottom of the patio steps and gently took hold of her arm to stop her. Mom, I'm sorry. She didn't know you and Dad are separated. With her head down, his mother wiped away more tears. Obviously. People talk to you differently when they know you're getting a divorce. But that doesn't stop what she said from being true. I am going to be alone. And... Another sob cut short her sentence. Liam put his arms around her, hugging her to him. You're not going to be alone. You have your children, your friends, all of your charity work, and the telemarketers who'll never quit calling you. He was trying to joke her out of her mood. No such luck. It's not the same, she muttered into his shoulder. I'm not going to have anyone to go home to at night. He didn't know how to answer that, or what to say to comfort her. Everything he thought of seemed trite. His own empty townhouse loomed large in his mind, with only a dog to greet him every night. That wasn't how he wanted to live the rest of his life. And yet his mother clearly needed to be reassured. He needed to say something to ease her worries. He felt a hand on his shoulder. A glance behind him revealed his father had come outside. His expression was pinched with, what? Exasperation? Concern? Liam couldn't quite read him, and hoped his father wasn't about to lay into his mother for causing a scene. Liam released his mother, already sending his father a warning look. His father pushed past him, took his mother into his arms, and hugged her. It's okay, he muttered. She lay her head against his shoulder. It's not okay. I made a fool of myself in there. Mrs. Thompson understands, his father said soothingly. And besides, with the way she's medicated, she probably won't remember any of this tomorrow. His mother sniffed. Scarlet. Scarlet understands, Liam assured her. Other people probably saw my dramatic exit, his mother said. Who cares, his father said. Let them think you're the temperamental mother of the groom. Maybe that way they'll be afraid to cross you when you insist on a wedding venue with valet parking. She laughed a little but didn't raise her head. The two just stood there in their silent embrace. It had been so long since Liam had seen them hug that he couldn't tear his eyes away. I'm going to die alone, his mother muttered. His father didn't answer right away. 
Finally, he said, That's still your choice. She lifted her head and sniffed again. Maybe we should give counseling another try. If not for us, then for the rest of the family. She waved a hand in Liam's direction. We can't have the other children afraid to introduce people to us. Liam probably should have reassured her at that point, told them the truth. Instead, he just kept staring. What was happening? His mother had just suggested counseling? She turned to Liam, wiping under her eyes to remove traces of mascara. On the drive up, your father and I talked about how astonished we were that you kept not only your girlfriend, but such an important decision from us. And then, her hands dropped to her sides, we argued and made a scene in front of her. So I guess I understand why you didn't involve us. I'm sorry. She took a deep, steadying breath. We both want to be part of your life. And if that means we have to act better, we'll do it. She shot a look to his father, the sort of silent communication that came from years of speaking for each other. He nodded. We will. We want to be there for you. You'll go to counseling, Liam pressed. His father had always been the one to insist that it did no good to spill your problems to strangers. Another nod. I guess it couldn't hurt. Maybe there are some things we need to work on. Liam gaped at the two, almost disbelieving. Everything he'd said to his parents before about how they treated each other hadn't made any sort of impact. And now, when his engagement wasn't real, his parents were finally realizing they needed to improve? Well, Liam would take that win anyway. That's great. That's a great decision. Thank you. His father surveyed his mother. Do you want to go back inside? No. She rubbed underneath her eyes again. I think we made quite enough of an impression on our future daughter-in-law for the day. To Liam, she added. You'll bring her to see us in Scottsdale, won't you? Or I could fly out to California. Really, planning a wedding takes time. And since her mother lives out of the country, she'll need help. Okay. What else could Liam say? His parents had agreed to go to counseling. He stood there, the truth tucked carefully away, and watched as they climbed into his father's Cadillac. His dad started the car and drove down the street. Scarlet came out just as they left. She waved goodbye to them with one hand and took Liam's with the other. Is your mom okay? Yeah. He gave her a brief rundown of what had transpired, including that his parents had agreed to go to counseling. She didn't let go of his hand, even though his parents were out of sight. So you're saying lying paid off? This will probably not be a good pivotal point for my moral development. Liam shook his head. Until this week, I've always been unfailingly honest. And during the conversation about giving Bill a rectal examination, I remembered why. That was one of the most uncomfortable few moments of my life. A common phrase in your profession. We can't have a repeat of that at the wedding. I'm going to have to let my parents know you mistakenly told everyone I was a proctologist and think of some convoluted explanation as to why I didn't correct you. She tilted her head. You're not going to tell them the truth about our engagement? Not when they finally realized their arguing is detrimental to everyone in the family. Maybe they'll be able to work through their problems this time. He paused. You probably think it's foolish for me to hope my parents get back together, don't you? I think it's sweet. Even though the cold was cutting into him and must be chilling Scarlet just as much, neither of them moved to return inside. I've got to take you to my mom's sometime over the next month so she can help plan the wedding. 
Also, we're probably going to have to invite a bunch of her friends to the ceremony. Scarlet's brows knit together. Wait, if you don't ever tell them the truth, how are you going to explain to them that we aren't actually together after the wedding? I don't know. I have a couple months to come up with something. Maybe you'll run off with a hot pool boy on our honeymoon. Not that, she said. Don't make me look flaky. Okay. What are your suggestions for breaking up our marriage without making my parents think I'm a cad who dumped his new bride? Scarlet sighed and wrapped her hands around herself. My sisters already know the truth. Let's just pretend to be married until my grandma's funeral. And then, fine, I'll spare you the criticism and I'll run off with a pool boy. I guess I don't care what Jane, Camden, and Aunt Christina think of me. I'll just avoid family gatherings with them after my infamy comes to light. She shivered, so Liam put his arm around her. That's very considerate of you. You probably say that to everyone who runs off with a pool boy. Let's go inside so you don't freeze. As they made their way to the door, he glanced over his shoulder at the road where his parents had disappeared. Talia's five missed phone calls made sense. She'd been trying to warn him that his parents were coming, but his parents hadn't given him any notice. I still can't believe they drove up here. Wouldn't most people call first? I don't know. I wasn't raised by most people. Scarlet opened the door. You notice, my mom hasn't even texted about my engagement. And okay, maybe I didn't specifically tell her about it. But she ought to be following Grandma on social media. Besides, it's Christmas. You'd think she'd call. Something our parents have in common, he said. They don't call on Christmas. Chapter 12 Technically, Scarlet's mother didn't call on Christmas. She called at 1.30 in the morning on the 26th. Vi tramped into Scarlet's room, turned on the light, and shook her awake. Vi wore a black silk robe, and her dark hair was disheveled. Mom is doing a video call with Grandma and wants to talk to us. Right now? Scarlet rolled over to check the clock. Is something wrong? You mean besides the fact that she can't remember that Europe is eight hours ahead of Arizona? Seriously? Their mother was getting them all up because she couldn't keep track of the time difference? Scarlet pulled the blanket up. Tell her I'll return the call at one in the morning her time. Vi pulled the blanket back. Come on, you're probably the reason she's calling meaning she'd probably just read Grandma's post about Scarlet's engagement and couldn't wait to find out more details. Scarlet sat up and groaned. The house felt too cold to wander around without something covering her. Love can wait. That's a saying, right? She should be able to wait until a normal time, when I can lie properly. Are you going to tell her the truth? I obviously mean when Grandma isn't around. I don't know. Scarlet pulled herself out of bed and thought about it while she searched for her robe. She didn't want to lie to her mother. And she could use a confidant, someone who would sympathize with how her good intentions had gone awry. Could we trust Mom not to say or do something that would ruin everything and break Grandma's heart? Not if past performance is any indication. True. Mom had done more than her share of things that had kept Grandma up at night. Scarlet couldn't find her robe, so she grabbed a throw from her bed and draped it over her shoulders. Vi looped her arm through Scarlet's, and they walked to the door like heroines from a Jane Austen novel who were taking a turn about the room. Do you think... Vi said a little too cheerfully for this time in the morning, that Mom will try to read your aura to tell if it's real love? I hope not. What if there's actually something to that? Vi patted Scarlet's arm. I bet she wants something crazy at your wedding ceremony. Which do you think is more likely, 
modern interpretive dancers to act out your love story or a crystal garden to send you the right vibrations. Ugh. The hall floor was hard. It was wood instead of carpet. Scarlet wished she had slippers. Mom will definitely mention something that involves either candles, essential oils, or tree saplings. Vi snickered. If I'd known Mom was calling about this, I could have made up Mom Freeze's bingo cards. Ugh, Scarlet said again. I'm glad you're the first one to get married. They went downstairs to Grandma's room. Hazel's voice drifted out, reporting about the things they'd done on Christmas. She was sitting on the couch by Grandma's bed, a fluffy white robe wrapped around her. When Vi and Scarlet ambled in, their mother beamed up at them. Her brown hair was swept up in a bun, and her dark lipstick, smoky eyeshadow, and red silk blouse made it clear she'd been out somewhere formal. Now that we're all together, she chimed, I'll tell you about my Christmas. Benito and I had a marvelous time during Venice. Last night we went on a sunset gondola ride with men who sang Italian love songs while we ate. Well, I won't tell you about all of the deliciously sinful things we ate, but right before the ride ended, Benito pulled out a ring and asked if I would make him the happiest man alive. How could I resist when making Benito happy also makes me the happiest woman alive? Oh, Mom was getting married. Again. Did she even know about Scarlet's engagement? Was she about to propose a double wedding? Probably, or something like it. Maybe matching wedding dresses. And there was no way Scarlet would allow any of it. Her wedding might be fake, but she still wasn't going to share it with anyone else, let alone a woman working on lucky number six. Scarlet would have to think of a nice way to refuse. I totally would do a Renaissance fair wedding with you, Mom, but Liam's mother has already started planning mine. Which, after all, was true. Scarlet's mother kept talking, gushing about the proposal, and how Benito insisted they come back to Venice for their honeymoon since it was the city of beauty and love, just like her. Then she moved on to the topic of her wedding— she wasn't sure where or when it would be, but she already had several details worked out. She wanted pink, yellow, and salmon colors, and she wanted to walk down an aisle strewn with orange rose petals to remind them of the sunset in Venice. Scarlet pulled her blanket tighter around her. What sort of response did Mom expect of them? Were they supposed to get excited about the wedding minutiae? join in the fantasy that the relationship would work this time. We'll have a ceremony at dusk, Mom went on, and as a symbol of the light of our love, everyone in the wedding party will hold candles as we say our vows. Bingo, Vi whispered. Mom clapped her hands together in a plea. You'll come, won't you? Well, Hazel said, just as long as it doesn't conflict with Scarlet's wedding. Scarlet's? Mom blinked in astonishment. She hadn't known. She leaned closer to the computer screen. Wait, who is Scarlet marrying? My boyfriend, Liam, Scarlet said. Remember, Hazel told you we were bringing our boyfriends to Grandma's this Christmas? Really, she'd expected her mother to remember that much. I haven't met him, Mom said, as though that negated the possibility of Scarlet having a boyfriend. You haven't been in the States for a while, Scarlet pointed out. He's a very nice young man, Grandma spoke loudly, like she worried the connection was bad. He's going to be a doctor. Mom did her best to peer around the room. Where is he now? Asleep, Scarlet said, like most people in the middle of the night. Hazel spoke up, perhaps to keep Scarlet from saying more along those lines.
Liam proposed to Scarlet last night. We were all very surprised. She kept nodding. Very surprised. My proposal wasn't anything like yours, Scarlet said. He popped the question on Aunt Christina's doorstep, and then we both fell into the living room. He's a handsome fellow, Grandmother said, still loud. And he comes from a good family. His parents drove up today to meet us. Mom plucked at her top button, thinking, When are you getting married? Valentine's Day, Grandma said, at my house. Maybe you should just stay in Arizona when you come out. In less than two months, Mom's blinking went into overdrive. Scarlet, how long have you and Liam been dating? Scarlet hesitated. But really, if anyone should understand the power and pull of sudden love, her mother should. Five months, Scarlet said. Oh, honey, her mother's expression turned sorrowful. That's not long enough to know whether you're going to get along with a man. You need to wait a little longer. She held up her hand to stop protests. I know you've always been the type to leap before you even think of looking, but you need to put some thought into this. Seriously? Her mother was giving her marriage advice? Her mother was calling her rash? That somehow stung more than Scarlet expected. She shouldn't be angry. Her engagement wasn't real, but still an anger snapped inside her head that she couldn't explain. I don't see the point of waiting, Scarlet said. The lengths of your engagements never made any difference, did they? Scarlet, Hazel hissed, reprimanding her. Hazel was right. Scarlet had gone too far. Mom looked taken aback, hurt. Scarlet rubbed her forehead. Sorry, Mom. I shouldn't have said that. She should have gone with, a mystic told us we were soulmates. Maybe that would have held more weight. I'm happy for you. Just like always. That was probably also a rude response. I'm just tired. I'm going back to bed. She left the room and hurried down the hallway to the stairs so quickly the blanket trailed behind her like a cape. The next morning... The entire group, Sans, Grandma, and Aunt Christina, went skiing. That had been another Christmas tradition, skiing at Snow Bowl. Grandma said she wanted her granddaughters and their beaux to get out and have some fun. Maybe she just wanted the house to be quiet for the day and only have her nurse and Aunt Christina checking in on her. Whatever the case, Vi, Trevor, Jane, and Camden took one car up. Hazel, Matt, Scarlett, and Liam climbed into Matt's Silverado. It had better traction for the snowy mountain roads than Liam's BMW. Scarlet got into the back seat. She knew by the look in Hazel's eyes that she was in for a lecture about how she acted last night. And yep, sure enough, as soon as Matt pulled out of the driveway, Hazel twisted in her seat to better see Scarlet. We're supposed to be making Grandma happy, and that means no drama. You practically made Mom cry last night. And that upset Grandma. Sorry. She was sorry, mostly. Liam and Matt both looked confused by the exchange, so Scarlet gave them a rundown of last night's conversation. She included an impersonation of her mother, lifted chin and sweeping hand gestures included. My dress will be something gauzy in colors that embody the wisdom of a starry night. Scarlet also added a running commentary of her thoughts. So I kept wondering how I was going to tell her I didn't want my dress to embody any starry night wisdom. Just, you know, lots of white satin and maybe some pearl beading. Scarlet ended with recounting the things she'd said before fleeing the room, blanket cape trailing behind her. And that's why I'm the bad daughter. Matt snorted. You actually said you were happy for her again? He almost laughed, then caught sight of Hazel's glare. He cleared his throat. Um, 
you probably should have thought of a better response. Hazel made a tch noise and shook her head in Scarlet's direction. I shouldn't have let you tell this story. You turn everything into a comedy routine. The point is, Mom told you she was getting married, and instead of being happy, you criticized her. Yeah, Scarlet said, and she did the same thing to me. Scarlet sighed and turned to Liam. See, I don't take after Grandma. I take after my mom, even when I don't mean to. Granted, Hazel said, conceding the point. I can see how Mom's lack of enthusiasm would upset you if you actually planned to marry Liam. But you aren't. And besides, getting married to someone you haven't known long is risky. So for once, Mom was making a normal parenting comment. True. All of it was true, and yet Scarlet still felt cross and peevish about her mother's response. She folded her arms. She called me rash. So have I, Hazel said. And you call yourself spontaneous, which is pretty much the same thing, only dressed up in a better outfit. Why does it bother you now? Scarlet gazed out the window at the snow-lined street and whitened trees. I don't know. It just feels different when the pot not only calls you black, but the pot knows full well it kept uprooting you during your childhood. And now the pot is surprised you're not excited about another trip down the stepdaddy aisle. Scarlet fluttered her hand. I realize I butchered that metaphor, but still. Hazel blew out a breath. No one is suggesting that stepdad number five gives you away at your wedding. But you can't fault mom for wanting to be with a man she loves. Maybe her marriage will work this time. Scarlet rolled her eyes. I love how you can say that with a straight face. Hazel returned the eye roll and sat back in her seat, exasperated, which only made Scarlet feel worse about how she was acting. She slumped in her seat. Fine, I'll apologize to mom. I suppose this isn't a good time to admit that she texted me last night asking if I told my father about the engagement. I replied, which one? Hazel groaned. I said I would apologize, Scarlet repeated, and next time she talks about her wedding, I'll act happy for her. It would have to be an act, because Scarlet wasn't feeling particularly happy for her mother, which also made Scarlet feel worse about herself. When had she become so petty? Maybe Hazel was right, and her mother would grow old with Benito. Who was Scarlet to begrudge her mother a shot at happiness? Scarlet turned to Liam. You think I'm horrible now, don't you? She was worried she'd see censure in his eyes, or worse, disgust. But instead, his golden eyes were soft. No. I imagine it's pretty normal to be upset that your mother cared more about her wedding than yours. Even if yours isn't real. It was a reminder of all the times she put her needs in front of yours. And that was it. The exact reason Scarlet had been so upset. Right. She hadn't even realized the cause herself. And Liam understood. Hazel turned around in her seat again and this time instead of exasperation in her eyes, there was sympathy. I'm sorry. Letting go of the past is hard sometimes, but we've all got to do it. And it helps to have really low expectations where mom is concerned. I know. Scarlet and her sisters had said as much to each other often enough. Scarlet immediately felt better, Validated somehow, now that she understood why she'd been upset in the first place. She put her hand on Liam's arm. You should be a therapist. Your talents are wasted in proctology. Dentistry, he said. Still, you should be peering into people's minds instead of their mouths. He shook his head. I've already had too many people ignore my advice. I don't want to make a career out of it. When you put a crown into someone's mouth, it's a fix that lasts. 
Scarlet's hand slid into his. Holding his hand seemed so natural that it happened without her thinking about it. Do your patients ever come in and say, crown me? He chuckled. None have yet. Well, that's a wasted opportunity. His voice grew soft again, concerned. You don't have to worry about your mom not giving you your wedding the proper attention, because my mom will give it twice the attention it needs. You'll be so sick of her questions, advice, and enthusiasm. You'll appreciate your mom's inattention. Scarlet squeezed his hand. Your mom is sweet. I like her. Good. He didn't let go of her hand. She liked that, too. They spent the rest of the trip to the mountains talking about Liam's family. When Scarlet next spoke to them, and that was inevitable now, his parents would expect her to have a basic knowledge of their family. Hazel and Matt drifted off into conversation of their own. Only once did Hazel glance back at Scarlet. When she saw Scarlet was holding Liam's hand, Hazel sent her a questioning look, one that said they would be discussing that later. And they did. As the group was renting skis and the guys went off into the men's section, Hazel asked, Is something going on between you and Liam? Scarlet wasn't sure what was going on between them. Yes, they'd kissed yesterday in the hallway and it hadn't been for show. But they hadn't talked about that since. She should figure out what their relationship status was before she said anything to anyone else. So Scarlet just shrugged. You, out of everyone, should know the need for staying in character. Uh-huh. Arms folded, Hazel tapped her fingers against her arm and gave Scarlet a penetrating gaze. Don't hurt him. He's a really nice guy. I know. Scarlet didn't want to hurt him. She really didn't. Which meant she probably shouldn't kiss him again even if she wanted to. The day passed quickly. Swishing down a mountain always seemed to speed up time. The sky was bright and clear, and the snow glistened like sugar underfoot. The wind pushed against Scarlet's cheeks but didn't bite her skin. Skiing conditions would have been perfect if the place hadn't been so crowded. Every once in a while, Scarlet and Liam got separated and one of them would have to wait for the other at the ski lift. Scarlet had planted herself beside the line during one of those times when Camden swooshed up to her, his skis slicing to a stop. He wore a white and black Bogner ski jacket, the kind that cost over a thousand dollars. Did he even own anything that wasn't made by some expensive designer? Hey, he said. Nice form. Thanks. I owe this form to all the practice I've had standing in lines. He smiled, teeth as white as snow. I meant coming down. I was watching you. You look great. Oh. He had a way of saying things that could be perfectly innocent or could be construed as flirting. Was she imagining the emphasis he'd put on you look great or was he just being friendly? Thanks. He gazed around but didn't move on, probably waiting for Jane. He stuck his ski poles into the snow. This feels like old times, doesn't it? You and I at Snow Bowl. As I recall, we never came with our fiancés before. Yeah, but those were some good times. I forgot how much you made me laugh until this Christmas. She nodded. I'd forgotten about the laughter, too. Mostly I remember all the crying after you dumped me. She said it tongue-in-cheek, but his expression turned concerned and earnest. I know I hurt you, and I'm sorry about that. I was an idiot. That's what she wanted to hear, an apology. Somehow it didn't make her feel better. It just made her feel wary of him. He turned his skis her direction and slid closer his voice still sympathetic. I'd like to make it up to you. Thanks, but I don't think our old high school would understand if we showed up at senior prom. 
Liam and Jane might have objections too. I guess our breakup will just have to be water under the bridge. Or I could think of other ways to make it up to you. See, was that soft tone just apologetic or did he mean it to be inviting? No, his words couldn't be any sort of invitation out here in public while they were waiting for Liam and Jane to catch up. Most likely, Camden was trying to mend fences. They were going to be cousin-in-laws, after all. They'd see each other at family functions. What did you have in mind? She asked. A slow grin spread across his face. Why don't we both think about the possibilities and get together to discuss? The soft tone again. Maybe she only thought it was flirty because he'd spoken to her like that when they were dating. She might be projecting his feelings from back then onto the tone now. She pushed her ski poles further into the snow. It's dangerous to leave the possibilities to me. I could be the vengeful sort with ideas that turn you into a viral video. He shook his head. I know you well enough to know you're not the vengeful sort. He was still smiling, and close enough that they might get their skis tangled. You're too sweet for that. Sweet and bubbly and effervescent. She forced a laugh. Sounds like I could pass for a soda. All right, let me think of better adjectives. Before he did, Liam arrived, stopping beside Scarlet in one effortless motion. Speaking of nice form, the man was no stranger to the slopes. She'd admired his easy grace all day. Sorry I took so long, he told her. A lady near wiped me out, and I helped her fetch a runaway ski. So kind and thoughtful. No worries, Scarlet said. Camden and I were just thinking up ideas for viral videos. Liam nodded a somewhat stiff greeting at Camden. Great. It may have been Scarlet's imagination, but she thought she saw irritation mirrored on both men's expressions. Liam turned to Scarlet. Are you ready to go up again? Sure. She pushed backward to avoid running over Camden's skis and followed Liam to the lift line. While they waited, Scarlet's gaze kept drifting to Liam, to his tall form, his chiseled jaw, and his easy confidence. Your parents took you to all sorts of posh ski resorts when you were growing up, didn't they? Some posh, but mostly normal ones. Still, they'd taken him. Scarlet only learned to ski because her grandparents had given her and her sisters lessons, and she'd only ever been to Snow Bowl. They went to all your track meets and football games, too, didn't they? Soccer, basketball, and baseball, he said. I know they're driving you crazy now, but I still have parent envy. Liam put his arm around Scarlet, side-hugged her, and just as quickly let her go. She felt a little breathless at the sudden gesture, one so nonchalant and yet so intimate. Were they on casual hugging terms now? Maybe Camden was watching them and his hug had been for show. She lowered her voice and didn't turn around to check. What was that for? For reminding me not to take my parents for granted. In that case, she was glad to be of help. And if he wanted more hugs, she'd oblige. Their turn had come, and they positioned themselves in front of the chair. For the first couple of minutes up the mountain, Scarlet ran over her conversation with Camden in her mind. Below them, skiers and snowboarders weaved down glistening white trails. Tall, thin pine trees did their best to spike the sky. Maybe Camden felt guilty about high school, and so was trying to be extra nice now. But if not, if he was actually coming on to her, Jane deserved to know that, didn't she? If Camden already had roving eyes, someone should tell her. Although, even if Scarlet decided that was the case, what would she tell Jane? That her fiancé had apologized and called her sweet? You're being quiet, Liam said. Is something wrong? I don't know. She tapped her skis together, knocking off some clinging snow. 
Have you ever had an interaction with a person where you weren't sure whether what they said was innocent or whether they were flirting with you? Liam pressed his lips together and nodded. Actually, yes. He let out a breath, apparently lost in that memory, and then his head swiveled to her. Wait, are you talking about Camden? Did he say something to you? She gave him a brief rundown of the conversation. He might have just been giving me a sincere apology. Or he might be a jerk who's flirting with his fiancé's cousin. Liam stared at her for a moment. Since you're pretty oblivious to innuendo, I'm coming down on the side of he's a jerk. Do you want me to talk to him? Liam gritted his teeth and glanced behind them at the other chairs. And when I say talk, I mean threaten. Don't do that. Scarlet turned to see him better. And what do you mean I'm oblivious to innuendo? You... Uh, never mind. I'm redoing that answer and changing it to, since you're extremely beautiful and charming, I tend to suspect he was flirting. That is such a better answer, but you still have to explain the first one. He shook his head. The first answer doesn't exist anymore. Redo rules. She tilted her goggles up to better consider him. Are you saying that you've said things to me with innuendo and I missed them? Hmm, no. She took hold of his arm. Explain, or I'll have to wrestle the answer out of you, probably causing us to fall to our deaths. Remember what Hazel said about that. He laughed, a deep, rich sound. Can't. Redo rules. You don't think I'll carry through on my threat, do you? Maybe you assume I have something to live for. She made a pfft sound. Now it's a challenge. Which was why, when the two reached the top, their chair was swinging. She was trying to unzip his jacket to tickle him. He had to take hold of both her hands to stop her. She nearly lost a glove. Right before the chair reached the unloading area, Scarlet behaved, got off, and the two skied toward the trail. She stopped at the lip of the edge to slide her goggles over her eyes. You may be able to outski me and get away today, but I have the rest of the week to work on you. Don't think this is the end. I'm sure it won't be the end. He tugged the zipper on his jacket up. I'll be on my guard so you can't undress me again. Or maybe I won't. She pointed her glove at him. Was that innuendo? Because if it was, I totally got it. He laughed, and she was struck all over again at how handsome he looked when he smiled. Without another word, he headed down the mountain slope. He left the main trail, swishing between the trees, then zipping back over, making everything he did look effortless. The group stayed for night skiing and didn't get home until late. By then, Scarlet was tired and her legs ached like she'd been doing a day's worth of squats. Still, it was fun, and another tradition checked off the list. Tomorrow, everyone would tell Grandma how much they'd enjoyed themselves, and she'd be happy her family had spent time together on the slopes, just like they'd done when they were teenagers. Scarlet told everyone goodnight and headed upstairs to shower. As she stood under the warm water, her mind kept wandering to Liam. The guy had serious swagger on a mountain. He was fearless and graceful. And he looked pretty good off a mountain, too. There was something about him that was so endearing and that made her want to run her hands through his shaggy hair. She'd done that when they'd kissed in the hallway yesterday. Once memories of that kiss entered her mind, she found it very hard to think about anything else and may have inadvertently conditioned her hair twice. But Hazel was right. Scarlet shouldn't get involved with Liam. If he started caring about her, she'd most likely end up hurting him. She didn't want that. So she should stick with her earlier resolve, and shouldn't kiss him again. Even though just thinking of their last kiss made her skin tingle. Was kissing a guy really such a bad thing? They were both adults. They were both aware that their relationship was just this week and whatever time it took them to put together a wedding. After her grandma passed, 
Scarlet had an appointment with a metaphorical pool boy. Why not enjoy the time she and Liam had together? There was always the chance something could come of their relationship. What if Liam was her soulmate, and she missed out because she was so afraid of making a mistake? She refused to take any action. What Liam had told her about choosing a major applied to men, too. Except for when you broke up with a major, it didn't go through the house sobbing while it packed up its things. It didn't carry scars throughout the rest of its life. Scarlet felt as though she had the proverbial angel and devil on her shoulders. The angel, sounding an awful lot like Hazel, said, You shouldn't lead him on. And the devil whispered, But that kiss... Finally, Scarlet was out of things to scrub and rinse and got out of the shower. She ought to talk to Liam about their relationship and put some boundaries between them. Holding hands, well, that was still okay, wasn't it? But they ought to draw the line at kissing. She dressed in her pajamas, threw on her robe, and opened the bathroom door to leave. Liam was walking toward the bathroom, a towel in some bright red flannel pajamas draped over his arm. Those had probably never been in style. Honestly, who bought the man's clothes? Instead of getting out of his way, she waited for him in the doorway. He strolled up. We meet again. She lifted the edge of his PJ shirt with one finger, examining it. Liam was so close that her skin was tingling again. I don't mean to sound critical, but these are, he smirked, these are perfect pajamas, because if I'm ever unconscious in a house fire, the firemen will be able to spot their brightness and drag me to safety. She bit back a laugh. Maybe we should just make sure your smoke alarms work and buy you some new pajamas. You want to go clothes shopping again? Yes. Spending a few hours with Liam, just the two of them, would be nice. And in the future, when you need clothes, you should take Talia shopping with you. These were a gift from Talia. Really? Does she know you're not a lumberjack? He lifted a hand in concession. Granted, they were a gift from her several years ago. She was probably 16 at the time, but they're comfortable and no one sees them except me. Well, usually, anyway. We'll still buy you new ones. He watched her for a moment, his golden brown eyes taking her in. Camden won't ever see my pajamas, so you can't be trying to impress him. Why does it matter? Because fashion was the one thing she was an expert on. Of course, she wanted to share it with Liam. It was perhaps the only talent she had. Maybe I just like dressing you up and making you look good. He nodded. I've become a human Ken doll, eh? She gazed upward, trying to grasp a phrase that wouldn't come to her mind. What? He asked, when she didn't speak for several moments. I'm trying to think of a clever retort that incorporates what you just said and your earlier protest that you wouldn't let me undress you. But nothing is coming to mind. This is a total witty banter, Phil. I think what I actually said was that I might let you undress me. Her gaze stayed on the ceiling. Something brilliant will come to me tomorrow, and by then, it will be too late. Might means it's still a possibility. You could always try your luck. Her gaze slid to his again. He was smiling in a teasing way. She was so tempted to reach out and put her hand against his chest. It would be so easy to take hold of his shirt and pull him toward her. She kept her hands at her side. Speaking of innuendo and you being all hot and adorable... That probably wasn't the correct way to start a conversation about the boundaries they needed set. Her gaze went to his chest so she didn't have to keep looking into his warm eyes. She could get lost in those eyes. Boundaries. They were supposed to be talking about boundaries. She should bring up their kiss in the hallway yesterday and tell him it shouldn't happen again. 
she met his gaze again. So, I've been thinking about kissing you. He grinned. Consider it done. He slipped his hands around her waist, leaned down and pressed his lips gently to hers. Softly. Tender. An almost electric shock of desire went through her. Okay. That didn't go like she'd expected. She didn't stop him and explain what she meant, though. Somehow, she couldn't bring herself to have that conversation right now. One light kiss turned into another. Instead of stepping away from him, she wrapped her hands around his neck and kissed him back. This felt so nice. So right. Her heart was zinging around her chest in all sorts of erratic ways. His hands tangled into her wet hair and the feel of his warm fingers against her neck made it hard to breathe. They could talk about boundaries later. Tomorrow, maybe. Her resolve would probably return by then. Her resolve didn't return in the hallway. Liam was the one that stepped away from her. I'd better let you go, he murmured. Good night. Right, she said. Good night. She floated down the hallway to her bedroom, feeling too happy to regret anything yet. As her namesake had said in Gone with the Wind, tomorrow was another day. Not much later, Hazel and Vi descended on Scarlet's room. Both were still dressed in their jeans and sweaters. Sister talk, Hazel said. And that was all that was needed to convene an impromptu meeting. We need to go over the schedule. Scarlet was pretty sure this meeting would be more than just an update on Grandma's schedule. Another topic was already there in Hazel's eyes, in the way she was giving Scarlet an understanding look, and yet one that said she wanted something, some sort of compromise. The subject matter most likely had something to do with Scarlet's wedding and their mother. Vi's eyes were resigned. She would rather be somewhere else than talking about any of this. But one didn't blow off a sister meeting. Scarlet and Vi sat propped against the bed against her headboard, while Hazel sank into the pillows on the window seat. She went over a few details for the next couple of days' schedules, and the menu for the rest of the week. So organized. She moved on to Grandma's schedule. Jane had some things come up and needed people to cover for her a couple of times. Of course. Jane was always begging off, and yet somehow Grandma never held it against her. Scarlet volunteered for both slots, more time to get Grandma to reconsider her will. But Vi insisted on taking one of them. I hardly ever see Grandma, Vi said. I want more time with her. Hazel moved on to the next topic, the real one. Mom called Grandma while we were skiing. That's great, Scarlet said. Mom should talk to Grandma more. They talked about you and your wedding, Hazel went on. Scarlet turned to Vi to see if she knew where the conversation was headed. She wants something weird at the ceremony, doesn't she? Incense? Fertility beads? Oh, I'm sure she does, Vi said. But she'll save those requests for you, not Grandma. Hazel went on as though Vi and Scarlet hadn't spoken. Mom said Benito probably won't be able to come to the States for your wedding. He's presenting at some important meetings. That was probably for the best. Scarlet didn't feel all that guilty for making her mom come to Arizona for the wedding, because she ought to spend as much time with Grandma as she could. But she had felt guilty for making Benito fly out for something that wasn't real. I'll tell Mom it's fine if he doesn't come. After all, we'll meet him at their wedding. Hazel's eyes went to Scarlet's, sending her a meaningful look. She's still worried you're rushing into things and making a mistake. I think the right thing to do is to tell her the marriage is just for Grandma's benefit. Vi didn't say anything, which meant she agreed. Letting their mother worry did seem wrong. Still, Scarlet hesitated. You know Mom's not the best at keeping secrets. Their mother had so few secrets she had a hard time remembering that other people didn't share information about their lives as freely as she did. 
she simply forgot what was supposed to be classified. She'd keep an important secret, Vi said. It's your choice, Hazel said. But I think you ought to tell her. Scarlet leaned back, her gaze fixing on the bed's filmy white canopy. It had been pink cotton when she was little, but Grandma let Scarlet change it to sheer white voile when she got older. Now the material reminded her of bridal veils. Even if Mom didn't outright tell Grandma the wedding was fake, she could easily say something to give the truth away. She's horrible at subterfuge. Remember when the bank manager played Santa? Mom took us to that Christmas party and kept flirting with him. That was a different situation, Hazel said. Yeah, I was a young, impressionable child who worried that my mother was going to break up Santa and Mrs. Claus. We can't rely on her acting skills. She couldn't even pull off normal mother for one Christmas party. Hazel sighed. I don't think... Scarlet didn't let her finish. Mom sat on Santa's lap in front of her children and told him she hadn't been a naughty girl yet, but if he climbed down her chimney, she'd take it under consideration. I'm still not sure whether his answer of ho, ho, ho was an indictment of her moral character. Vi groaned and rubbed her forehead. Wow, I thought I'd repress that memory, but it's back now. Thanks for that imagery, Scarlet. Hazel took a patient breath. Granted, Mom was out of line. It was easy for Hazel to be patient. She'd been eleven at the time and no longer believed in Santa. Scarlet fixed her with a stare. That Christmas Eve, I refused to go to bed. I figured Mom was waiting up for Santa. I kept sneaking into the living room. Mom yelled at me and threatened to take away my toys until I broke into tears and explained why I had to stop her. Scarlet raked her hand through her still wet hair. Yeah, that was probably the worst way possible to learn that Santa isn't real. All right, Hazel said. You don't have to tell Mom the truth if you don't want to. But I still think you should, so she won't worry. Hazel was Definitely a better person than Scarlet, because Scarlet didn't feel nearly as bad as she should about making her mother worry. Scarlet had worried so many times about her mother's marriages. The shoe could be on the other foot for her. The next afternoon, while Scarlet took her shift with Grandma, she brought up the subject of the house again. The two of them had finished a game of rummy, and Scarlet had given Grandma her pills. As Grandma gave her back the cup, she said, I know you don't have room to carry things back with you on the plane, but you should go through the things in your old room. If there's anything you want to keep, perhaps Liam could take it with him in his car. The family had been going through things in Grandma's house that morning, parceling out items and donating others to secondhand stores. Scarlet placed Grandma's cup on her nightstand. Have you thought more about who you're leaving the house to? I know Vi is happy with her life in Phoenix, but either Hazel or I would love to have it. You could even leave it to both of us. That way you could take care of two inheritances at once. Grandma pulled the covers up around her. I wish I'd known your thoughts on the house before Christmas. I always figured Jane would be the only one who wanted to stay in Flagstaff. What with her mother living here and Camden's family, too. Jane told me months ago that she and her boyfriend were getting close to setting a date. And since she hinted that she needed a place to live, I as much told her she could have the house. Of course Jane had already swooped in and asked for the house. She was taking advantage of Grandma's generosity, but that didn't mean Grandma couldn't still consider other options. I thought, Grandma went on, if Jane and Camden moved in here after they got married, they'd be around to help me more, and I wouldn't be such a burden to Hazel and Matt. The young man has gone above and beyond what's required of a neighbor. She laid her head on the pillow as though the matter was closed. 
such a nice young man. I'm glad he and Hazel have hit it off. Scarlet needed to press that point. You're allowed to change your mind about who you leave the house to. Jane and Camden will be wealthy enough that they'll be able to buy any house they want. Hazel's and Matt's salaries are much more meager. You'd want Hazel and Matt to have a home they loved, wouldn't you? Grandma clucked her tongue. The two just started dating. We can hope they'll end up together. But if they don't, I can guarantee Hazel won't want to live in this house and be reminded of Matt every time she looks outside. Hazel adored the house so much, she probably didn't care who lived next door. But clearly, an engagement was a sticking point for Grandma. Scarlet tried again. Liam and I are engaged, and we love the house. Grandma shifted her pillow. But he's not done with his residency yet. What if he can't open a practice in Flagstaff? And would you be happy away from the excitement of L.A.? Yes. Perhaps Scarlet didn't sound certain enough. She was actually thinking about the question. Where did she want to settle down? She loved the weather and the beaches in L.A., but she hated the traffic, pollution, and the cost of living. She'd only planned on living there until, well, until she figured out what she wanted to do with her life. Those details seemed so hard to pin down. Why did other people have such an easy time choosing careers? Well, Grandma said, if you and Liam end up living here... His doctor's salary should ensure you'll be able to afford any sort of house you'd like. Grandma smiled, a sleepy smile that indicated her medication had kicked in. She'd be checking out of the conversation soon. You could take Grandpa's house plans and build a Victorian house like this on a lot somewhere. Maybe Hazel and Vi could do the same wherever they end up. Wouldn't that be lovely? Her voice became slower, groggier. Four of my favorite people in my favorite house. She shut her eyes. Scarlet waited a few more moments to see if she would say more, but she drifted off to sleep. So, no real headway in convincing Grandma to change her mind. Grandma had decided to leave the house to Jane without even talking to the rest of them about their plans for the future. A house like Grandma's wouldn't be the same as the real thing. It wouldn't be the home Grandpa had built for Grandma, designed to match her favorite house in the Christmas village. None of the memories of staying with Grandma and Grandpa would come attached to a replica. In fact, if Scarlet did build a copy of her grandparents' house, Perhaps the strongest memory would be that Grandma had shown favoritism by giving Jane the original one. Well, Scarlet didn't have to dwell long on the question of whether to build or not to build. She didn't have the money for that sort of construction project. No doctor's salary. She might never have that sort of money. Was there another way to change Grandma's mind? Or maybe bringing up the subject again would just make Scarlet come off as greedy. She wasn't greedy. She just disliked the inequity of it. Why didn't Grandma see that? Scarlet didn't have to think about the answer for long. Money had never mattered all that much to Grandma, and apparently it never occurred to her that her family members might see things differently. Scarlet stood and watched her Grandma for another moment, at the reassuring rise and fall of her breathing, and quietly left the room. I will not be mad at Grandma. No matter what, she leaves Jane, Scarlet told herself firmly. Grandma had loved and taken care of Scarlet and her sisters so many times. That sort of inheritance mattered more than whatever was in the will. However, knowing a thing and feeling it were two different matters. Scarlet wandered around the house looking for Liam. She found him in his bedroom, sitting at the desk going through email. When she walked in, he looked up from his computer. What's wrong? I'm not as good a person as I should be. She trudged over to him, feeling like a sulky child. I should be more forgiving and unmaterialistic like Hazel. And for that matter, I should have my life together, like Vi. 
Liam turned his chair to better face her. His golden brown eyes showed no judgment. She sat down on his lap and leaned her head against his shoulder. My older sisters are ruining my self-esteem. He ran his hand along her back. It's tough to have good role models. He was teasing, but also sympathetic. I shouldn't care about the will. Things are just things, right? He kept running his hand along her back soothingly. Exactly. So how come I care anyway? Because you were born a human? It's messy business. You need time to process stuff. Eventually, what you think and what you feel will sync up. It just takes time. She loved him right then for understanding. And instead of talking about boundaries, she kissed him. He kissed her back. So much for any talk on their relationship. Boundaries were probably overrated anyway. She didn't bring up the subject of their relationship that day or the next. The days until New Year's went by much too quickly. She divided her time between talking to Grandma, doing things on Hazel's list of traditions, and going through Grandma's things to decide what needed to stay in the house and what should go. Liam was always nearby, equally cheerful whether they were hauling trash out of the attic. What had Grandma planned on doing with those carpet remnants or boxes of magazines? Or whether they were singing Christmas carols around the fireplace? Camden and Jane came over each day, generally dressed like a jet-set couple on their way to dinner rather than people who wanted to help with any sort of work. They were posh and elite and didn't let anyone forget it. Hazel always gave them the easy jobs. Since Liam was usually close to Scarlet and had a tendency to glare warnings at Camden, her ex did nothing more questionable than call Scarlet Miss Fanta a few times when Jane wasn't around, an inside joke because on the slopes he'd called her sweet, bubbly, and effervescent. Yep, the guy was trying to be on inside joke terms with her. Camden also brought several six-packs of soda to the house. Scarlet wouldn't have thought much about that, except he said things like, Gotta have my soda. You know how much I love something sweet. Once, he even winked at her while saying it. She didn't respond to any of his soda commentaries. Really, ignoring Camden and paying attention to Liam got easier each day. She much preferred Liam's wavy blonde hair to Camden's sleek brown style. Golden brown eyes were more intriguing than their darker counterparts. And Liam's smile that quirked up at one side, Scarlet glowed with warmth every time he aimed one at her. Another daily occurrence was video calls from Mrs. Brooks to discuss wedding details. She insisted Liam and Scarlet take pictures together right after the first video call so that she could start sending out save-the-date cards. That wasn't such a bad assignment. Scarlet had no trouble posing snuggled up to Liam. Even after Hazel had taken several good shots outside with evergreens and snow as a backdrop, Scarlet made her take more on the porch and inside by the fireplace. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to modeling, she told her sister. We need to make sure we get the best picture possible. But it wasn't that. She just wanted pictures of Liam. Having Hazel take them was so much less awkward than Scarlet snapping them like some groupie. Mrs. Brooks had suggestions on colors, theme, and food. She found a reception center not far from Grandma's house that could accommodate them for a reasonable price. She insisted having the wedding there would be easier on everyone. No one would have to worry about cleaning Grandma's house for the event, rearranging the furniture, or bringing in more chairs. Mrs. Brooks did have a valid point. As soon as Scarlett and Liam agreed to that change, however, his mother began arranging every other detail. She had a florist friend who owed her favors and would do the flowers at cost. She had friends who could decorate, cater, and make the cake. Every time Scarlett protested that they were trying to keep things simple, meaning cheap and easy, Liam's mom brushed aside the protest. I enjoy planning events, dear. It gives me something positive to concentrate on. 
Mrs. Brooks shot down Scarlett's idea of having Hazel take the wedding pictures. She'll be one of your bridesmaids. She'll be too busy to take photos. We weren't really planning on having bridesmaids, Scarlett said. I'm sure we'll be able to pull together some simple bridesmaids dresses in time, Mrs. Brooks said, as though that was the issue. I've already found several possibilities. I'll send you the links. Liam always remained silent during these discussions, leaving the decisions to Scarlet. If she glanced at him for an opinion, he just shrugged to let her know he was fine with whatever she chose. Scarlet gave in. Again. I guess so long as they're dresses that my sister's and Talia like. After all, if her sister's and Talia could wear them other places, the money wouldn't be wasted. I'll ask the photographers I know in California if any of them would be willing to come up and shoot the wedding. Another expense to add to her tally. It's too bad, Mrs. Brooks said in a mildly reprimanding tone, that we couldn't have given Reverend Saunders more notice about your wedding date. He's known Liam since he was a boy and would have been honored to officiate. I talked to him about it, but unfortunately he already has Valentine's Day plans with his wife. That's okay, Scarlet said quickly. Hazel has a friend who agreed to do it. That's one thing we've got covered already. It was essential that an actor marry them so the wedding wouldn't be official. A friend? Mrs. Brooks asked. Not your pastor? No, not her pastor. Because if Scarlet gave Liam's mother Reverend Zimmerman's name, she might check in with him. If Scarlet gave her a fake name, she might check and see that no pastors in Flagstaff had that name. Hazel's friend is really good, Scarlet said. He's, um, done a lot of weddings. He's a clergyman? Yes, she said slowly, because she wasn't sure whether non-clergy could marry people in Arizona. What's his name? I've forgotten. Because that way Mrs. Brooks couldn't research him. Mrs. Brooks made an unsatisfied grumbling noise, but went on to the next item on her wedding checklist. Scarlet moderated what she could, acquiesced on the rest, and always said, Send the bills to me. She refused to let Liam cover anything. The engagement had been her doing. It was her responsibility. She just hoped her modeling jobs picked up so this venture didn't bankrupt her. Scarlet hated deceiving Mrs. Brooks about their relationship, but the one time she suggested to Liam that maybe he ought to tell his parents the truth after all, he shook his head. My parents are going to counseling because they think their continual arguing is why I kept you a secret. I'm not messing with that. You're stuck marrying me now. On New Year's Eve, Scarlet and Liam went over to Aunt Christina's house for a party there. This one wasn't just for Grandma's friends. In fact, no one expected her to last past nine o'clock. Jane and Camden had invited their friends, and they'd rented a wooden dance floor for the backyard as well as space heaters. Refreshment tables stood nearby, but since Aunt Christina had invited her friends as well, a second refreshment station was set up in the kitchen for people who didn't want to dance or brave the cold. Scarlet and Liam danced for a while, but somehow she found herself growing sadder, deflating a little more after each dance. The countdown clock prominently keeping track of the time on the patio also announced the time she had left with Liam. Not enough time, and even less time. Tomorrow, she would fly back to California, go back to her real life, and probably only talk to Liam via text. And how much would they even have to text about, since his mother had taken over the wedding planning? Scarlet wouldn't get to see him again until the two came back to Flagstaff for the wedding. Was there such a thing as going through guy withdrawal? Around ten o'clock, Liam towed her off the dance floor. You're cold, aren't you? I'm Cinderella, pre-midnight, contemplating a pumpkin life. What? The music was still loud enough that it was hard to hear, and she hadn't spoken loudly. It doesn't matter. 
He led her inside and they went to the dining room. It was the only empty room downstairs. We can warm up in here for a while. They sat down on a couple of Queen Anne chairs. He held onto her hands, warming them between his own. She wasn't cold, but didn't stop him. She liked the feel of his hands around hers. He had some small calluses on the palms of his hands, and she wondered how a dentist managed to get calluses. Maybe lifting weights, or rock climbing. He had a life beyond the week they'd spent together, and he was going back to it. She sent him a plaintive look. If I text you about things that aren't related to the wedding, will that bother you? It would bother me if you didn't. Good. That made her feel a little better. Speaking of the wedding, he said slowly, instead of flying back to California tomorrow, why don't you drive down to Scottsdale with me? My mother wants to spend time with you, and there are still some wedding details to work out. We might as well do that sooner than later. You can fly back to California in a week or so, when we're done. I can't. Her sadness returned full force by this fact. Spending more time with Liam would be so nice. I've got to go back to California and find some modeling jobs so I can pay for the wedding. She had fashion show work coming up in a couple of weeks, but would need something sooner. You don't have to. I'll pay for the wedding. He was so sweet, but she couldn't let him do that. No, I made this bed, so I'm the one who has to sleep in it. Liam pressed his lips together. Or I could sleep in it with you. After all, my mom's the one who keeps driving up the cost. It's only fair I help pay. Scarlet shook her head. None of this would have happened if I hadn't been trying to top my cousin. I should have consulted with you before making announcements to my family. It's completely my fault. So, you're free and clear of this bed. Am I? He sent her a long, meaningful look. What if I want to get into bed with you? Oh! A woman's flustered voice sounded from the doorway. Uh, I guess we'll find somewhere else to sit. Scarlet's head snapped toward the doorway to see two elderly women, friends of her aunt, standing there, plates in their hands. Both wore prim, scandalized expressions. Let's try the living room, one muttered. I'm sure they'll make room for us. The women whirled and headed in that direction. Scarlet finally found her voice. It was a metaphor, she called to them. And besides, we're getting married soon. They didn't reply. In fact, both scurried away faster. It didn't help matters that Liam was laughing, amused and not at all repentant. Scarlet wilted in her chair. You know, my English teacher never warned me about this sort of thing during our metaphor unit. I blame the school system. I'm sorry. Liam finally regained himself. But at least we'll have the dining room to ourselves. They're going to warn everyone in the living room not to come in here. He was probably right. Great. Another incident to live down with Aunt Christina. So... Liam put his hand over hers. Are you coming with me to Scottsdale tomorrow, or do we have to explore that bed metaphor some more? Saying yes would be so easy. She missed Liam already, and he'd offer to pay for the wedding. But even considering the idea made her feel like... Well, like her mother. Like someone who'd taken advantage of a man. Liam was starting to have feelings for her and was pulling out his checkbook. But that wasn't the sort of relationship she wanted with him. It's my responsibility to pay for the wedding, she said. So I've got to work. He let out a breath. Okay. The word wasn't an agreement. It was a challenge. He leaned back, pulled out his phone, and began scrolling through something. What are you doing? Contacting your modeling agency. I want to hire you to do some ads all next week. Are you really? She grabbed his phone. 
Sure enough, her agency's contact info was on the screen. You've got a great smile. You could easily sell dental services. Do I pay the travel expenses through them or arrange that with you separately? Was he serious? He wouldn't really go to the trouble of hiring her. If you want pictures of me for advertising, I'll send some to you for free. I have lots of me smiling. That's not the point. I want you in Scottsdale. His eyes, usually so casual, grew intense. He really did want her to come with him. Was he going into withdrawal too? She stared back at his golden brown eyes, trying to gauge his emotions. If the only way to have you, he said, is to pay for your time, I will. I'll happily be your customer. What's your hourly fee? The sound of someone clearing his throat came from the doorway. Despite Liam's prediction that they would be left alone, a middle-aged man and his wife stood in the doorway, plates in hand. Scarlet hadn't considered how Liam's words could be construed until she saw the woman's shocked expression. We were just, um... The woman waved vaguely over her shoulder. We'll find someplace else. The man eyed Scarlet, leering a little like he was also wondering what her price was. His wife took hold of his sleeve and pulled him away. Come on, she snapped. Why did these things keep happening to Scarlet? And why did they all have to happen in front of her aunt's friends? I'm a model, she called weakly. Not a hooker. And besides, we're getting married soon. They didn't turn around. Liam stifled another laugh. I don't think telling them that we're getting married soon actually helped that explanation. Scarlet put her elbows on the table and rested her head in her hands. I'm not going into the living room. I don't want to face any of those people. Liam leaned over and massaged her shoulders, working to loosen the tension there. You'll probably never see them again after tonight. She kept her head in her hands. That's what I said about you when we first met, and now we're getting married. Right. And that's why you've got to come to Scottsdale with me. I need you to deflect my mother's enthusiasm. Otherwise, I'm going to be stuck picking out napkin colors. When he put it that way, that Scarlet was doing him a favor, not taking advantage of him, she could consider the invitation. She lifted her head. We can't have you choosing the napkin colors. I've seen your pajama colors. Exactly. Still, she hesitated to say yes. He must have seen it in her eyes. Please, he murmured. I need you. How could she say no to that? Especially when she was beginning to feel how much she needed him too. Okay, but... No buts, he said. That's my professional order as a proctologist. We'll work out the finances later. She turned toward him, ready to kiss him. By that point, she really should have known better. The dining room wasn't a private place. There you are, a woman said. Talia sauntered into the room. She was tall, like him, with the same dark blonde hair and warm eyes. Before, when Scarlet had seen her, she'd always worn jeans and a t-shirt, her long hair in a messy bun. Tonight, she wore a black sweater with pearl beading and her hair was loose around her shoulders. She held a plate of refreshments in her hand and had just taken a bite of sugar cookie. Talia! Liam stood and hugged his sister, careful not to knock into her plate. What are you doing here? She wasn't one of Jane's friends, and it seemed unlikely that she'd come to this party to third wheel with Hazel and Matt. I told Mom and Dad I was cutting my time in Scottsdale short because I wanted to go to a party in Flag and talk to a special guy. She took another bite of her cookie. Technically, it wasn't a lie because you are a special guy. Her gaze cut to Scarlet, and she smiled politely. Hey, almost sister-in-law. How's it going? Scarlet felt herself blushing. Good. Thanks. What must Talia think of her for dragging her brother into an engagement? Liam checked behind his sister to make sure no one else was nearby. You came here to talk to me? Well, I also needed a break from Mom and Dad. Let's not overlook that. 
but yeah. No need to ask what Talia wanted to talk to Liam about. Ten to one, it was Scarlet and Liam's upcoming nuptials. Liam must have realized this too. He edged toward the dining room door and gestured for Talia to follow him. To Scarlet, he said, I'm going to take a walk with my sister for a few minutes, okay? Sure, Scarlet said. Take as long as you need. I'll just go find the bowl of Ferrero Rocher and ruin my health. She hoped Talia wasn't too angry that Scarlet had roped her brother into a fake marriage. For the wedding to work, they needed her secrecy. Chapter 13 Liam and Talia grabbed their coats and headed outside. The houses on the street were the large, expensive sort, with strings of Christmas lights glowing full blast. Cars lined the street on both sides like an unmoving rush hour. Liam and Talia strolled down the street, away from the noise of the music that blared from the party. You needed a break from Mom and Dad, Liam asked. Are they fighting again? No, and in some ways, that's worse. They made this goal not to complain or say anything negative. Apparently, that was their whole repertoire before, and now they have nothing to talk about except for my life and your wedding, which is the main reason I came to talk to you. She lifted her hands in emphasis. Why didn't you tell them your engagement was a pretense for Scarlet's grandma? Do you know how many people mom has invited? Like, a hundred. She's researching bands. Bands? Definitely not. Liam shut his eyes and sighed. We told her we wanted a small, simple ceremony. Mom doesn't understand small and simple, so the fact that you still haven't told her the truth means that either you're taking this fake boyfriend stint way too far, or I have to take back all those bad book reviews where I said insta-love wasn't a real thing. You don't have to rewrite any book reviews he said, and spent the next few minutes telling his sister how Scarlet was trying to inherit her grandmother's house, and also about his parents' trip to meet Scarlet. He related how they'd argued, and then blamed themselves that Liam had kept his girlfriend from them. How could I tell them the truth, after they said they'd go to counseling? Talia marched silently beside Liam for a few moments, their footsteps crunching on the sidewalk. Okay, I see the appeal of keeping the truth from mom and dad, but eventually they're going to notice you don't have a wife living in your townhouse. What are you going to do then? That was the question that had plagued him since his parents had returned home on Christmas. We were planning to have some sort of breakup, but now... The sentence drifted off into the cold night air, just another puff of frosty air dissolving. But now? Talia prompted. She considered Liam as though trying to peer into his mind. But now I'm having second thoughts about that. I'm not sure I want to break up with her at all. Talia cocked her head. So what exactly does that mean? Maybe Scarlet will like Scottsdale and won't mind moving to the area. The Phoenix metropolitan area is the fifth largest in the country. She should be able to find work there. I just have to convince her it's a good idea. And then, if mom or dad invite us out to dinner, Scarlet could attend without a problem. Wow, Talia said. One week together, and you want her to relocate? I don't know. I think I might have to rewrite some book reviews. I'm not in love. I'm deeply interested. Scarlet is intelligent kind, and she makes me laugh every day. He hadn't realized until this trip how much he enjoyed laughing and how little of it he'd done lately. I just want to get to know her better. Even as he said the last words, they felt like a lie. If any other woman had announced she was Liam's fiance, he would have found a way to extricate himself from that commitment as quickly and painlessly as possible. He wouldn't have bought her a ring. After all, looking like a bad fiancé was a lot simpler than the alternative. Instead, he'd not only bought an expensive ring, he'd agreed on a wedding date in less than two months, ensuring the two of them had to spend more time together. What he felt, 
he realized, was more than interest. It was more than infatuation or attraction. When Scarlet was around, Liam felt like a light had been turned on inside of him. And he didn't want it to go dark again. He wanted her companionship so badly, he'd even been willing to pay her modeling fee to ensure that she spent more time with him. One got used to the light very rapidly. Besides, he added, as though Talia had argued the point of Scarlet relocating, most of the dates I've had with other women only last about three hours and are several days apart. Scarlet and I have been together for seven days, all day. That's the equivalent of about, he paused to calculate, 30 dates worth. So it's more like we've been together for three months. I think you're stretching the math, Talia said. I know as much about Scarlet already as I ever knew about any of my girlfriends. More, maybe, because Scarlet wasn't the sort who stood on pretense. She was comfortable enough with herself that she said what was on her mind. So how does Scarlet feel about you? Talia asked. That was the question. We have a lot in common. She likes me. Might even be falling in love with him. The signs were there, the way her gaze always went to his, the way she lingered to talk to him. She took his hand in hers even when no one was watching. She asked his advice and wanted his approval. She'd kissed him every day, more than once. Mm-hmm. Talia pushed away a tree limb that hung over the sidewalk. Is that what I nearly walked in on? The two of you liking each other in the dining room? He grinned and shrugged nonchalantly. One of the things we have in common is that we like to kiss each other. Talia chuckled. Well, in that case, maybe she'll want to relocate after all. Maybe. Scarlet had some fears about long-term relationships. He must have looked worried about the outcome because Talia momentarily put her hand on his arm. Don't worry. You can convince her you're worth moving for. Seriously. I don't show single women our family pictures anymore because I'm tired of them asking for your number. She waved a hand over him like she was presenting him to a crowd for approval. You're handsome, smart, loyal, and you have a great job. Oh, that reminds me. I'm a proctologist tonight. What? He had no choice but to tell her how Scarlet had mixed up his profession. Then he repeated, with a clarity that would forever be burned into his memory, the conversation between Bill and his parents. By the end of the story, Talia shook with laughter. And that's why, Liam said, you're not allowed to say anything about my profession, my training, or any implements I might use during an examination. She snorted. I've heard of people with a stick up their butt. I never knew it was a tongue depressor. The worst part is that I'm going to have to tell Mom and Dad that Scarlett's family thinks I'm a proctologist. Otherwise, who knows what they'll say at the wedding. How am I going to explain that to them? Instead of offering any sort of helpful advice, Talia melted into another fit of laughter. Chapter 14 Scarlet didn't go to the living room. She didn't even go to the kitchen by the family room to look for chocolate there. She went to the work kitchen, where she knew she'd find plenty of backup food. She was putting fruit and vegetable sticks on her plate. She couldn't ruin her figure with sweets when a wedding dress was in her future. When Camden sauntered into the room, phone in hand, alone. Jane must be off with her friend somewhere. Scarlet hoped he'd ignore her pick up some food, and leave. Instead, he sidled up to her. Hello, Red. You look nice tonight. Red, his high school nickname for her. It was marginally better than Miss Fanta. Thanks. He glanced around the room. Where's Liam? Talking with his sister. Maybe Scarlet would have one dessert. 
New Year's Eve was a special occasion after all. She put a brownie on her plate. Camden's attention returned to his phone. Didn't you say you and Liam have been dating for five months? Yes. Camden scrolled through whatever he was looking at on his phone. I find it strange that there's no pictures of him on your social media. She bristled. I find it strange that you've been checking my social media. Really? Why would he? Camden kept scrolling. You've got plenty of pictures of yourself, but not one of him. I'm vain and don't like to share the spotlight. It's one of my failings. Did Camden suspect her of lying, or had he just been doing some online ex-girlfriend stalking and noticed the discrepancy? He brought up one of her profiles and showed it to her. Says here you're not in a relationship. I guess I forgot to change that. You know me. Forgetful. I do know you. The words were laced with an undercurrent of meaning. She wasn't sure what the meaning was. He couldn't be implying that he knew she was a liar, could he? She'd never lied to him back in high school. Her eyes stayed on his face, trying to discern his intention. He held her gaze and smiled. Have you thought about how I could make it up to you? What? Breaking your heart in high school. Remember, I told you on the slopes I'd make it up to you. Have you thought about it? Scarlet was about to tell him, You have nothing to make up. I'm long past over you. But why waste a favor? She could ask for the moon. He wouldn't give it to her, but at least he'd stop making offers in that slightly suggestive way. She smiled sweetly. If you want to do something for me, you could put in a good word with my grandmother and tell her she should leave her house to me. Camden picked up a cup of punch and swirled the liquid. You know she plans to leave her house to Jane, don't you? Plans can change. I also know you'd rather live in some modern, spacious mansion than a rambling old Victorian. Why not just tell my grandmother that? He took a slow sip of his drink. If we find something better, we'll sell the house. You're welcome to buy it from us. Scarlet made a twitching noise. You said you wanted to make up for your bad behavior in high school. And you think being dumped is worth a million dollars? I'm flattered by the intensity of your feelings. He already knew what the house would sell for. Jane and he probably planned on selling it the day after Grandma was laid to rest. Well, Scarlet said lightly, bad behavior accrues interest. You shouldn't have waited so long to make it up to me. What if I made it up to you, he said softly, with more bad behavior? That's not really how interest works. How does your interest work? She kept her voice cool to discourage any flirting. Mostly, I avoid paying interest altogether. Camden laughed and took another sip of his drink. That's true enough. It's been hard to get your attention this week. You're avoiding me, and I'm beginning to wonder why. His statement took her aback. She hadn't purposely set out to avoid Camden. She'd just chosen to hang around her sisters and Liam and not be near Camden if she could help it. Okay, so maybe technically that was avoiding him, but she couldn't pinpoint a specific reason for it. And that meant, instead of responding, she just stared at him, plate grasped in her hands like it was some sort of food shield. Maybe you still have feelings for me, he suggested, far too smug about that possibility. Nope. That's not it. Maybe you're hiding something then. She stiffened. The fewer questions he asked about what she might be hiding, the better. Maybe I just feel awkward being around you because of our past. He nodded, unfazed by the accusation. I can understand that. He took a step closer to her, as though about to confide in her. When you see me... Do you randomly remember things about us from high school? You know, 
Flashes from the past. Actually, yes. Back at the Christmas Eve party when she'd seen him, she'd had a flood of memories, big and small things. How he'd looked on her doorstep to take her to the homecoming dance, the flash of confidence that always accompanied his smile. But since then, she'd remembered other things about him that were less endearing. How he took forever to answer her texts. How he'd been patronizing at times to her and everyone else. How he'd intently followed a bunch of professional sports teams, giving precedence to the TV over everything else. Same thing keeps happening to me, Camden murmured, like this was a secret they now shared. I remember all sorts of things about you. I guess that's to be expected. She picked up her brownie and took a bite. Her willpower could only be expected to wait a certain length, and she'd already passed it. The gooey chocolate taste didn't disappoint. You've got to stop avoiding me, Camden said. We're going to be family soon. We'll see each other all the time. Not all the time. Scarlet felt petty for turning that into a point, but still. We've only been together this week because Grandma wanted her family with her for Christmas. That would thankfully change once Scarlet returned to California. Camden cocked his head. I thought you were going to move to Flagstaff. Isn't that why you want the house? Oh, right. That was her story. Yes. If you live in Flag, your aunt will invite you to family dinners every Sunday, as well as Thanksgiving and Christmas. She promised your grandma she'd be a mother figure to you and your sisters since your mom is, he paused, out of the country. He meant flaky. Scarlet sighed and took another bite of her brownie. She hadn't realized Grandma was extracting those sorts of promises from Aunt Christina. It didn't surprise her, though. Family was so important to Grandma. But after Grandma passed away, those promises wouldn't matter. Scarlet's plans would change. She wouldn't be with Liam anymore, Flagstaff wouldn't be an option, and family dinners with Jane and Camden wouldn't be in the cards. So, Camden said, the sooner we get over the awkwardness of being together, the better. True? Or they could just avoid each other. That would work too. Arguing for that outcome would make her seem petty again. I'm sure we're past the awkwardness now. It's good that we had this little talk. Hopefully that would be the end to this conversation and any supposed good intentions on his part. Great. Then we should dance. He reached out and took hold of her arm. What? No. She stepped away from him, breaking his grip. I don't think our fiancés would like that. Camden's voice took on that patronizing tone she disliked from high school. We're going to be family. Dancing together would prove that we're working on healing our rift. Scarlet kept her feet planted. Or it would look like we're rekindling an old romance. Bad idea. He shook his head. Even that seemed patronizing. The fact that you're worried about that option makes me think you have some unresolved feelings for me. Had he always been this arrogant? Well, she already knew the answer to that question. Yes, he had. But back in high school, his confidence had made him seem more of an alpha male. Now he just seemed smug and manipulative. Why did he want her to say she still had feelings for him? Was he trying to prove to himself that she couldn't be as happy with Liam as she would have been with him? The ironic thing was that if he'd had this conversation with her on Christmas Eve, she might have worried he was right. After all, she'd made Liam go clothes shopping with her because she cared what Camden thought of her. But after a week of being with Liam... She'd stopped thinking or caring about Camden altogether. The fact that I'm worried about dancing with you doesn't mean I have unresolved feelings. It means I care about my fiancé's feelings. The sentence was almost true. Liam wouldn't be happy if he saw her dancing with Camden, and that mattered to her. 
You should start considering Jane's feelings more. She's going to be your wife. Go dance with her. Scarlet stepped around Camden and marched to the door. As she walked through the family room, she pulled out her phone and texted Liam. If you want, you can wear your old plaid shirts again. Liam probably wouldn't see Camden tomorrow before Scarlet and he left Flagstaff, but it was the principle of the thing. Liam was amazing, no matter what he wore. Saying goodbye to Grandma the next morning was hard, even though Scarlet knew she'd be back in February. While Liam packed the car, Scarlet went into her grandmother's bedroom to hug her goodbye. Grandma no longer smelled of the rose perfume she used to wear. Now she smelled of medicine. She seemed so frail she could get lost in Scarlet's hug. Her eyes were bright, though, and she gripped Scarlet's hand with surprising strength, keeping her from leaving. Before you go, I want to talk to you for a minute. Scarlet sat down on the edge of the bed and hoped that this talk would be about the house. Grandma hesitated as though she wasn't sure where to start. Finally, she said, I know your mother gave you the birds and the bees talk long ago, but she's not here now, and neither of your sisters are married. Do you have any questions about your wedding night? Oh, that's what Grandma wanted to talk to her about. Scarlet wasn't sure whether to laugh or blush. You don't have to worry about that, Grandma. TV, music lyrics, and the internet have answered any questions a person could have. Grandma's gaze turned serious. Your mother told you that you should save yourself for marriage, didn't she? Yes, although the way her mother had put it was, If a man wants certain privileges, he has to pay for them with diamonds. One carat minimum is best. After marrying your father, I learned that loving a wealthy man is much better in the long run than loving a handsome one. Good old mom. She had all sorts of unconventional views, but was a practicalist when it came to finances. Grandma patted Scarlet's hand. I'm worried about you staying alone at Liam's house. I know you're engaged, but engaged isn't the same as married. Engagements can end. We're sleeping in different rooms, Scarlet reminded her. She told her grandmother this detail when she mentioned her change of travel plans. Grandma kept patting Scarlet's hand. I remember what it's like to be young and in love. Having him so close and unchaperoned will lead to temptations. You should stay with Violet. Vi doesn't have a guest room and is pretty far away from Scottsdale. I don't have a car and can't ask her to drive me back and forth each day. Then you should stay with Liam's mother instead. Not a chance. Liam would be much better company. And besides, if Scarlet spent that much time with his mother, she'd slip up and say something to give the truth away. Um, I'll talk to Liam about that. No, she wouldn't. This trip had turned her into such a liar. Good, Grandma said. I friended her on Facebook and suggested as much. Oh, great. In that case, yes, Scarlet really would have to talk to Liam about it and make sure he told his mother that Scarlet wasn't staying with her. On the drive to Scottsdale, Liam called his mother. Scarlet could tell from the things Liam said that Mrs. Brooks thought it was a great idea for Scarlet to stay with her. She pointed out that having Scarlet stay with her would be the perfect way for them to get acquainted, and finalizing all the wedding details would be easier, too. Hard pass. And she and Liam needed to discuss their backstory about where she'd stayed during their long-distance relationship when she'd come to Arizona to visit because apparently the only right answer to that question was a hotel somewhere in Scottsdale. Scarlet should probably know which one. Liam finally convinced his mother that Scarlet would be fine at his place, and promised his mother that she could spend all day working on wedding details with Scarlet while he was at work. 
So there was that to look forward to. After the phone call ended, Scarlett spent most of the drive quizzing him about his life, everything from his childhood pets to his college roommates. Sometimes she repeated the information three times, hoping this would help it stick in her mind better. Liam glanced at her while she was repeating the names of the high school sports he'd played. I don't think my parents will be suspicious if you don't know every detail of my life. You know me pretty well already. And she might be more confident about winging it, if she hadn't already turned him into a proctologist. We haven't covered your ex-girlfriends. Tell me about them. He shook his head. My parents definitely won't ask about them. Maybe I'm just curious. What sort of woman do you usually go for? He smirked and didn't say anything, just stared straight ahead. She watched him, waiting. He had a nice profile. Strong jawline, straight nose, well-crafted cheekbones. He still didn't speak. It's only fair that you tell me, she said. You met Camden. You already know what kind of guy I went for. Yeah, full of himself and not that loyal. She would have liked to say that her taste in men improved after Camden, but since she hadn't had a serious boyfriend since then, she didn't have much of a leg to stand on. I bet you went for the cute, brainy girls. Correct. See, you already know me well enough. Scarlet felt a completely unjustified sense of jealousy toward those past brainy girls. They were probably organized, efficient, and all had important jobs now. Why didn't you marry one of them? He glanced over at her and smiled. Maybe I realized I needed someone who could make me laugh. A bit of happiness sparked inside her. She may not be organized, but she did make him laugh. And for the first time since Liam had forced her to enroll for online classes, she was glad she was going back to school. She would get straight A's if it killed her. She'd show Liam she could channel her inner brainy girl. Then she'd be everything he liked. That was a new thought. That she actually wanted to be everything to a guy. It set off all sorts of warning bells in her mind. She had to remind herself that love didn't usually stay. And love could hurt so very much when it left. She made herself stare outside at the passing desert scenery because looking at the straight lines of his jaw or the curve of his lips was too distracting. Sagebrush, dirt, and cactus. Much better. Don't think about the future, she told herself. The relationship couldn't go far. Their time together had an expiration date. Then he'd be in Arizona, she'd be in California. And he'd go back to his residency and the life that kept him too busy to want a girlfriend. They finally reached Liam's gated community, mostly mansions surrounding a sprawling golf course. When Liam had told Scarlett he had a three-bedroom townhouse, she'd expected something small, something in a row of narrow houses with a tiny lawn. Instead, Liam drove up to what at first looked like one huge, ornate house. Eight columns supported a balcony, masonry framed the windows, and a stone walkway led through the extensive lawn. This is a townhouse? she asked. Yes, it's divided in three. You just can't see the front doors from here. They're underneath the balcony. He pulled into a spacious two-car garage at the side of the building. Another garage was visible further away. The third must be on the other side. The garage not only had cabinets lining both sides, but they were also nicer than the ones in Scarlet's kitchen. The door looked like it belonged on a French chateau. The inside of the townhouse was just as lavish. Tall ceilings, wood floors, and a huge living room. The large windows revealed a crystal blue pool surrounded by red rocks. Liam's furniture looked like it had been chosen by a designer and never used. The only sign that a real human lived here was the empty dog food bowls in the kitchen. Liam's mother had his dog and would be bringing him over tomorrow. Scarlet peered around in awe. How much do prosthodontists make during their residencies? 
William headed toward the stairs with her suitcases. My father's company developed this golf course. I offered to buy a unit, and he gave me this one. I got the family rate. He took the stairs two at a time, as though her luggage weighed nothing. This is a nice place to live during my residency, because the yard work and pool maintenance is contracted out. And that's when Scarlett realized just how different Liam's world was from hers. He thought this was a convenient place to live because it was low upkeep. Her apartment in California seemed especially small in comparison, and kept shrinking the more she wandered around Liam's home. The place had a huge master suite, two guest bedrooms, and an office. Downstairs had an exercise room and home theater. Was it wrong to feel even more attracted to Liam after seeing his house? Probably. Scarlet refused to turn into her mother. She wasn't going to let a man's bank account influence her feelings. She was just going to have to ignore all of this and pretend it didn't exist. Although the fireplace next to the tub and the guest bathroom, she couldn't help but adore that. That definitely existed. At the end of the tour, Scarlet said, Your home is really beautiful. The Hampton I supposedly stayed at during our long-distance relationship wasn't nearly as nice. Hilton, he said. It's the Hilton that's closest to my house. There were too many hotels with H names. She sighed. That will probably be the detail I mess up, and your mother will assume I've corrupted you. He grinned, unconcerned. Then it's a good thing I'm making an honest woman of you. He had such a warm, easy smile, and the rest of him was all packaged very nicely, too. That's when Scarlet remembered that Liam's wealth wasn't what she needed to guard against. It was that smile. It was him. If she wasn't careful, Liam might break her heart. Or, just as bad, she might break his. She needed to be careful, because that smile of his also said he wasn't being careful at all. Chapter 15 Much to Charlotte's chagrin, Liam's mother made good on his offer to spend her days with Scarlet. Mrs. Brooks, she seemed much too formal and intimidating to ever be referred to as Pamela, came over at lunchtime every day and whisked Scarlet out to a restaurant, sometimes with family friends she thought Scarlet should meet. Then the two drove around to run wedding errands. All of this made Scarlet feel like some sort of scam artist. She wanted to tell Liam's mother the truth, but Liam was just as insistent his parents remain in the dark. They had an appointment set up for their first counseling session. He didn't want to mess with that. And so Scarlet continued the act, wishing she had some way to tell Mrs. Brooks to stop being so nice, to like her less. At other times, Scarlet almost forgot it was all pretend. She and Liam's mother spent a day going to bridal shops, and Scarlet found a gown with a beautiful flowing train and a veil fit for a princess. She couldn't help but imagine herself walking down the aisle in it. When Scarlet emerged from the dressing room, Mrs. Brooks gasped and put her hand to her heart. It's gorgeous. Liam will be too stunned to remember his vows. Scarlet agreed the dress was on the spot, despite it costing more than she'd budgeted for. Talia would be able to make the alterations in time, and Scarlet wanted to see Liam as stunned as his mother predicted. Craziness and it was overtaking Scarlet. After errands, Mrs. Brooks returned to the townhouse with her to help with dinner. Scarlet knew this was his mother's way of teaching her to cook Liam's favorite dishes. Vi might have seen this sort of thing as intrusive, and Hazel would have been offended that someone assumed she needed lessons. But Scarlet thought it was sweet. A motherly thing to do. Mrs. Brooks never stayed for dinner, and as she left, she always said, 
You don't need to let Liam know I helped you with this. But how could Liam not know? He'd been in the kitchen when Hazel had made cooking assignments and always gave Scarlet the ones where she couldn't ruin the meal. She fessed up to the truth on the first night while they were eating the best stroganoff she'd ever had. The reason this is like your mama used to make is because your mama made most of it. Liam's fork stopped its progression, and his gaze flicked to Scarlet. If she's coming on too strong, I can tell her that you need more time by yourself to study. It's okay. She's nice. And besides, I'm glad I've got the recipe for this beef stroganoff now. I can hardly wait to see what else she has. All the recipes were good. Bandit, Liam's golden retriever, stood next to Scarlet for every meal like some sort of furry sentinel. The dog knew Scarlet was a soft touch and would feed him. After the dishes were done, Scarlet studied in the family room. She had the best intentions. She was resolved to channel her inner brainy girl and show Liam and herself that she was smart. And yet, somehow, each night she ended up spending more time than was wise kissing Liam on the couch, her homework forgotten. He was hot guy kryptonite for a girl's study schedule. Scarlet wasn't sure what the kissing meant to him, and didn't want to ask. She wasn't sure which outcome worried her more, that he was falling in love with her, or that he wasn't. Maybe he thought it was safe to kiss her, because their relationship had an expiration date. The week flew by. On the last night, Liam and Scarlet went out to dinner with Liam's father. Scarlet hadn't expected his mother to be there too, but she was. Mrs. Brooks was in such a good mood that there didn't seem to be any tension between her and Liam's father. Mr. Brooks let Mrs. Brooks do most of the talking, but as they finished dinner he handed an envelope to Liam. Airline vouchers, and the number of his timeshare so they could book their honeymoon. His gift to them. So thoughtful. It made Scarlet feel guilty again. As though she'd stolen their approval when it wasn't deserved. Thanks, Liam told his father. We really appreciate it. His gaze drifted to Scarlet with a smile. Now we can go to Cancun, like we talked about. She didn't think Liam was joking about that, and the thought took her breath away. The two of them could spend an extra week together. They should, shouldn't they? To make the honeymoon authentically believable. Not just the pictures. His parents would expect them to bring back souvenirs. Also, Mr. Brooks said, clearing his throat, Pamela tells me that you plan on walking down the aisle alone. Scarlet didn't have much of a choice. She certainly wasn't going to ask her father. And choosing one stepfather over another didn't seem fair. At Mrs. Brooks' insistence, she managed to track down all of their addresses and invited them. But she doubted any of them would come. They'd all moved on with their lives and had other wives and families. None of them had kept in contact with Scarlet beyond a few polite comments on her social media pages. And besides... They wouldn't want to see her mother. With the exception of stepdad number two, whose roving eye had ended the marriage at eleven months, the other men had all been hurt by her abandonment. Yes, Scarlet kept her voice light, pretending that the subject didn't bother her. Even though I've got a poor sense of direction, I figure I can make it down the aisle without getting lost. Liam squeezed her hand in consolation. He was good at knowing when her light tone wasn't quite sincere. I'll wave you in if you start heading the wrong way through the guest benches. Liam's dad slipped his card into the dinner bill. If you'd like, I can walk you down the aisle. That's not unheard of. The offer was so unexpected that for a moment Scarlet just stared at him. A fresh wave of guilt struck at her. She never should have agreed to come to Scottsdale. Getting to know them had made the lie so much worse. Mrs. Brooks must have interpreted Scarlet's silence as hesitancy. It's perfectly acceptable. After all, Rodney will be a father to you. She glanced at the envelope by Liam's plate with a smile of pride. Perhaps more of a father to you in some ways than your own has been. Well, that wasn't a hard contest to win. Thank you. Yes. 
Scarlet nearly stuttered the words. I'd like that. She just wanted to end the subject, so she didn't have to keep feeling like a fraud. When she and Liam returned to his townhouse, instead of studying on the couch, Scarlet went to her room to pack her things. She put her suitcase on the bed and began taking her clothes out of the dresser. After a minute, Liam strolled into the room and leaned against the doorframe, watching her. His broad shoulders and his height were both accentuated there. The man knew how to fill a doorframe. You don't have to go, he said. You could stay longer. She shook her head and placed some jeans into the suitcase. I've got to shoot in two days, and then I've got to go to Berlin for their fashion week. After that, I'll be in Paris doing runway there. She'd always loved working fashion weeks in Europe before. The excitement and energy, the beautiful clothes, and the parties with fashion designers, journalists, and bloggers. It had always been so fun. Now the trip just seemed like a long time to be gone. What would happen if he canceled? Liam asked. I wouldn't be able to pay my rent. You could move in with me. Then you wouldn't have to worry about rent. You could find modeling jobs in the Phoenix area. She stopped packing. Are you asking me to move in with you? As a roommate, he clarified. I'm not asking for commitment. I'm just asking you to consider us a possibility. His eyes rested on her, looking dark and intense. I'm not saying this right. I meant to ask you out on the terrace under the stars. Or at least in between kisses on the couch. But now you're in here packing very intently. And all I can think of is how much I don't want you to leave. Do you really want to go? She didn't. But that didn't mean she could just abandon all her obligations. She wasn't quite that rash. She didn't answer. Instead, she looked at the red miniskirt in her hands, the one she'd bought with him that first night in Flagstaff. He took a step into the room. Only one step, like she was a horse that might spook and bolt. If you'd feel more comfortable in an apartment somewhere nearby, I could help you find one. Maybe you could find something nearby. I'd pay your first month's rent and security deposit if you needed it. Saying yes would be so easy. Yes was on the tip of her impulsive tongue. Was this how things started between her mother and her many boyfriends? Men bent over backward to make her happy and she simply let them. Taking advantage of them must not have seemed like such a bad thing when they were so eager to help. Liam had known Scarlet for two weeks and was offering her living accommodations. She folded the skirt nearly twisting it into a roll. I already have my flights and hotel booked. I have to go. When will you be back? Beginning of February. You can move to Arizona after that. She bit her lip, dropped the skirt into her suitcase, and picked up the cashmere sweater from the drawer. Every sensible part of her brain was telling her to refuse. She folded the sweater remembering how she'd worn it during their first kiss. And now she'd think of Liam every time she put it on. He sauntered across the room, his eyes on her. He didn't speak. When he reached her, he took the sweater from her hands, tossed it into her suitcase, and pulled her to him. He ran his fingers through her hair, tilting her face to him. Being sensible was overrated. She shut her eyes, and his lips came down on hers. Usually, his kisses started out with soft caresses. His mouth would linger on hers so lightly, so tentatively, that half the time she ended up pulling him closer to intensify the kiss herself. This time, there was no slow burn buildup, no teasing. His lips were urgent, and his message was clear. He didn't want her to go, and was proving that with very little effort. He could make her want to stay. And she did want to stay. One of his hands remained tangled in her hair, 
The other ran down her back, as though he was trying to mold her to him. Her arms wound around his neck, and she thought about how hard it would be to leave tomorrow. His mouth moved to her neck. She took jagged breaths. They were alone in Liam's house. Turned out Grandma was right about temptation. This could turn very serious, very quickly. She must have stiffened and pulled away a little. He lifted his head, sighed, and rested his forehead against hers. Just promise me you'll think about moving to Scottsdale. I'll think about it. With a kiss like that, how could she think about much else? When Scarlett returned to L.A., she figured her head would clear at least a little of the infatuation she felt toward Liam. Instead, the opposite happened. She missed him. She video-called him every evening. Things got worse when she flew to Berlin. The country was eight hours ahead of Arizona, so by the time he got off work, it was between one and two in the morning her time. After two days of nothing but texting, she went into withdrawal and stayed up late to talk to him. She was so tired during the next day's fashion shows, she could have strolled off the runway. Instead of going to any of the after parties, she went back to the hotel and napped so she could get up later and spend way too much time talking to him. He looked just as adorable on the screen as he did in real life, and his voice had a soothing cadence. She couldn't see his arms without thinking of how they'd felt around her. Going to Paris the next week made her miss him even more. She was alone in the city of love. But moving to Arizona was such a big commitment, and the fact that Liam was willing to pay for an apartment made her feel worse about it. She couldn't help but remember a time when her mother's car broke down, and her then-boyfriend, in a grand romantic gesture, had bought her a car. He drove it into their driveway with a big white bow on top, pink slip included. Her mother clapped her hands together in delight, threw her arms around him and gave him a long kiss the very picture of love and appreciation. Scarlet watched from the window, shook her head, and thought, how does she live with herself after using men that way? Because Scarlet knew the relationship wouldn't last, and it didn't. The guy never even made it to engaged status. Her mother drove the car for five more years anyway. Scarlet always felt a little tainted while riding in it. So how could she take Liam's money when they'd been together less than a month? He didn't know what he was doing any more than car boyfriend did. Liam was infatuated with her. That was all. And she was infatuated with him. But you couldn't let infatuation make your long-term decisions. Camden, much to Scarlett's surprise, kept commenting on her photos on social media. His comments were pretty benign and generic. Things like, Looking good. And so glad we were able to reconnect over Christmas. How was she supposed to respond? On the surface, he was just being nice. If she ignored him, he might tell her aunt and grandmother that Scarlet was holding a grudge against him. Her relatives would feel obligated to smooth things out. But Scarlet didn't want to be friendly. He might misconstrue that as holding a torch. The torch was so out. She usually liked his comments, or wrote thanks and hoped he'd stop. He didn't. When she flew home from Europe, instead of going to Arizona like Liam suggested, she returned to her apartment in California. A vase full of flowers was waiting for her in the middle of the kitchen table, like a shrine. A beautiful bouquet of pink roses and lilies. The card read, I hope these brighten your day as much as you brighten mine. Liam. As she cooed over them, her roommate strode into the kitchen. Girl, one said, snatch that guy before someone else does. Yeah, her other roommate agreed. I'd snatch him myself if I had half a chance. It's hard to find a guy who's handsome, romantic, and not a total player. From now on, instead of going clubbing, I'm going to hang around dental schools. They had a point. 
Liam was a catch. She'd thought a lot about Liam's pronouncement that her fear of making mistakes was paralyzing her into inaction. He was right about that. If she needed more proof, she only had to look at the bed frame she'd bought at a flea market a year ago. Solid wood, beautiful design, but the head and footboard were faded to the point of needing to be refinished or painted. She'd planned on painting it. The problem was she hadn't been able to decide on a color. She'd bought multiple samples of colors, painted pieces of paper and placed them on the wall near her bed to see which would match the rest of the decor best. Instead of choosing one, she wondered if white would be better and bought three more samples. One with a gray tint matched her bedroom walls best. Using that one would only be a good choice if she was planning on staying in this apartment for a while. And she didn't know if she was. She wasn't willing to make that sort of commitment for a paint color. So the bed had sat in her room, faded and worn looking for an entire year. The paint samples taped to the wall looked like she was trying to create some sort of hanging paper quilt. Her wavering around the color chart was ridiculous. She could trust her judgment, make a decision, and move forward with her life. To prove this, she found a muted blue that looked great on furniture online, bought a quart, and painted the bed frame. The blue looked darker than she'd expected, and grayer. When she reassembled the bed, her roommates stood in the doorway, surveying it. Neither of her roommates said anything, which wasn't a good sign. There was no avoiding what her eyes told her. The color wasn't supposed to be battleship gray. It hadn't looked gray on the paint sample or photos. Why did her bed look like something that belonged in a shabby chic prison cell? You could get a new comforter to warm it up, her roommate suggested. With the right styling, you won't notice the color that much. Or you could always repaint it, the other said, meaning the only way to mitigate her mistake was to spend more time and money. Scarlet's stomach sank miserably. After a year of deliberating and two days of painting, she'd gotten the color wrong. This didn't seem like a good omen when it came to choosing men or making major life decisions. She didn't pack up her things or cancel her lease, and she held off on flying to Arizona until February 6th. She went out that early because Liam claimed his mother had last-minute details she needed to go over. And besides, by that point, Scarlet was craving Liam so badly she'd stopped caring about common sense. When she saw him waiting for her in the Phoenix airport, tall, broad-shouldered, and making everyone around him suffer by comparison. Her breath hitched inside her chest. She'd known he was handsome before, but somehow had never appreciated just how handsome until this moment. He was scanning the crowd for her, and when his eyes found her, he smiled his perfect smile. Warmth zinged through her. She threw her arms around him and kissed him like they'd been away for years instead of a few weeks. She and Liam were no longer unchaperoned at his townhouse, which was perhaps a good thing. Several of Liam's relatives on his mom's side had flown out early to have a mini reunion and spend some time in 70-degree Phoenix weather before heading up to Flagstaff for the wedding. Liam's aunt and uncle were staying in his second guest room. His grandparents and another aunt and uncle were at his mother's and father's homes. Liam's mother had a big dinner, and his family was so welcoming. Scarlet felt like some sort of con artist building false expectations. Liam didn't seem as bothered by their deception. He acted the part of the happy groom all too well. But at night, when Scarlet lay in bed, her stomach kept clenching. She'd only intended for her grandmother and a few others to know about the wedding, and instead Liam's entire family was involved. They'd flown out. His mother had done so much work. It had all spun so wildly out of control. Well, this is what she got for trying to top Jane with her own engagement announcement. Karma, it turned out, was real and had a wicked sense of humor. 
Scarlett and Liam planned to go up to Flagstaff three days before the wedding so she'd have some time to spend with her grandmother before they got caught up in the wedding schedule. On the day before they left, the two ran errands with his mother. After they picked up table centerpieces, the group went to the courthouse to get the marriage license. At first, Scarlett hadn't planned on having a real license. She figured she'd be able to print a fake one online somewhere. But the real ones, it turned out, used special paper and red and blue coloring that were hard to reproduce. So, in order to make sure their marriage wasn't legal, they would rely on the fake priest, who had no authority to perform marriages, and the fact that he wouldn't turn the marriage license back into the courthouse to be recorded. Still, as the clerk handed Scarlet the certificate, she felt as though she was holding something precarious and solemn, something woven with unspoken implications, with sacrifices, vulnerability, and late nights walking babies. How did anyone take this sort of plunge knowing that 50% of marriages ended in divorce? Would anyone invest years, money, energy, and their very heart in any other venture with such poor odds? If she walked up to strangers and told them, let me flip a coin, and if it lands on heads, you'll be relatively happy. But if the coin lands on tails, you'll be heartbroken, miserable, and most likely financially strapped for a while. If you have kids, be prepared to live with the guilt of ripping their lives apart. Who would willingly flip that coin? What were all those coin tossers lining up in the clerk's office thinking? Well, she knew. Because every evening when Liam kissed her goodnight, she lost all reasoning ability and most conscious thought. When her arms were wrapped around him, she was such a coin tosser. It was only during the light of day when there was space between her and Liam that sanity returned, and she needed to hold on to that sanity. The group left the clerk's office and made their way down the hallway. Mrs. Brooks opened the clasp on the wedding binder she carried and held out her hand to Scarlet. I'll keep the license with the important documents. Her outstretched hand didn't really offer much choice, but Scarlet hesitated. Was it wise to let the all-powerful document of life-changing commitment out of her hand? She forced a laugh. Don't worry, we won't lose it. Of course not, but you'll both have lots of things on your mind. Last-minute problems always pop up. A bridesmaid's car breaks down, the knife to cut the cake disappears, the flower order turns up short. Trust me, the fewer things you have to concern yourselves about, the better. She smiled at Scarlet and Liam graciously, like one bestowing a gift. The two of you should only have to worry about showing up and looking radiant. Scarlet couldn't argue with that. She handed Mrs. Brooks the certificate. Liam's mother slid it into her binder. On your big day, let your family take care of everything. They'd reached the door to the street, and Liam opened it for them. The sunshine in Scottsdale was so warm and crisp. It was hard to remember that they would be in Flagstaff soon, where winter was still in full swing. That reminds me, Mrs. Brooks pulled out her phone. I assume your mother will help you into your wedding dress. She never responded to the schedule I sent. Not really a surprise. My mother is late a lot, so if she doesn't show up on time, my sisters will handle getting me ready. Liam's mom's head was down, texting. It's a special day for your mom, too. I wouldn't want her to miss anything. We've got a little wiggle room built into the schedule if we need to wait for her. Liam's mom was so accommodating, so supportive. She was a sharp contrast to Scarlett's mom, whose contact about the wedding mostly consisted of checking to see if it was still on. What has Liam told you about my mother? Liam took Scarlett's hand. Nothing that would get me in trouble for gossiping. It's not gossip, Scarlett said. If it's in the form of a warning, she cleared her throat. My mother has a lot of beliefs that are sort of out there, and she'll relentlessly share them with you if you happen to stumble onto the wrong subject. 
I suggest staying away from horoscopes, crystals, positive affirmations, or uttering the words, who do you really think built the pyramids? Mrs. Brooks flipped through screens on her phone, distracted by some messages. I meet all sorts of people in my charity work. I'm sure we'll get along fine. They might, or they might not. Her mother might. Scarlet paused to imagine the worst thing her mother could do at the wedding. Coming up with a horrible scenario didn't take long. She gasped the word, Oh! And her pace automatically slowed. Liam's head snapped to her. What's the matter? Scarlet bit her lip. Grandma told my mom that your parents are separated. She didn't want my mom to make the same sort of mistake she did by saying the wrong thing. That's fine, Mrs. Brooks said with only a little stiffness in her voice. I don't mind that people know. That was only because Mrs. Brooks didn't know her mother. Scarlet almost couldn't form the words to say more. And maybe she was worrying about nothing. But her mother did have a track record. Scarlet turned her attention to Liam and lowered her voice. Your father isn't in a vulnerable state of mind, is he? Where he'd be susceptible to a beautiful woman flirting with him. Liam's eyebrows raised. Do you think? But your mother is engaged. Yeah, and the fact that it's her sixth time says something about how seriously she takes those sort of commitments. Mrs. Brooks slowed, her gaze finally lifting from her phone. Are you saying your mother would hit on my husband? Not absolutely, Scarlet hedged, fiddling with her ring. But maybe. Even as Scarlet said the words, she thought about the guy her mom dated after stepdad number three. 3.5, Scarlet referred to him. Their engagement lasted a month before her mother called it off. She kept the ring, of course. Hopefully, my mother really loves Benito and won't look twice at anyone else. But Liam's father does have the quality my mother finds most attractive in a man. A large bank account. Really? Mrs. Brooks sputtered in amazement. She took a deep breath to regain her composure. Her pace picked up again, sharp staccato steps. I'm sure it won't matter. Rodney and I have an understanding. While we're in counseling and legally married, we'll have no romantic contact with anyone else. However, she opened her binder. I'm still going to change the seating arrangements at the wedding dinner. That was probably for the best. Chapter 16 While Liam put their suitcases in the car for their trip to Flagstaff, Scarlet asked, Are you sure you want to spend extra time with my mother? She wasn't even sure she wanted to spend extra time with her mother. I want to spend extra time with you. But your family... Liam's gaze turned to her, and it was all smolder. I'd rather be with my beautiful future wife, practicing our wedding gifts. She laughed to cover her rising blush. This sort of flirting, of pretending, was dangerous when the two of them were going through the motions of a wedding. All the preparations, their family coming in, it had created an intimacy that was getting easier and easier to be sucked into. She and Liam needed to slow things down and put up some barriers, especially since they were going to Cancun together after the wedding. I'm not really your future wife, she reminded him. He shut the car's trunk. You don't know that. You could be. We're dating for real. The other stuff could become real, too. Liam was looking at her with stars in his eyes now, with their future in his eyes. She couldn't trust him to be the one who thought rationally about their relationship. He opened the car door for her, the smolder still going full blast. Think of how nice it would be to be together every night. So many parts of her were screaming that yes, that was exactly how she wanted to spend her nights. But most of those parts were her optimism, impulsiveness, and hormones. Definitely the hormones. 
She and Liam really hadn't known each other that long. She couldn't forget that. During the drive, Scarlet texted Hazel. Scarlet, your priest friend is ready for the wedding rehearsal on the 13th and the ceremony on the 14th, right? He's not going to bail on us if he gets a better part with a line of chorus girls somewhere else? If anyone stole Scarlet's phone and read through her texts, they would have all sorts of questions about that one. Hazel. He'll be there. He's a director, so he understands dependability. A director? Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Scarlet. He knows how to act, right? She didn't want anyone who was clearly an imposter stumbling through the actions. Hazel. Yes, he wouldn't be able to help the actors with their parts if he didn't. That was a relief. Hazel's text continued. Can Liam help Matt with family dinner set up tonight at Aunt Christina's? I scheduled you and me to make cinnamon rolls and sit with Grandma until dinner. Of course. Hazel already had a schedule in place. Scarlet broke the news to Liam that he'd been volunteered to put leaves into Aunt Christina's dining room table, haul chairs in from her garage, and anything else she might need. He didn't mind. Liam had reserved a room at the hotel his family would be staying at when they came up. Scarlet, her mother, Vi, and Trevor were taking Grandma's guest rooms. Before checking in, Liam drove Scarlet to her grandmother's house. The Christmas decorations were gone, and the snow blanketing her yard wasn't the new fallen soft and sparkly sort. It was the old, crusty sort, tramped on and tinged gray from street sludge. Scarlet hesitated before getting out of the car. You're not going to judge me by my mother, are you? No. You don't judge me by my parents, do you? It wouldn't matter if I did. Your parents are normal. At least they had been since their performance on Christmas Day. They'd taken their promise not to fight seriously, which either showed a lot of self-discipline or maybe, hopefully their relationship was improving. Most of the time, Scarlet would have forgotten they were separated. Although sometimes, Mrs. Brooks seemed pointedly distant from her husband. Her gaze didn't go to Mr. Brooks nearly as much as his went to her. I won't judge you by your mother, Liam repeated. He got out of the car, came around to her side, and opened her door. Maybe because she still showed no signs of getting out, he leaned toward her and lowered his voice. You know, with all the build-up you've given her, I'm going to be disappointed if she doesn't recognize me from a past life. Well, chances were about 50-50 for that happening. Scarlet trudged out of the car. While Liam got her suitcase from the trunk, she took her dress bag out of the back seat. She wasn't sure why she dreaded introducing her mother to Liam. He would be understanding and Scarlet's mother was bound to approve of Liam, despite her disapproval of their rushed nuptials. Liam was everything a woman could ask for. Still, she felt like a child, unwillingly carrying a balloon toward a cactus. Scarlet and Liam made their way to the house and went inside. Hello, Scarlet called. Vi and Trevor wouldn't be in until late tonight, but her mother ought to be around. Hazel might be over, too. Her mother immediately appeared in the entryway to greet them. Her dark hair was pulled back in a knot, and she wore a pair of black jeans and a fluffy cream sweater that she somehow made look chic. Scarlet had been communicating with her mother over video for so long, she'd forgotten the striking contrast her mother's eyes made, gray-blue against all of that dark hair. Scarlet saw her mother as Liam must be seeing her for the first time, and more importantly, how Liam's father would see her. High cheekbones, smooth skin, and thick black lashes emphasizing her already large eyes. An ageless beauty, that's what people called her. See, she wanted to tell Liam, this is what I've been talking about. All of those husbands make sense now, don't they? Her mother smiled glided over and hugged Scarlet. A fleeting hug. That was another thing she remembered about her mother. You could never lean into one of her hugs, because after two seconds, she was on to another task. 
her mother surveyed Scarlet. I blinked and you grew up. How did that happen? It happened because she hadn't paid attention to her daughters for years. Scarlet didn't say that, of course. She did want to get along with her mother. Her mother eyed Liam next, but if she was impressed by his good looks and height, she didn't let it show. She gave him an even briefer hug. Liam, I'm pleased to finally meet you. She was pleased, it turned out, because meeting him gave her a chance to grill him. After Scarlet and Liam took her things to her room, they went to the living room where her mother was waiting to get to know him. This involved asking so many questions about Liam's background, family, schooling, hobbies, and future plans, anyone would have thought she was looking to hire him for a classified government position, not welcome him to the family. Liam answered her without any difficulty. That was the benefit of going through life like he had. Smart, responsible, well-rounded, and with the proverbial silver spoon tucked away among his possessions. He was cultured and charming. There was no way her mother could disapprove of him. And yet, a minute after Scarlet had shown Liam out, her mother descended on her. I'm not sure about him. Balloon meets cactus. Oh, this is what Scarlet was worried would happen. Her mother was trying to pop her happiness. Why not? He's too good to be true. That was her complaint? Instead of being insulted, Scarlet smiled and felt reassured. Dreamy, really. I know, right? Isn't he amazing? She wandered away from the front door. Most guys who are that handsome and smart are also really arrogant and treat women like they're expendable, but he's so down-to-earth and sweet. They all start out treating you well. Her mother put her hand on Scarlet's arm to stop her progress. She looked at Scarlet with the intensity of someone imparting a piece of painful but necessary truth. If a guy has super high standards for himself... You can bet he wants a perfect wife. And he'll become frustrated when you don't match his version of perfection. Scarlet's head snapped back. Are you saying I'm not good enough for him? Even after one short meeting, her mother didn't think Liam could possibly see Scarlet as perfect for him? That's not what I mean. Her mother curved her hands through the air as though summoning something. I'm just saying that a lot of men who date gorgeous women never see past their looks. They're so captivated by beauty, they think attraction is love. They don't bother to find out if you're actually compatible until it's too late. She let out a sigh filled with wistful regret. Why do you think so many of my marriages failed? Well... Scarlet had always supposed it was because her mother liked looking for greener pastures more than working on relationships. But now her mother's words had an uncomfortable ring of truth. Scarlet couldn't help but review her mother's history, seeing it differently this time. Her mother's boyfriends had the habit of falling for her hard and fast, a sign they'd been enamored with her beauty first. Maybe that sort of blindness prevented them from really knowing her until the honeymoon was over. Maybe her mother hadn't always stopped loving her husbands first. Maybe some of them never really loved her to begin with. It was such a tragic thought. Her mother falling in love with men who never saw the real her. And yet, an irrational pulse of anger swept through Scarlet. If you knew men were only falling in love with your looks... Why did you keep making the same mistake over and over again? Her mother shrugged, unbothered by the accusation. Figuring it out took me a while. When a man adores you, you don't question the basis of his adoration. You don't assume he's only tolerating your personality, or that he's imagined you are completely different than you really are. She sniffed. At least not until he starts trying to change you. They all do that, too. Like Liam had made her sign up for college classes. 
but he'd done that to help and encourage Scarlet. Not because he was trying to mold her into someone she wasn't. He wasn't doing that. Was he? Maybe he was. He'd already admitted that he went for the brainy girls. Scarlet's mother turned to her, her eyes filled with concern. I don't want you to make the same mistakes I have. You're so beautiful, honey. She said the phrase mournfully, as though proclaiming her doomed. Liam may say he loves you, but has he had enough time to really know who you are? The words hit Scarlet like a slap, because this was no longer about the fake relationship. Liam hadn't said he loved her, but she'd felt that phrase in his kiss, in the way he looked at her, in the way he kept asking her to move to Scottsdale. And she'd thought she was falling in love with him too. But her mother might be right. Probably was. What Liam felt for her wasn't love. He didn't know her well enough for that. It was only attraction. Pretty soon he'd wake up and see that she was just someone who had no idea what she wanted to do with her life. Not a success. Not good wife material. Not the type to have his children. He wouldn't want her anymore. He'd tactfully but firmly break things off. And she'd be devastated at the rejection. Her mother was still watching her, waiting for an answer. Scarlet couldn't bring herself to lie or admit that her mother might have a point. It's a little late for this conversation. I'm getting married in three days. I just don't want you to get hurt. Her mother put her hands on Scarlet's shoulders, her expression intent. Whatever happens in your future, honey, you should know one thing. She's going to tell me she loves me no matter what, Scarlet thought, and felt herself softening toward her mother. If it doesn't work out, her mother said, I won't tell you I told you so. You can come to me, and I'll help you out. That was how her mother was going to be supportive? By helping her after her marriage failed? Was that really something you should tell your daughter right before the wedding? Scarlet couldn't even think of a retort. She wanted to say, just because your marriage has failed doesn't mean mine will. But she couldn't say any of that because, in all probability, she was destined to run off with a pool boy. She didn't want to say any words she'd have to eat later, so she just stared, blinking in astonishment. Her mother kissed her on the cheek, oblivious to Scarlet's thoughts, and drifted off to the kitchen. Fine. Whatever. Scarlet tromped down the hallway to her grandmother's room. She wasn't going to let herself think about the implications of what her mother had said. At least not now. She needed to act happy for her grandmother. She slipped into her grandmother's room. Hazel was there, sitting with Grandma, an old picture album open on the bed between them. Hazel was writing in a notebook on her lap, probably making notes about the pictures. Only a month and a half had passed since Scarlet had seen her grandmother, and yet she'd changed. Her skin seemed pale and blotchy, waxy almost. I heard you stomping down the hallway, Grandma said. Nothing wrong with her hearing. So I guess you've been talking to your mother. Scarlet slumped down on the couch next to Hazel and folded her arms. How many unsuccessful marriages does a person need to have before they're not allowed to give anyone else relationship advice? Grandma laughed. She's your mother. It's her job to give you unsolicited advice. What if she's right? Scarlet wanted to ask. What if Liam was only drawn to her because of her looks? She couldn't worry her grandmother, though, so she said nothing else about their conversation. A little while later, Scarlet's mother came in to join the group. The conversation was all about the pictures in the album, family stories, dates and places, relatives that Scarlet didn't remember, 
or had never met. Finally, Hazel glanced at her watch, and with a jolt of surprise that was always especially unpleasant for the organized, announced that the time had slipped away from her and the cinnamon rolls were going to be late. Scarlet stood to help her sister, but her mother insisted that since Scarlet had just arrived, she should spend more time with Grandma. Mom would help Hazel. After 45 minutes, Hazel came back to Grandma's room to relieve Scarlet so she could get ready for dinner. By that time, Grandma was asleep. Scarlet stayed on the couch by her bed for a few more moments anyway. Grandmother's breaths were shallow. Are you sure she's up to dinner at Aunt Christina's? Scarlet asked. She looked so frail. When she wakes up, I'll ask her. If she feels up to it, I'll help her dress. If not, I'll stay with her. Either way, we're going to be 15 minutes late. The cinnamon rolls won't be out of the oven until 6.10. I've already texted Aunt Christina to let her know, and Mom left with a spinach dip and vegetable tray so people can start on the appetizers. She motioned for Scarlet to switch her places. When the buzzer goes off, turn on the oven to 350 and set the timer for 22 minutes. Scarlet stood up from the couch. Thanks for everything you do for Grandma. You'd do the same if you lived here. Scarlet shuffled to the door and turned back to Hazel. Should I move closer? I mean, would that be helpful to everyone? She didn't say more in case her grandmother woke up and heard the conversation. Hazel knew what she was talking about. Scarlet had told her Liam wanted her to move to Scottsdale. I want to help you out, Scarlet added. And who knows how much time Grandma has left. I'd be able to see her more if I was closer. Hazel cocked an eyebrow. You shouldn't make that decision based on Grandma. You should make that decision based on you and Liam. Yeah, maybe Scarlet was looking for excuses to be near him. She nodded and went to the kitchen to watch the timer, check email, and obsess about her mother's words and her future. She flipped through her phone and looked at pictures of her and Liam in Scottsdale and Flagstaff. Unfortunately, a picture of her two gray bed frame also sat in her gallery. After the roll started cooking, Scarlet decided to go to her room and get a book for the remainder of the time. She was about to head upstairs when she heard the front door open. Hazel wasn't leaving with Grandma, was she? Scarlet had assumed they'd go together. She hurried that way and turned the corner to see Camden strolling inside. His brown hair was perfectly in place. He wore a black bomber jacket, open at the front, to show that he was too stylish to be cold. He carried a couple of sleeves of soda tucked under one arm and another balanced against his chest. When he saw her, his face lit up with a smile. Had he ever been that happy to see her in high school? She couldn't remember, but his happiness seemed a wasted reaction now. And here's Miss Fanta, he said, just in time to help me with the soda. She had no idea why he was bringing soda over here. But then, for all she knew, Grandma was on a soda binge, or she thought the rest of the family would be. Scarlet took one of the sleeves from him. He winked at her. Let's put this in the kitchen. He headed that way, and she followed. As they passed by the empty living room and dining room, he asked, where is everyone? They're at Aunt Christina's. They left for dinner already. She'd expected he would be there as well. They reached the kitchen. Scarlet set her sleeve of soda on the counter. Oh, I guess I'm misunderstood. Camden set his soda next to hers. I thought dinner was here. He didn't seem the least bit upset to have driven to the wrong place. His expression was self-satisfied cocky even, and instead of picking up the soda and leaving, he glanced around the kitchen, taking in the bag of flour on the countertop and the mixing bowls in the sink. How come you're not here with Dr. Proctologist? Scarlet chose to ignore that comment. Really, she'd be glad when her wedding was over and she wouldn't have to see Camden again until his wedding. I'm waiting for the cinnamon rolls to finish cooking. She wandered over to check the timer. They've got 12 more minutes. They smell delicious already. 
Liam didn't want to wait with you. Camden made a tisking noise. That's not very gentlemanly. He went over early with Matt to set up. She wondered, but didn't ask why Camden hadn't been there helping too. Camden leaned against the counter and tilted his head, making a show of considering her. About Liam. Are you sure you should marry him? I don't think you are. She resisted the urge to grind her teeth. Liam's family was so nice and supportive. Why couldn't her family, and in this case her cousin's fiancé, be the same way? Why wouldn't I be sure? You didn't answer the question. Are you 100% sure? She hesitated, automatically thinking of her insecurities about men. I'm as sure as I'll ever be. Probably the truth. She was never going to be sure. Camden shrugged, and even that looked cocky. I've known you for a long time, Red. I can tell when you're not being honest, even if you're only being dishonest with yourself. Another shrug. This one looked calculated. I've got to say, what you and Liam have doesn't seem very real. Scarlet's breath caught in her throat. Did he know the truth, somehow? And if he did, what was he going to do about it? She didn't reply, just stared at him trying to discern his intentions. He pushed away from the counter and stepped closer to her. I've never pictured you with someone like Liam. The guy scowls all the time. Camden didn't know, he just didn't approve of Liam. Scarlet let out her breath. That's just Liam's reaction to you. He smiles at everyone else. Camden seemed to take this as a compliment. One eyebrow lifted, happily. He sees me as a rival. Why is that? It's not rivalry. You just made a bad first impression with your proctology jokes. Camden sauntered closer. So close he could have reached out and touched her. Or maybe he realizes you still have feelings for me. Your grandmother told me that after high school. You never had any serious boyfriends. I have to ask myself why that is. That's what this discussion was about? She edged away from him. I dated. I just didn't find anyone I wanted a relationship with. I don't have feelings for you. Seriously, Camden seemed so self-absorbed. Camden rocked back on his heels, undeterred. His gaze was still on her. Well, that's good to know. Because you shouldn't marry one person when you still have feelings for someone else. Right. She took another step away from him. Camden made no move to come after her. He slid his hands into his jacket pockets. A picture of such casualness that she wondered if she'd misread his intentions. Was he coming on to her or simply concerned about her marrying a man she didn't love? Certainly, he wouldn't be hitting on her when he was engaged to her cousin. He had to know that Scarlet would tell Jane if he did anything inappropriate. Camden smiled at her. I still need to make up for breaking your heart in high school. If you recall, I gave you a suggestion about inheriting the house, but you ignored it. She went to the oven to check the time. Eleven minutes left. Only one minute had gone by? It seemed so much longer. And I gave you a suggestion that you ignored as well. She tapped the oven clock. It didn't appear to be broken. I don't remember you suggesting anything. I offered to make it up to you with more bad behavior. She turned away from the oven. Oh, that's why I didn't remember. It wasn't a good suggestion. You don't have to make up anything to me. You already apologized, so we're good. Actually, I didn't apologize, but I should. Camden stretched his hands out on either side, presenting himself. I should tell you that I didn't realize when I had a good thing. I'd forgotten how beautiful you are. I forgot how much I missed you. Yeah, that was definitely flirting. Is this still an apology? Because it feels more like a come on. And this meeting had just gotten really awkward. 
Hopefully now that she'd called him out, he'd back off. He strolled toward her, his eyes intense. I know you want this house. I can make it happen. The quick change of subject made her cough. What? I could convince Jane that the house isn't right for us. I'll tell her that something in a more exclusive neighborhood would be better. But you'll need to make it worth my while. Scarlet folded her arms and narrowed her eyes. How would I do that? He was standing close enough that it took no time for him to put his hands on her shoulders and pull her toward him. That's how he wanted her to make it worth his while? No, absolutely not. As his lips reached for hers, she pushed against his chest and broke his grip. She staggered backwards so angry she could barely speak. You're engaged to my cousin. No guilt swept across his features. Not much discouragement either. And once I get you out of my system, we'll both be able to move forward. You've got to feel that way, too. She needed a rolling pin, something heavy to smack him with if he came after her again. She turned to dart around him and stopped short. Hazel had wheeled their grandmother to the kitchen door, and both women gaped at them, open-mouthed. I doubt, Grandma said, glaring daggers, that Jane would approve of your methods. Scarlet gulped. How much had her grandmother seen and heard? I wasn't a part of that. Even as Scarlet said the words, she knew they didn't make sense. She should have clarified, but Camden spoke at the same time. This isn't what it looks like. In a lower voice, he hissed. You said everyone was gone. Like that mattered. Young man. Grandma gripped her armrest so tightly, her hands went white. Her blue veins looked like lightning bolts running up her arms. I may be old, but I'm not deaf and blind. I heard you use my house to proposition one of my granddaughters to cheat on another. I suggest you tell Jane tonight that you're not ready to move forward with your marriage. If I'm the one to break the news to her... I'll do it much more bluntly. Camden's gaze went from Grandma to Hazel's equally icy stare. A red flush crept up his neck and face. Without another word, he stalked to the kitchen door and stormed outside. The door slammed behind him. Good riddance. Scarlet's hands trembled with shock, with rage. Camden had tried to kiss her. Worse, he thought she could be bought. Just as insulting, he hadn't wanted to end his relationship with Jane. Scarlet wasn't worth that to him. He'd only wanted a fling to get Scarlet out of his system. She was only worth an affair. It was so low, so creepy. I didn't encourage any of that, she said. I know, dear. Grandma reached out to her, beckoning to her. The nerve of that man using my house. My house, for his own twisted purposes. For a moment, Scarlet wished she could crawl into her grandmother's lap, like she had when she'd gotten hurt as a child. She couldn't do that now, so she went over and took her grandmother's hand. The implications of the last few minutes kept tallying up in her mind, growing weightier. I ruined Jane's marriage, Scarlet said bleakly. No. Hazel came around the wheelchair to give Scarlet a hug. Camden ruined Jane's marriage. You saved her from making a mistake. Marrying him would be a huge mistake. Scarlet melted into her sister's hug. Hazel was right. But still, Scarlet felt tainted somehow. At fault. After all, she joked with Liam about taking Camden away from Jane. Scarlet knew it wasn't logical, but she couldn't shake the feeling that her words had summoned up that particular fate. Jane's going to be so hurt. Jane had always seemed too successful to become a victim of the pain of disappointment. She was too smart, too favored, and too haughty for that. And yet, as Scarlet stood in the kitchen, 
she realized just how human Jane was. The inevitable breakup of her engagement brought Scarlett no satisfaction. Just pity. Hazel released her. Eventually, Jane will realize it's for the best. Grandma patted Scarlett's hand. What happened here isn't your fault. It was clear enough you didn't want that man's attention. He should have known that all along. Anyone with eyes can see how much you love Liam. This last sentence didn't make Scarlet feel any better. If Grandma ever found out that Scarlet had lied about being engaged in order to have a better chance at inheriting her house, she'd be equally disappointed in her. Scarlet never should have done it. About the things Camden said, Scarlet mumbled. You know, about me wanting your house. I do love your house, but you ought to leave it to Hazel. Grandma glanced at Hazel, then back at Scarlet reassuringly. Don't worry about that. This house has too many good memories. For it to be ruined by one bad one, that wasn't the issue. But Scarlet didn't press it. Chapter 17 Scarlet still felt a little shaky by the time she, Hazel, and Grandma arrived at Aunt Christina's. Jane had already left, as Aunt Christina put it, to go over some wedding details with Camden. Jane didn't come back that night, so Camden probably knew that Grandma would make good on her threat. After dinner, Liam drove Scarlet back to her grandmother's house. While he walked her to the door, she told him what had happened. He listened with his jaw growing tighter. Where does Camden live? Liam asked. I want to talk to him. You don't need to talk to him. She meant there was nothing left to say. You're right. I don't want to talk to him. I want to punch him. Where does the guy live? Scarlet couldn't tell if Liam was serious. He looked serious. His hands were clenched at his side and his shoulders were tense. She shook her head. You can't get in a street brawl right before our wedding. You'll end up ruining our pictures. He let out a growling sound. You're assuming the guy will get in a shot. I doubt that. I paid a lot for the photographer, she emphasized. She'd actually gotten a photographer pretty cheaply by agreeing to do multiple shoots for the woman for free. But still, Scarlet didn't want any more drama. It's sweet that you want to defend my honor. Maybe you'll have a chance next time when my grandmother doesn't beat you to it. He didn't crack a smile. She nudged his arm. This is supposed to be a happy day. And I would be happier if I punched your ex. Liam's eyes went to hers, and some of the tension left his shoulders. But I won't. I'll just send him a threatening text, telling him to stay away from you. Consider my restraint a wedding gift to you. Thanks. She took her hand in his. Also, is giving wedding gifts to each other actually a thing? If it is a thing, I need to borrow your car and go shopping. And get a copy of your wish list. He brought her hand to his mouth and kissed her fingertips. It's a very short list. Despite his assertions that she didn't pick up on innuendo, she knew exactly what he meant. Scarlet told him goodnight and quickly retreated into the house. The next afternoon, while Scarlet and Liam were picking up his tux, Aunt Christina texted Scarlet that Jane and Camden had put their engagement on hold. He wouldn't be attending Scarlet's wedding, so he could be taken off the guest list. He'd better not show, Liam said when Scarlet read him the message, or there'll be an awkward scene in the ceremony where the groom takes out one of the guests. Remember my wedding gift, she said. I will, if you remember mine, he said. She was saved from replying because her phone dinged with another message from Aunt Christina. Jane says she won't attend the wedding either. Weddings are triggering for her right now, but she wishes you the best. Well, depending on how much Jane knew about what happened yesterday, she might wish some other things too. That evening, they went to the Mountain View Wedding and Event Center for the wedding rehearsal. The outside looked a little like a Swiss chalet with pointed roofs and curved balconies. Pine trees dotted the lawn. 
Inside, a large lobby with a sweeping staircase met them. The chapel on the left looked like it had been lifted from a Renaissance mansion, and past the lobby, tables and chairs were set up for eating. A dance floor waited next to the tables, and at the very back of the building, huge picture windows showed off the snow-covered mountains. So, the venue was probably more expensive than Mrs. Brooks had let on, and she was paying the difference because she knew Scarlet couldn't afford much. Very sweet, and another thing for Scarlet to feel guilty about. That list was becoming lengthy. The rehearsal wasn't officially supposed to start for another ten minutes, but Scarlet expected to see Father Joe in the area, waiting for them and greeting guests. He was nowhere in sight. Matt and Hazel were chatting in one corner. Vi and Trevor wandered around hand in hand looking at the decorations. Talia and her date took selfies by the staircase. Oliver, Liam's brother, stood by a picture window with his girlfriend, taking in the view of the mountains. Mrs. Brooks had her binder out and was going over some paperwork with one of the center's employees. No sign of Mr. Brooks or Scarlett's mother. But then Scarlett's mother usually ran late, so that wasn't a surprise. Scarlett and Liam joined Hazel and Matt. Where's Father Joe? Liam asked, glancing around the room. Hazel leaned forward and lowered her voice. He's in the back, rearranging parts in a play that's supposed to go on in a week. The lead actor broke his leg, so now Joe is calling understudies and shuffling around parts. She glanced at her watch. He'll be out when it's time to start. Liam nodded, satisfied. Scarlett also nodded. I always thought that the break-a-leg advice was metaphorical. Usually it is, Hazel said. Actors shouldn't be allowed to go snowboarding. Mrs. Brooks swept up to the group, dressed in a black skirt and chiffon blouse, even though the rehearsal was casual dress. A pastry crisis averted, she held up one hand. No need for you to know the details. That's why I'm here. She shuffled through some papers and paused on the wedding dinner seating list. So, besides your cousin and her date's cancellation, no new changes to the guest list? Liam slipped his arm around Scarlett's waist. I don't think there'll be any other changes. I'm going to personally ensure that no one else hits on my fiancé before the wedding. Scarlett hadn't realized that Liam had told his mother about Camden, but he must have. She showed no confusion at his statement. Mrs. Brooks slid the seating chart into the binder, tisking. Poor Jane. It must have been hard for her to ever introduce any boyfriends to Scarlett knowing that they might prefer her, and then to have it actually happen while she's engaged. Well, I don't blame her for not wanting to attend the wedding. Scarlet had never considered Jane might have felt any insecurity about anything, let alone her boyfriend's. Now she wondered if it could be true. Mrs. Brooks went back to flipping through the papers. Am I forgetting anything? Liam cleared his throat. You haven't forgotten that I'm a proctologist for the next two days, right? The papers went still. I haven't forgotten. Just like I'm not likely to forget that you let me go on and on about my book club loving your examinations. To the rest of the group, Liam said, I explained to my family how your grandmother misheard my profession and told everyone I was a proctologist and how I didn't have the heart to correct her because it's always been her dream to have a medical doctor in the family. Mrs. Brooks gave Liam the side eye and slid her papers back into the binder. I told a room full of people that my friends made up excuses to see you. She might have said more on the subject, but her gaze went to the hallway. Who's that woman who just came in? Scarlet turned to see her mother near the front door taking off her coat. Her hair was loose around her shoulders in dark waves, and a form-fitting sweater showed off her curves. That's our mom, Hazel said. Your mother, Mrs. Brooks repeated. She doesn't look old enough. This wasn't a compliment. It was a statement of bewilderment. Was she ten when she had you? She was nineteen, Hazel said. 
She got married to my dad right after high school and started having kids early. Hazel stepped away from the group. I'll show her where to put her coat. Matt followed after her. Mrs. Brooks had that look on her face that people sometimes got when they found out Scarlett's mother married at 18. She wasn't pregnant, Scarlett clarified. Just a little delusional about love conquering all. My dad joined the army and was off in other countries while she was at home raising kids. So yeah, that's why the first marriage didn't work out. Oh, Mrs. Brooks said. Scarlet tried to lighten the mood. If you tell her she looks younger than her age, she'll recite the benefits of whatever diet she's currently on and the rejuvenating power of magnets. Mrs. Brooks didn't take her eyes off of Scarlet's mother. Her mother peeled off her gloves and placed them in her coat pocket with the grace of royalty. Mrs. Brooks pursed her lips with such disapproval that Scarlet nearly took offense on her mother's behalf. I can't believe this, Mrs. Brooks muttered. I'm an absolute advocate of women's empowerment, of judging ourselves by our hearts, not our looks. I've always said I would grow old gracefully, but after one look at your mother... I'm wondering what a plastic surgeon could do for me. You don't need a plastic surgeon, Liam assured her. You're beautiful the way you are. Mrs. Brooks made a humph sound. Scarlet's mom could be Natalie Portman's sister. I'll look dumpy in the wedding pictures by comparison. No, you won't. Liam's smile turned into a smirk. Because you can ask the photographer to Photoshop your pictures any way you want. Mrs. Brooks humphed again, this time at her son. Hazel reached their mother, hugged her, and gestured across the room to where a large coat closet waited. At that moment, Mr. Brooks came up behind them. He wore khaki pants and a white shirt under his jacket, as though, like his wife, he couldn't bring himself to wear jeans, even to a casual event. He said something to Hazel, and she turned, spoke to him for a few seconds, and introduced him to their mother. He'd been carrying his key fob and slipped it into his pocket to shake her hand. Scarlet's mom may not have noticed the Cadillac logo on it, but then again, she might have. The smile she gave him while they shook hands was a Cadillac smile. I ought to go meet your mother, Mrs. Brooks said stiffly and marched across the room. By the time she reached the group, her stiffness was gone. She was all warmth and smiles, especially to Mr. Brooks. She slid her arm through his as though they were sweethearts. Mr. Brooks perked up at his wife's attention. He looked positively happy. So things were going well on that front. Maybe something good really will come of this wedding, Scarlet said. Liam took her hand in his. Maybe multiple good things. His thumb caressed the back of her hand. Just that little, intimate touch sent shivers down her back. The two of us being together? That's a good thing. It is. His thumb was making circles along her hand. She couldn't help but notice how nice he smelled. That cologne was always going to remind her of kissing him while the snow swirled around them. You know, he murmured, we could make another change to the ceremony and get a real priest. Her gaze flew to his, expecting to see some sign he was teasing. No humor was there. His brown eyes showed only earnestness. Her heart stuttered and froze. Wait, are you proposing? He didn't break her gaze. Yeah, turns out I can do impetuous after all. She didn't respond couldn't. Marriage wasn't something either of them could afford to be impetuous about. His lips quirked at the sides. I would pull out an engagement ring at this point, but you're already wearing it. She glanced around to make sure they were still alone. Her heart was beating so loudly, she was afraid everyone in the vicinity would hear it. Fortunately, no one was approaching or paying attention to them. We can't get married, she whispered. We've known each other for less than two months. And yet I'm still certain it's right. I'm in love with you, Scarlet. Her head was making little shaking motions of its own accord. It's not love. 
It's just infatuation. Because I'm pretty. My mother even said so. Well, that's one more thing your mother is wrong about. He pulled her closer and his voice dropped to an urgent whisper. Don't you think I've dated other beautiful women? I never wanted any of them before. You're like sunshine. I could live without it if I had to. But I really don't want to. It was the most romantic thing anyone had ever said to her. Enough to daze her. Enough to sway her when she shouldn't be swayed. Less than two months. Getting married tomorrow would be crazy. She stared at him, eyes wide, trying to cobble together enough resolve to shoot down the idea. What's the point of going back to California, he said, when we've got a wedding planned? And I know you love me too. That was... Well, she wasn't sure what that was. Overconfidence or an indication that he was seeing what he wanted to see, just like her mother had predicted. How can you know I love you when I'm not even 100% certain? How can anyone know for sure? Granted, Scarlet suspected, strongly, that she was in love with Liam. But her mother had believed she'd been in love multiple times. Liam's lips pressed together as though he was considering the questions. I can read the signs. His thumb was back to caressing her hand. For example, you text me every day, and when we talk on the phone, you don't want to hang up. I've always been social. I like to talk. You enjoy kissing me. You're a good kisser. Most women would enjoy kissing you. You paid a fashion designer to sew me scrubs with European flair. Scarlet had done that while she was in Paris. I'm a considerate person. You think about me whenever we're apart. She cocked her head. How did you know that? She'd never admitted this to him. He smiled. Because I feel the same. And I'm in love with you. Breathing was getting hard. And it wasn't the breathlessness of love. It was fear. Fear that she was hurtling toward a future where one or both of them would end up devastated. She wasn't even sure which worried her more about marriage. That she would fall out of love with him and ruin his life. Or that he would realize he had never really loved her and break her heart. It used to be the first. It was quickly becoming the second. We shouldn't rush into anything, she said. We can always get married later if things work out between us. Getting unmarried is a lot more complicated. He didn't answer. A middle-aged man in black clothes and a priest's collar strode into the room, arms open. Here are the dearly beloved. Welcome. Welcome. Sorry I'm late. I was dealing with some lost lambs. Lost and egotistical. Everyone come over. His booming voice was more than she'd expected from a priest. But perhaps that was stereotyping. Priests didn't have to be the somber sort. I'm Father Joe, he went on, taking in the crowd. I'm glad to be a part of your blessed event. No need to hang out in the back. Come, come. The last instruction was directed at Scarlet and Liam. She knew Liam wanted to continue their conversation, but the two meandered toward the forming group. Vi and Trevor reached Father Joe first. His gaze zeroed in on them, and he clapped his hands together. You must be the stars of the show. You've got that vibe that says we're ridiculously in love. Vi's cheeks went bright red. No, no, she stammered. I mean, yes. I mean, we're not the couple. Trevor laughed. But if you give group discounts, we'll consider. Several people in the crowd chuckled. Vi blushed even deeper and gestured behind her in Scarlet's direction. My sister's the one. The crowd parted to let Scarlet and Liam through to the front. Father Joe's gaze went over her. Oh, you're going to make an amazing bride. Very good. Now, on to the rehearsal. I've got it all blocked out. It's going to be fabulous. He gave them a rundown of the order they would march into the chapel. Groomsmen first, then the mothers, the bridesmaids, and last of all, the bride. 
He had put tape on the floor where they were supposed to stand so they would know their exact spots. The group ran through the walk-in once, and when they'd reached their spots, he said, Remember where your marks are because the tape won't be there tomorrow, and we need good spacing. Okay, let's take this from the top. Everyone back to your opening spots. He ran his hands upward as though lifting the air in front of him. Stand up straight, take cleansing breaths, we'll cue the music, and then it's showtime. Probably not priestly vernacular, but no one seemed to notice anything amiss. At least not until they'd run through the entrance the second time. As Scarlet took her place beside Liam, Father Joe shook his head at the crowd with disappointment. Okay, guys, that was adequate, but you can do better. There's a reason that music has a beat. It's so you know when to take a step. Make sure you hit that beat. He clapped his hands to the rhythm, repeating, step and step and step. That was when Scarlet first began to wonder if hiring a director had been a mistake. The group redid the entrance. The bridesmaids did fine. The years her sisters had spent in dance classes were finally paying off. Some of the groomsmen took steps that were too big and hesitated before they took the next. They looked worse this time than they originally had. Father Joe pressed his lips together in frustration and made the groomsmen come in a fourth time. Once he was satisfied with them, he had the whole group do the walkthrough again. They'd all been on the beat, but Father Joe put his hands on his hips and frowned. You can't pay so much attention to your footwork that you forget your bearing. This is a celebration, people. I want to see some energy, some smiles. Make the audience wish they were as cool as you. Now let's try that again. He gestured for them to take their spots. As Scarlet turned to follow the rest, Father Joe called to her. Absolutely no scowling at any time. This is the happiest day of your life. I want to see more radiance and less trepidation. Yeah, it was such a mistake to hire a director. Scarlet couldn't help but notice that Mrs. Brooks kept putting her hand to her mouth and had a sort of frowning look of horror that you might get if you ordered a steak at a restaurant and they brought you a bloody cow hoof instead. Scarlet would reassure her that everything would be fine tomorrow. Father Joe Spielberg wouldn't be directing them once the event was live. As Scarlet walked down the aisle, Mr. Brooks stepping to the beat beside her, Father Joe made swishing motions with his hands and mouthed, Radiance! Radiance! With such fervor, one would have thought her lack of acting skills was causing him physical pain. How exactly was she supposed to radiate? She smiled and glanced at the empty pews as though thanking all the guests for coming. Perhaps that was radiant enough because he didn't stop the procession to have her redo the walk of wedding glory. When she reached Liam, Father Joe instantly switched off director mode and was in character as a priest. He smiled benevolently at the two and turned his attention to the non-existent audience, nodding at them in approval. Dearly beloved, he said in a rich, sonorous voice, we are gathered here today to join these two in the order of holy matrimony. He stopped abruptly and his voice returned to normal. So that's when I give my speech, then I turn the time over to you to say your vows. You have those memorized, right? We've got them written down, Liam said. Scarlet nodded in agreement. She had hers written down, sort of. She kept changing what she wanted to say. Father Joe pushed out a breath and pinched the bridge of his nose. He didn't say the word amateurs, but Scarlet felt it burning from his eyes. He seemed to take their answer as a personal affront. After the moment it took him to regain his will to speak, he said, You've both been waiting for this day for your entire life, yes? Scarlet exchanged a look with Liam. Father Joe knew the wedding was pretend, so he must be speaking to them as an acting coach. Yes, they said simultaneously. Father Joe gestured around him. I'm sure you've dropped quite a bit of cash for this party and your family has come from far and wide to share this moment with you. He held both palms up in the air, emphasizing each word. 
You're doing this for your dying grandmother. His voice grew loud like a reprimanding teacher, or perhaps more accurately, a drama coach right before what he considered a doomed performance. Is it really too much to ask that you memorize your lines? Why does everyone put off memorizing their lines until the last minute? Hmm, apparently things were going worse for his production than Hazel had let on. Liam cleared his throat and glanced around at the uncomfortable expressions of the rest of the wedding party. More and more had that, Hey, I think we've got a bloody cow's hoof. Look. I'm sure our vows will be fine, he said firmly, whether we memorize them or not. Father Joe's nostrils flared. This is happening tomorrow. You, her, the dress, and an audience. How will you say your vows with any feeling if you have to look down and read them? Do you think any of your relatives wanted to cram into an airplane just to hear a badly performed reading of your vows? No. No, they don't. Okay, Scarlet said, trying to stop his rant. We'll memorize them. We'll do that right after the dinner. Father Joe took a deep breath, composing himself. He smiled at them, the benevolent priest, again. I'm sure they'll be beautiful. Just say them with feeling, and you'll have people crying in the aisles. He put his hands together as though about to offer a prayer over them. And remember to speak from your diaphragm. Another smile. Bless you, my children. I'll see you tomorrow. Chapter 18 So, Scarlet's mother said when the group sat down in the restaurant for dinner, was I the only one who thought Father Joe was one cardinal short of a flock? No, Liam's father said. I'm sure we all wondered if he'd been sniffing the wrong kind of incense. With an inward sigh, Liam pulled Scarlet's chair out for her. Well, at least their families would have plenty to talk about over dinner. Liam's brother grabbed a breadstick from the basket near his plate. I thought he was hilarious. I want to know where his congregation is so I can visit. Can't you just imagine him critiquing the choir's performance or telling people they have to hit their marks better when they come up for sacrament? He took a bite of bread and waved the remainder in Liam's direction. Do you have to be Catholic to go to confession? I want to know what sort of penance he gives. Liam's mother settled herself in the seat next to his father. I got Father Joe's number before we left for the restaurant. I'll talk to him and make sure everything is perfect tomorrow. You don't need to do that, Liam said. Scarlet and I will make sure he's... Liam wasn't sure what word to use. Priestly? Sane? Not acting like he was a professional director stuck at an amateur production? We'll talk to him. Scarlet reiterated. She sent Hazel a look that said, You're going to talk to him. Hazel nodded and sighed. Father Joe is very dedicated to his job. Maybe a little too dedicated at times. Understatement, Vi mumbled into her menu. The conversation moved on to other topics, but Liam should have known by the determined look in his mother's eyes that she hadn't dropped the subject. That night and the next morning, he was busy spending time with his family in Scarlet, busy picking up flowers and relatives from the airport. He didn't think about Father Joe again until right before the ceremony. By that time, the audience was assembled in the chapel, listening to the strains of Mozart. He'd had a last-minute problem with his tuxedo, loose seam in the shoulder, and Talia was sewing it in the groom's room while he paced around and obsessively looked at his watch. He only had a couple more minutes until he was supposed to line up with the groomsman. He texted Scarlet that he was having a wardrobe malfunction. She texted back, Is that code for having second thoughts? Don't you dare jilt me at the altar. He couldn't tell if she was joking. I should go talk to Scarlet. You can't, Talia said. It's bad luck to see the bride beforehand. I don't believe in bad luck. Okay, then you're supposed to wait to see the bride so everyone gets to see your reaction to her while she's decked out like a bedazzled princess. That's the real reason. And besides, I'm almost done. She tied off the knot and snipped it. 
there. Now no one will know that you ordered from the cheapest tuxedo place in town. He grabbed the jacket and slipped it on. Scarlet insists on paying for everything. I didn't want her to pay more than she had to. He adjusted his tie. We should have just stuck with the original plan to do a small ceremony at her grandmother's house. But mom took over. The door opened and his mother sashayed inside. She wore a long pink dress with filmy sleeves, basically looking like she was on her way to the Oscars. He hoped she hadn't heard his last sentence. Are you done yet? She asked. You've still got to put on your boutonniere. I'm almost done. Talia slipped by them and went out the door with a wave. She had to line up too. His mother took the boutonniere from its box, pinned it to his lapel and stood back to examine him. You look so handsome. I may start crying before the ceremony. He felt a pinch of guilt. She was so happy, and none of it was real. At least not yet. He had time to convince Scarlet that the two of them belonged together. His feelings weren't, as Scarlet had suggested, merely attraction for her. He kissed his mother on the top of her head. Thanks, Mom. She smiled. And you should be glad I took over. Everything is going to be perfect, especially since I found a better minister to officiate. What? He must have misheard her. She wouldn't have sacked Father Joe without consulting him. That man was a disaster. I can only imagine the sort of marriage advice he'd give the two of you during the ceremony. He would have ruined everything. So last night I called Reverend Saunders and explained the situation to him. She put her hand to her chest. He thinks so highly of you. He agreed to postpone his Valentine's plans with his wife and come up here to officiate. Mom, Liam sputtered. You can't just do that. His mother adjusted his boutonniere. Don't worry. I got him a very large gift card to cover his expenses. It's my wedding surprise for you. This will make the wedding more special. It would make it more something. Liam had to undo this. Where's Father Joe? I paid his fee this morning and told him he wouldn't be needed after all. Liam rubbed the back of his neck. And he just left? I gave him a bonus and explained we'd retained someone else. His mother cocked her head. Are you upset? Why on earth wouldn't you want a pastor who's known and loved you all your life to marry you? Because a real pastor would make this a real wedding, and Scarlet had already told him she didn't want that. He couldn't explain that to his mother. Under normal circumstances, he'd be touched. Hazel will be insulted that we fired her friend. She's going to be my sister-in-law. His mother waved away his protest. You saw how embarrassed she was last night. Mortified, really. She'll understand that you'd rather have someone with a personal connection marry you. Liam didn't have time to stay here and explain to his mother that she really should have checked with him about this. I need to talk to Scarlet. You'll see her in a few minutes, his mother glanced at her watch. We're already late for the lineup. We'd better go. Liam took his place at the front of the room, to the strains of Paco Bell's Canon in D. He hadn't expected to see a large crowd, considering he was getting married two and a half hours away from his home, but the place was packed with men and women, all smiling approvingly. He didn't recognize a few of the people. They must be friends of Scarlet's family. Most of the crowd was his family, his parents, friends, and business associates, and even quite a few of his high school friends. He wasn't sure how his mother had tracked them down. Liam hadn't invited them. Doing that would have felt like he was lying to them about getting married. Turned out, that was a wasted worry, because he really was getting married. How was he going to tell Scarlet about this? She would notice that Father Joe was absent, although Father Joe had most likely told Hazel he'd been replaced, and Hazel would have told Scarlet. The real question was, how upset would she be by this turn of events? The bridesmaids filed in so gracefully that Father Joe would have been proud. Hazel's gaze went to Reverend Saunders and her eyes widened. Did that mean that Father Joe hadn't told her? If so, what was Scarlet's reaction going to be? She wouldn't bolt out of here, would she? No, despite her fear of commitment, 
she wouldn't call off the wedding when her grandmother was sitting in the front row, beaming. Her grandmother's dress looked too big on her frame, and she was slumped in her wheelchair, as though even sitting took effort. But her smile was undimmed. Scarlet would go through with this, like he was doing, and they'd figure out how to handle things later. Annulment, or even better, they could stay married. That was the best option, really. Scarlet and his father glided into the room. At least, Liam assumed the man holding her arm was his father. Liam's eyes were so firmly on Scarlet that he didn't check. She was stunning. He'd never been one to care about wedding dresses, but this one. The white satin draped around Scarlet seemed to glow as it accentuated her curves and stature. Her blonde hair was swept up in curls and tucked under a flowing veil. Venus rising from the water couldn't have been more breathtaking. She smiled at him. And the crowd, the church, everything seemed to fade away. All he could think was that he wanted her more than anything he'd ever wanted in his life. When she noticed Reverend Saunders, she looked to Liam questioningly. He gave her the slightest of shrugs. What else could he do? There was no way to explain what had happened in front of the crowd. Reverend Saunders smiled at the two of them and launched into a speech about the sanctity of marriage. He offered counsel for how to ensure their marriage always took priority. Liam hardly heard it. He wanted to memorize the way Scarlet looked, dressed in white, the veil cascading from her hair. Her green eyes were lit up with happiness. She had to be feeling the same way he did right now. She wouldn't be so radiant otherwise, would she? And she was definitely radiant. Maybe she did know the pastor was real. Maybe she didn't mind after all. Reverend Saunders gestured to Liam and Scarlet. The couple would now like to exchange the vows they've written for each other. He handed the microphone to Liam. Liam hadn't memorized his vows, but he still knew what to say without consulting a paper. Scarlet, my life has never been the same since the day I met you. This earned him a smile. You've changed me. You've made me laugh and take myself less seriously. We never know what the future will bring, but whatever happens, I'll love you and cherish every moment we have together. He hoped she understood that he meant every word he was saying. I want to have as many of those moments together as possible. I love you. He hadn't meant to repeat the part about loving her, but somehow saying it once wasn't enough. Once was expected during a wedding vow. Twice was the truth. Her reaction to his vows was muted. A slight widening of her eyes. A swallow that she hid. He couldn't tell whether she was surprised, comforted, or worried by his pronouncement. He went on. I want to see your smile every day. And I'll do everything I can to ensure that happens. He flipped off the microphone and dropped his voice to a whisper, so only she could hear. Including keeping pool boys away. She gave a nervous giggle. He turned the microphone back on and handed it to her. What would her vows reveal about her feelings? She took a deep breath. Liam, you're the most giving man I've ever met. I don't know what I would have done without you. You've pushed me to be better than I am, and to go places I wouldn't have considered going. Meaning, he supposed, that he was pushing her to move to Scottsdale. Everyone who knows you can't help but love you like I do. One profession of love, and a cheating sort of one at that. She ought to love him more than everyone else loved him. Any woman would be beyond thrilled to be called your wife. And I'm so fortunate that I get that title. Was he imagining it, or were the words, for a little while, tacked on to that sentence? Ah, uh, Scarlet, he thought. How could you have ever considered yourself a good liar? She couldn't even bring herself to embellish her feelings and fake wedding vows. Her voice went soft 
and emotional. Thank you for everything you've done for me. You deserve so much happiness in life, and I'll do whatever I can to make you happy. Reverend Saunders started speaking again, but Liam wasn't listening. He was analyzing Scarlett's last words. Did the fact that she wanted to make him happy mean she planned to stick around? Or was it her way of saying he'd be happier with someone else? You may kiss the bride, Reverend Saunders said. Liam did, lightly because everyone was watching. The crowd applauded and some of his high school friends hooted their approval. Then he and Scarlett walked down the aisle together, man and wife, for real. He would have liked to take her off somewhere private so they could talk, but a photo shoot was on the schedule. He didn't want her upset and gritting her teeth for the pictures. In fact, he really shouldn't tell her until the whole thing was over. People would wonder what was wrong if she suddenly freaked out. When the photographer finished with the family shots, the woman took Scarlett and him outside to get some pictures in front of the building. Scarlett whispered to him, What happened to Father Spielberg? She didn't know. Last minute replacement, Liam said. Scarlett nodded, unconcerned. I'm glad Hazel found someone better. This guy's performance was much more believable. Yep. Liam said. Totally believable. The rest of the day's events slid by in a sort of dreamlike fashion. The toasts, the congratulations, the food, and the dancing. Scarlet was never far from him, slipping her hand into his or laying her hand on his knee. She laughed and smiled and gave him eager, intimate looks. Looks that made him forget their marriage wasn't supposed to be real. When he held Scarlet on the dance floor, swaying back and forth while breathing in the scent of her perfume, he thought, Someday, we'll tell our children about this, and they'll think it was a hilarious way to get married. At other times, he was mentally counting down the hours until all of this was over, and he lost her. You do love me, Liam wanted to tell her. You're just too afraid to admit it to yourself. He had to convince her to at least give their relationship a shot. Chapter 19 As Scarlet climbed into Liam's BMW, her emotions were all over the place. Three out of four of her stepfathers had come. She hadn't expected that. She was so touched. And, okay, also found it funny that Liam's friends and relatives had been so confused that three men at the reception all claimed to be Scarlet's stepfather. She loved that so many people had come and at the same time felt horrible for deceiving them. Except for her grandmother. Her grandma had not only made it through the wedding, she almost made it through the reception. She asked Hazel to take her home right before Scarlet changed to leave. Grandma hugged her goodbye with shaking arms and murmured, I'm so glad I got to see this. When she let Scarlet go, tears shone in her eyes. Her grandma's lips quivered, and she wiped at her eyes. You'll come back and visit me, won't you? You won't be so busy with married life that you forget me. And that's when Scarlet realized that her grandmother's tears were only partly due to happiness. She worried that this was the last time she'd see Scarlet. Of course I'll visit, Scarlet said. I'll come as much as I can. Now, as she drove away with Liam, she wondered how many weekends she could fly in. They'd told everyone that they were spending the night in a cabin in the woods and would drive to Phoenix tomorrow to leave for their honeymoon. But really, they were making the drive back tonight. A wedding night wasn't in the schedule. Scarlet looked for her phone to see her calendar. It wasn't in her jacket or Jean's pocket. Do you know where my phone is? As soon as she said the words, she remembered it was in her overnight bag in the back seat. She turned to get it. Don't go on your phone, Liam said. Talk to me so I don't fall asleep. It's only nine o'clock. I doubt you're in danger of nodding off. He smiled at her. Maybe I just want to talk to you then. How could she resist that smile? She left her overnight bag in the back and spent the entire ride chatting with him. He was easy to talk to, partly because he was knowledgeable about so many subjects. 
partly because he made her feel like everything she said mattered. By the time they got to Liam's townhouse, it was 11.30. Liam took her bag from the back seat, and the two of them went inside. He stopped her in the kitchen, pulled her to him, and kissed her. No preamble, no explanation. Her overnight bag slid to the ground. She wasn't surprised. His eyes had told her often enough during the wedding that he wanted to kiss her. She wound her arms around his neck and melted into him. She expected him to let her go after a few minutes. He didn't. One of his hands ran down her back. The other twisted into her hair, making a mess of the curls Talia had so carefully placed there. His lips went to her neck and she had to stifle a moan. His hands left her hair and went to her coat. Only one button and the belt kept it closed. He undid both, slipped it from her shoulders, and threw it on the table. They were alone, in his townhouse. This sort of thing was dangerous. Are you trying to seduce me? She was only partly joking. We're not really married, you know. He lifted his head. About that, a pause. Actually, we are. What? She was sure she'd misunderstood him. With his arms around her waist, he told her, in between dropping kisses on her mouth, that his mother had fired Father Joe and brought in an actual, legitimate pastor. She stepped away from Liam, breaking his grasp. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't know until right before the ceremony. She was blinking and didn't seem to be able to stop. That's when you should have told me. I was afraid you'd freak out, sort of like you're doing right now. He cocked his head. Breathe, Scarlet. Her hand went to her chest. She could feel her heart hammering through her shirt. You suggested getting a real pastor, and I told you no. You did it anyway. His expression hardened. She'd insulted him. It wasn't my idea to switch pastors. My mother took over that detail like you let her take over most of the wedding details. Are you really so surprised? Yes, she was surprised, and a fear twined around her that she didn't understand. She felt like she'd just been thrust into some Greek tragedy where she was forced to live out a destiny she'd been trying to avoid. We're married. Even the words felt dangerous. What are we going to do about that? A muscle flicked at the side of Liam's mouth. Well, we'd plan to fake a divorce later. We'll just have to get a real one. Or we can get the marriage annulled. We'll say you had some issues I didn't know about before we impetuously tied the knot. Like what? Like your obsessive aversion to commitment. He didn't understand. He wasn't looking at this rationally. I'm trying to keep both of us from getting hurt. Liam thrust his hands into his jacket pockets. It might not be too late for you, but I'm already past that point. He couldn't really love her. Not after such a short time. It was only infatuation that would wear off quickly. And then where would they be? Where would she be? because she already loved Liam more than she should. She stared back at him. No words came. She couldn't very well explain that she was afraid she already loved him too much. Maybe he saw it in her eyes. His expression softened. Why don't you give marriage a try? You said you wanted a sign that marriage was right for you. I don't think you could have a better sign than this. He closed the distance between them and put his hands on her shoulders. What are you afraid of? That we'll end up divorced? That was the plan all along. So it's not even a loss. Her heart would be a loss. Hers? His? Maybe more. Divorce is so much harder than you're making it sound. What if we have kids? Do you want to ruin three other people's lives along with our own? He smiled, a bit of triumph on his lips. You've already decided how many children we're having. 
Three is a good number, she said defensively. I liked having two sisters, so I've generically thought that I'd like to have three girls. What if I want a son? Then you'll have to promise to hire a house cleaner. I can't raise that many children and be expected to mop floors. I'll hire a house cleaner. He lowered his head and kissed her, soft and caressing. She kissed him back. Somehow she couldn't help herself. Her willpower was quickly ebbing. He pulled her against him. His warmth surrounded her, engulfing her. Her hands wound up on his chest. His jacket was mostly open. When her fingers touched the coat's zipper, they hesitated. Alarm bells went off in her mind. She should leave that zipper alone. If she started undressing him, they would both be lost. He groaned at her indecision, unzipped his jacket, and tossed it next to hers. That's when her sanity returned. This was becoming all too real, all too fast. There could be serious consequences. A honeymoon baby, even. She took several steps away, shaking her head. We shouldn't. I can't. We have to be sure, Liam. This isn't a game. He let out a breath and raked a hand through his hair. I'm not trying to push you into doing anything you don't want to do. It's just that I'm in love with you. And we're married. His hands dropped to his side. But you're right. We don't have to rush into this. We'll have plenty of time to discuss it once we get to Cancun. If she went to Cancun with him, she'd give in. She knew that. He probably knew that, too. Still, she nodded in agreement. We'll both think more clearly after we've had time to sleep on it. Right. He picked up her overnight bag and handed it to her. Good night, Mrs. Brooks. Good night. She went upstairs to the guest bedroom, even though she had no intention of staying. With the last vestiges of her willpower, she spent the next hour writing Liam a note apologizing, explaining the best she could that she didn't want to make decisions that might leave them both miserable. Love wasn't a ticket to happiness. It was fire something that needed to be handled carefully, or it could burn down the world. She finished off the letter with, You should go to Cancun anyway. You deserve a vacation. Tell your parents I'm sorry. Tell them whatever you have to. I'm so sorry. She put her engagement and wedding rings on top of the letter, then called an Uber and slipped outside. Chapter 20 the next morning, Liam read Scarlet's letter with numb resignation. He'd known he'd pushed her too far last night. He never should have kissed her like that while telling her they were married. Of course, she'd bolted. He called her, knowing with every ring of the phone that she wouldn't pick up. On an app they'd shared previously, he checked her location. She was back in California. She must have gotten the first flight out. He hung up and scanned flights to California. He wasn't going to accept her goodbye. He would make her talk to him and convince her they belonged together. He envisioned that conversation and the things he would say. None of it ended well, because the truth was that convincing Scarlet she loved him wasn't enough. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that she was afraid love would end up ruining them both. How was he supposed to convince her otherwise? He couldn't prove what would or wouldn't happen in the future. He erased three texts before writing. I realize you need some time to think things through. That's okay. We can talk whenever you're ready. He would give her space. No pressure. She would text or call soon. After all, she hadn't gone longer than a day without texting him since they met. He added, I know you can't resist talking to me. Sooner or later, you'll need a good dentist. He could see her now, reading the text and telling herself that she wouldn't respond. At least not for a while. She lasted ten minutes. I'm sorry, she wrote, and reiterated a lot of what she'd already said. 
you'll thank me for leaving one day. Not likely, and certainly not today when the two of them were supposed to be leaving on their honeymoon. Time, he told himself. She needed some pressure-free time, and he would let her have it. He could give her a couple of months before he showed up on her doorstep, or at least one. Maybe three weeks. Instead of addressing her apology, he wrote, What are you going to do today? Scarlet. Repaint my bed frame. Ah, the bed frame that had given her so much grief. I bet you get it right this time. Scarlet. You have more faith in me than I have in myself. He sighed and wrote her one more text. You're so right about that. Two weeks passed with them texting every day. Texting, not calling. Scarlet seemed to be afraid to talk to him. Liam liked to think this was because she was afraid she'd change her mind if she heard his voice. But perhaps refusing to speak to him was her way of keeping distance between them. Most of the texts felt like the sort of conversations they'd had before she left. Just reading them made him want to be with her. Other times, her texts fell squarely into the category of fear of the future. She sent him a picture of her bed, now white. But since it had four coats of paint on it, she thought it looked gloppy in places. She mournfully reported that she ought to strip it down, and who knew if she'd ever actually get around to that. Basically, she'd wrecked a beautiful bed. This, somehow, was an omen about her inability to be in a relationship. Liam went online to an antique sale, bought her a bed that looked similar, and shipped it to her. Instead of making her happy, Scarlet panicked over the gift and told him a story about one of her mother's boyfriends who'd bought her a car. Her mother had promptly dumped the guy. Scarlet. So you shouldn't give me expensive gifts. You'll make me feel like I'm using you. Liam. I was just showing you that you had other options for sleeping arrangements. So many better options. Besides, the bed wasn't nearly as expensive as a car. However, if you move to Scottsdale, I'll buy you one of those. She had, after all, mentioned moving to Scottsdale once in order to be closer to her grandmother. Scarlet. See, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Liam. I'll put the car in my name to make you feel better. What do you see yourself driving? Besides me, crazy. She didn't answer, which wasn't like her. He didn't think much about it until 15 minutes later when she texted him three sentences that changed everything. Scarlet. Can't talk for a while. Hazel just called. My grandmother passed away. His stomach sank. Not that. Everyone had been expecting this, but not this soon. His heart broke for Scarlet. He phoned her. The call went to voicemail. He left his condolences and didn't try to call again. Scarlet was either on the phone with someone in her family, or she'd turned her phone off to cry, undisturbed. He wished he could put his arms around her and comfort her. She was too far away. Well, time to put an end to that. Chapter 21 Scarlet flew to Flagstaff. Her mother had stayed with Grandma after Scarlet's wedding, helping her go through things. Maybe her mother had known that Grandma didn't have as long as they all hoped. Vi and Hazel met her at the baggage claim. The three hugged, but didn't say much until they reached the car. None of them wanted to say anything that would trigger a public meltdown. Hazel drove to the house, assuring Scarlet that the funeral arrangements were already made. They had been for months. The viewing would be tomorrow evening, followed by the funeral and the graveside service. None of it felt real. A part of her mind wouldn't believe Grandma was really gone. She'd always been waiting at her house to greet Scarlet. Always. How could that have changed? When Scarlet reached the house, she left her suitcase in the entryway and went straight to her grandmother's room. The hospital bed was gone. So was the medical equipment. Anyone walking into the room would have thought it was a parlor again. 
The couch that had stood vigil was all that was left to attest to her grandmother's illness. Scarlet sunk down in the couch, staring into the empty space. She wasn't sure how much time passed. Eventually, her mother came in. Even that felt dreamlike. Her mother consoling her. Scarlet had already told her mother that Liam's office was short-staffed, and he couldn't get away from work yet. She'd even prepared an excuse for why she wasn't wearing her wedding rings. They needed to be sized and were still at the jeweler's. But her mother didn't notice her lack of jewelry. She hugged Scarlet and said things that Scarlet hardly heard. She couldn't stop thinking about how big and empty the room looked. How wrong. Your grandmother loved you so much. This pierced Scarlet's thoughts and sent her into tears. Who would Scarlet have now? Just her sisters, who were moving on with their lives. And her mother, who'd always been more wrapped up in her own life than her children's. Life was cutting Scarlet loose, and she was drifting, untethered. Her mother patted her on the back. Grandma isn't in pain anymore. Remember that. Scarlet was obviously a selfish person, because at that moment, she would have wished her grandmother back into this room if she could. Her mother ended the embrace. I'd let you stay here and commune with her memory, but the lawyer just came to distribute the will. We shouldn't keep him waiting. She gave a wan smile. A lawyer who makes house calls is a rare thing, I can tell you that. Her mother led her towards the door. You can keep on crying if you like. Tears detox your body, and you need a good detox. This was enough to stop Scarlet's crying. Probably she was just being ornery about her mother's medical advice. Scarlet and her mother went to the living room where Vi and Hazel already sat reading through copies of the will. Aunt Christina and Jane were on their way. Both Vi and Hazel looked surprised as they read. That might not be a good sign. The lawyer handed Scarlet and her mother a copy, murmuring condolences and saying what a good friend Grandma had been to him. The will consisted of a dozen pages paperclipped together. Scarlet didn't feel she had the strength to read it. She slumped down on the couch next to Vi. Who did Grandma leave the house to? Hazel, the lawyer said. The rest of the heirs will split the assets in her stock portfolio, bank account, and her life insurance policy. Your share will be close to the value of the house. She was trying to be fair. Scarlet gaped at the lawyer, stunned. Grandma had never been playing favorites by leaving the house to Jane. Scarlet and her sisters would be equally compensated. Vi flipped a page. Who would have thought that Grandma was this wealthy? Why didn't she ever do anything with the money? She did do something with it, the lawyer said. She invested it, wisely, so she'd be able to leave it to her family. Hazel looked up from the will with a content sigh. She wasn't the sort to live lavishly. She always said she already had everything she needed. Scarlet's mother sat in the chair by the fireplace and flipped through her copy. I certainly didn't know about her reserves. Any time I asked for money, she claimed she could only afford to give me a little. And that was probably the other reason Grandma hadn't acted like she had money. If their mother had known, she would have asked for more. Her mother shook her head. She specifically left me her cross stitch that says... Love isn't something you fall into. It's a choice. I'm going to pretend that's not a commentary on my failed marriages. Maybe it wasn't. Somehow that phrase felt like a message to Scarlet, like Grandma knew her mother would say those words out loud and had intended Scarlet to hear them. Love was a choice. Was it really that simple? Maybe it was, if both people in the marriage made the same choice. Hazel peered at the pages in her hand and half laughed, half gasped. She left me her engagement ring and told me to tell Matt 
It's a hint from the grave. Maybe don't do that last part, Scarlet said. Vi flipped another page and cocked her head. What are these blueprints? Wait, are these the plans to Grandma's house? The lawyer nodded. That was one of the late additions your grandmother made to her will. She got it into her head that you and Scarlet might want to use your inheritance to build replicas of the house. How sweet. Scarlet flipped through the pages to see if Grandma had left her any personal items. She found a list. To my granddaughter, Scarlet, I bequeath any of my clothes she wants because she can make anything look good. Wear the sparkly sweaters with pride, honey. All my pens and notebook paper so she can go old school while she goes to school. You can accomplish anything you set your mind to. On graduation day, I'll be smiling from heaven. My china. Now that you're married, you'll want to entertain. And I saw the pattern your mother-in-law gave you. Just bring that out when she comes over. The rest of the time, it can stay buried somewhere on your garage shelves. My pearl necklace, earrings, and ring. Grandpa gave them to me as Valentine's gifts. Those are second only to the Valentine's gift you gave me. Rushing your wedding day, so I could be there. When you wear them, remember that happily ever afters do happen. Love is a choice. Scarlet, despite her resolve not to detox anymore, cried again. That evening, Scarlet was okay. Her grandmother's presence seemed so strong in the house, and going through her things felt like a sacred task of sorting through memories. Scarlet gathered the memories to her heart, and told herself she would always have them. The next morning was different. As soon as Scarlet stepped into the viewing, she fell apart. All of her mental preparations for this moment had been a self-deluded sham. Seeing her grandmother there, and yet so not there, made her death, her absence, horribly real. The pain felt like something searing, something choking that was wrapping around her chest. She couldn't do this. She couldn't leave this room, attend the funeral, and solemnly dab at her eyes in a civilized manner. Loss wasn't civilized. It was feral and gnawing. She hunched in a chair in the corner of the room and couldn't stop crying. Not when Vi or Hazel sat beside her, trying to comfort her. Not when their mother came over and promised to find a medium to help communicate with Grandma on the other side. I can't go to the funeral, Scarlet told them. I can't do any of it. Her family murmured among themselves, stood, and left. Scarlet didn't know why until Liam sat down in the chair next to hers. Her family had left to give them privacy, and she was so relieved to see him. Without a word, he leaned over and gathered her in his arms. She rested her head against his chest and sobbed. He was strong and sturdy and just what she needed. He ran his hand along her back, consolingly, and whispered, I'm sorry, over and over again. She was so glad he'd come. She hadn't invited him because she hadn't wanted him to feel obligated to be part of such a painful event, but he was here. Her tears finally began to subside. You came, she mumbled into his shirt. He shouldn't have worn a white shirt. Her waterproof mascara wasn't as waterproof as it claimed. Of course I came. I want to be with you. For this and for everything. She didn't lift her head from his chest. The rise and fall of his breaths were soothing. I'm sorry, I'm such a mess. His hand continued to make its track of consolation up and down her back. Losing someone you love hurts. I understand that. Did he mean her? 
Somehow, she felt he did. He rested his chin on the top of her head. Unfortunately, the only way to completely avoid the pain of loss is to avoid loving anyone. You wouldn't want that. You wouldn't have missed out knowing and loving your grandmother, would you? No, of course not. Scarlet knew the point he was really making. Love came with risk, but it was worth it. It was the only way to live a meaningful life. Liam lifted his head, looked at her, and wiped a strand of hair away from her cheek. Did she say something in her will that made you laugh? An odd, yet accurate question. Yeah, actually, she did. He smiled. I knew she would. You take after her. But even if you took after your mother, I'd still take a chance on you. I love you. His eyes were gentle and sincere, his words almost a vow. I love you too. With her emotions raw and on the surface, laid out in front of her, she knew with complete certainty that she loved him. She'd loved him since the first week they'd been together. It had happened despite her attempts to avoid emotional entanglement. She'd been completely entangled. She rested her hand on top of his knee. Maybe we don't need a divorce. Or an annulment. After the funeral, after I'm done helping my mom and sisters, I could move to Scottsdale. If you still want me to. She waited, heart in her throat for his answer. He didn't make her wait long. I'd like that. Her heart mended a little right then. What did you tell your parents about my leaving? Would they be tight-lipped and holding a pool boy against her? I didn't tell them anything. They think you went back to California to do some shoots you'd already planned. She lifted an eyebrow. That explanation wouldn't have lasted for long. I didn't think it would take long to convince you to come home. Home. She liked how the words sounded on his lips. She had a home, and someone she loved, who loved her back. She was tethered, and tethered was a good thing. You made a good choice, a voice seemed to say in her mind. Her grandmother's voice. The funeral director stepped into the room. Are you ready to proceed? Scarlet finally was. Three days later, after Scarlet had finished helping her sisters and mother go through the last of Grandma's things, Liam led Scarlet into his townhouse. Well, their townhouse. They were married, after all, and intended to stay that way. As soon as he opened the door, Bandit raced up to them. Mrs. Brooks wasn't far behind, which was a surprise. She glided over to Liam and hugged him. I thought the two of you would like to come home to a stocked fridge, so I bought you some groceries. Also, there's chicken soup in the crock pot. She gathered Scarlet in an embrace. She was soft and smelled of onions and lingering perfume. I'm sorry to hear about your grandmother. She was a lovely woman. Scarlet nodded and was glad she had Liam's mother in her life now. She was a lovely woman as well. I'll head back home. Mrs. Brooks picked up her jacket from the back of a chair. But if you need anything, let me know. Thanks, Scarlet said. Liam gave his mother another parting hug. You're the best. She smiled. Remember to use those words when you're describing me to my grandchildren. Liam let out a small laugh. Will do. Yeah, Mrs. Brooks. Should Scarlet start calling her mom now? Pamela? She would probably win hands down in a competition of best grandmothers. She'd be the sort to bake cookies with children while Scarlet's mother would read them horoscopes. Mrs. Brooks slash mom slash Pamela left. The dog didn't. He wound around Scarlet, making yipping noises of excitement. She petted him and scratched his ears. Even the dog missed you. Liam said, though not nearly as much as I did. You and Bandit both have good taste. Liam raised his eyebrows suggestively. If you think I taste good, 
I might let you nibble my neck. She straightened and cocked her head. You know, I don't think the problem is that I miss innuendo. I think the problem is that you see it everywhere. He stepped closer and slipped his hands around her waist. It's true. I've had a one-track mind since I met you. He kissed her forehead, her cheeks, and then her lips. A light kiss that quickly grew more intense. A kiss that showed her exactly how much he'd missed her. His hand tugged at her jacket buttons and then stopped. He lifted his head, his eyes meeting hers with earnestness. I don't want to pressure you into something you're not ready for. He really was so sweet. I know. That's one of the reasons I love you. He looked uncertain about her reply, perhaps because she hadn't given him either a green light or a red light, and now she didn't know how to go back and revise her answer. I'm committed to you, he said. I'll never hurt you. It probably said something about her that these were the words he chose to murmur to her on what had technically become their honeymoon. She still missed her grandmother, and always would, but her crying jags ended when Liam had shown up at the funeral. She was allowing herself to love, to take that risk, and it was a freeing feeling. He was still looking at her earnestly. Do you believe me about that? I promise, I'll never hurt you. She unzipped his jacket for him. I believe you, and I'll never hurt you either. We'll have a pain-free marriage. Epilogue, three years later. The pain was incredible. In fact, Scarlett hadn't ever realized her body was capable of feeling this much pain. She closed her eyes, moaned, and gritted her teeth. Liam, this is all your fault, and I can't do this anymore. Liam sat beside her calm as ever, and put his hand reassuringly on her arm. Yes, you can. Do you want more ice chips? Only if I'm allowed to fling them at the anesthesiologist. Where is he? Her epidural had worn off 45 minutes ago, but for some unfathomable reason, the hospital only had one anesthesiologist on call, and he was busy doing surgery prep. Her labor had already lasted 12 hours, and the Pitocin they'd given her made the contraction so relentless that she could no longer be responsible for the things that came out of her mouth. You don't have much longer. Push with the next contraction. Finally! Perhaps because the epidural had worn off and Scarlet could feel every throbbing muscle in her body, or perhaps because their baby was as tired of waiting for his entrance as his parents, he made his debut only two minutes later. He blinked and wailed, waving glistening pink arms around. He was absolutely perfect. The doctor put a pair of clamps on the umbilical cord and handed Liam the scissors. Do you want to cut the cord? Scarlet watched, relieved, and wished the contractions would completely end. Don't mess up, she told Liam, or they'll make you return your proctologist's license. Prosthodontist. William told the doctor. I'm a prosthodontist. He handled the scissors expertly. Not long afterward, and yet not soon enough, the baby was wrapped and in Scarlet's arms. The doctor and nurses left the three of them alone. Scarlet had known she was going to have a baby. The nursery was finished, and the name picked out, Christopher Frank. But still, holding her son, a miniature person with tiny fingernails, and wisps of blonde hair. It all seemed like such a surprise, like such a miracle. She couldn't tear her eyes away from her son. I love you so much, she cooed. Do you love me again? Liam asked, teasing. I never stopped loving you. He leaned forward to better see the baby. Really? Because some of the things you said after eleven hours of labor weren't quite loving. She ran her finger over her son's hand. I'm sure I don't know what you were talking about. You told one of the nurses to become a nun. 
It might have been good advice. We don't know the sorts of men she usually dates. Liam tucked a loose edge of the blanket around the baby's feet. You said, from now on, I have to sleep in a different state. Scarlet's eyes drifted to Liam's. I suppose you'll be able to convince me otherwise. He smiled. Good. Although I meant what I said about you owing me a house cleaner. She'd yelled that demand so loudly during an especially long contraction that a nurse had rushed into the room to check and see if some sort of mess needed to be cleaned up. Liam tilted his chin down. I thought we agreed to get one after our fourth child. Nope, the deal was after I had a son. It's not my fault he came first instead of fourth. Liam touched the baby's hand, stroking his little fingers. If that's what you want. He was probably only agreeing so readily because he was tired of the clutter on the countertops that took her so long to battle that she never got around to mopping the floors. Still, it was sweet of him not to complain about any of it. Marriage had turned out so much better than she'd expected. Her eyes grew teary. Hormones and happiness. I really do love you, she said. I know. I love you, too. Liam's phone dinged with a message. He opened it and read it. My parents are in the waiting room with Talia. Hazel and Matt are there, too. Hazel was expecting their first child in a month. Vi had gotten pregnant, and somehow Scarlet and Hazel followed suit like dominoes. All boys. Scarlet and her sisters were already planning reunions so the cousins could play together. Liam kept reading. They want to know when you're going to be up for visitors. Also, my mom claims dibs on holding the baby first. Liam shrugged. You knew she was pushy when you married me. I mean, you had ample warning. His mother was wonderful, and usually not that intrusive. She and Liam's father were always off vacationing somewhere. His mother claimed they needed to spend time working on their relationship, though Scarlet suspected that the two just liked an excuse to travel. Who worked on their relationship at the Parthenon in Greece? Should I tell them that they can come up? Liam asked. Scarlet looked like a wreck. She knew that without consulting a mirror. But that was okay. The hormones and happiness were still flooding her system. Sitting next to Liam. Holding their son. She was struck by how lucky she was to have so much family in her life. Tell them they can come up, Scarlet said. This has been An Unexpected Boyfriend for Christmas. A Fake Boyfriend Romantic Comedy Written by Jeanette Rallison Narrated by Katie Caruso Copyright 2021 by Jeanette Rallison Production Copyright by Jeanette Rallison